Welcome back to our Golden Spatula Cup number one. We do have a new special guest, the Barry Baden. This was probably my best chance to make it to a day three, actually, so I took the opportunity. <laughs> oh, Barry, <laughs> people are super excited to see you. Saru, welcome. Hello, how are you? I practiced this for you, okay? So I'm going to say Sincharitiria, is that right? 
Yeah, uh, kind of. <laughs> it's in Hungary. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my name is Tanas Tsarukas. I live uh, in Greece. Uh, 26 years old. Worked as a serving engineer, close to civil engineer. Yeah, we could well be seeing our first um, representative from Greece bringing the title home. It's funny that Zaru won because his victory was not really predictable. In the start of the set, I decided with some friends to try to play competitive, so we practiced from day one, talk about meta every time. That was very helpful for uh, most of us. My favorite moment of this weekend had to be the moment where we hit an ergot three. It's just, just so fun to watch, man. Look at this. Yeah, did someone order seafood? We have three crabs right there on this board, spreading. Good Good 3 was my last game for day two. What's not funny to play against, but pretty funny to watch, for sure. Ooh. The guys will be ready to kick off, but Zaru! Now it is! There it goes! The Arzu! Yeah. Oh, like, you cannot not smile at this. Like, this is just so well done. <laughs> And this is the revenge you get from the sea creatures. So in the finals, it was a rough game. Look at what got puzzled. And for Saro, they're up on 32 and 31 points. They've got a two-point cushion over everybody else. I scouted like to see if uh, Draven is contested. Didn't see anyone pick that. Tatum and Saro both picking up Draven in the early going. And we know how damaging it can be if that Draven takes too long to get online. I regret my option and I knew that it would be a difficult game. Oh, so he's chaotic here. <laughs> he's playing a Draven too as well. <laughs> oh boy! Another player hit Draven too also. Uh, I was in, in a pretty bad spot. Actually pretty close to getting some other mech 3 stars as well. Ooh. Honestly astonishing compared to where they started. Found my Draven 3 and uh, countered almost the whole lobby. And I believe if Saru finishes second or above at this point, or maybe even third already, might be the win for him. The Alistar, but not quite enough to win. Ketzer oh, wins the lobby, but I believe Saru wins the Eternals. Our winner of the Golden Spatula Club is Daru, taking a win for Greece. Just so, so happy to see that. They've had a lot of support in the chat today. They've had a lot of fans pulling up for Saru. I saw chat, right? I was watching chat. They were going wild for you. And I asked them to like, okay, if you think Saru is going to win, put one in chat. And suddenly the chat went like, like okay, I guess it's decided. Uh, I should thank uh, everyone that supported me. Uh, people that don't know me personally and uh, were supporting me. Ένα πράγμα έχω να πω μόνο. Mikoros is crazy, baby. EFT all day, all the time, directly into my veins. We all came out here to become the best, right? We came out here to be number one, right? Finish off the one, one. Cute. Cute. One of the big things I'm really happy to see was the prize pool, the first place. Really exciting and something to really strive for. Are you ready? Are you excited? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
What's uh what's is. up guys? What's what's oh, going on? Call time, right? We're got a couple minutes <laughs> to show that? still? Yeah, no, 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 I think we're live. Fun. Fun. It's a rehearsal. Yeah. Life's a rehearsal. Oh, How awesome. Um I'm, I'm doing good. What's up? Uh Oh, oh, that says we're live. Okay, all right. Hi, welcome to Golden Spatula Cup number two. It's currently 6.31 a.m. for me. I'm up bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and... <laughs> oh, plenty caffeinated, clearly. So, hi, everyone. We just got through an entire day of competition, and, you know, that's why I'm so tired. I just got blown out by all the excitement. You know how it is, guys. Uh, I'm joined here by Counterfeit and Weta 
kindly, gently waking me up for the day. How are you guys doing? More awake than you are. Sorry, man. You, would be hard, you would be hard pressed to not be. <laughs> I didn't know that, you were saying before, you, you managed to somehow survive through, yeah, the, uh, through all this without any chemical assistance. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't drink coffee, right? Like, uh, I, you know, we just had, like, I guess people have heard about a cold opening, but I guess Matt, you're more of a cold brew opening type of person. It's just awful. Why do I allow you to talk on my desks? Why? Why do I? I run these things. I can fix this. Uh, in case you're curious about what Rising Legends is, of course we are the premier EMEA team fight tactics competition. Uh, and of course, if you're wondering why I'm so tired, we've had a time change going on. We used to have these shows at a nice, reasonable 9 a.m. for me. Uh, now we're starting a couple hours earlier. Our games start at 1 p.m. CET. That's right, you heard it, 1 p.m. CET, which is 7 a.m. for me. But, you I mean, know, it's, it's, it's good for sense, everyone in Europe. Sense. Morning CFT, what's not to like though, Matt, right? Like yeah. straight out of the Honestly, it's a throwback. It's a throwback. I used to do this all the time. I would wake up out of the beanbag directly onto camera. So nice to be going back to my roots. And if you want to talk about the time change or anything else, uh, where can people find us? Eeny, meeny, miny, weeda. On Twitter, that's going to be at TFT Esports EMEA. And again, keep a sharp eye on that Twitter account all throughout the day. Some interesting stuff might happen over there. And also, you can use the hashtag TFT Rising Legends in case you also want to find other people that are engaging with our lovely show. We've got a contest running right now. And of course, to run us through it, our giveaway slash contest specialist, Counterfeit Cass. Oh yeah, I give away all sorts of things, me. But in this case, it's about... We've got an interesting competition going where it's not actually about guessing who's going to win here at the Golden Spatch Cup number two, but providing the most entertaining reasoning as to who you think is going to win. Even if they potentially you know, come out last, if you've got the most entertaining answer, you can win yourself some eggs and prove yourself the wittiest of all TFT players. Yeah, now I'm super excited to get into day two, but I'm also super excited because the way I open the desk means I can just openly drink coffee on it. And no one's going to question anything because they know I'm tired. But day number one, they might not know much about. So let's talk a little bit about our big highlights from yesterday. Mine personally was that we saw one player go literally first, eighth, every single game. It was like first, eighth, eight, first, first, eighth. And they qualified. And I love that. That's the kind of consistency I want to see. Just go straight for the moon, go big or go home. That's my big takeaway from the day. But I suspect you guys will have something a little bit more coherent for me. <laughs> well, I know coming into the day, we were really looking at this as the time for you know, the German region to kind of really step up and start taking a larger slice of the spotlight. They came in with an absolutely enormous amount of players into day one. I believe 25 overall. Uh, ahead of even France, who only had 17. Uh, since then, we've seen a lot of those players being stripped out, but both countries still have a ton in the mix. Yeah, I think for me, right as well, I was just seeing some newer names coming through. A lot of people that came in, it's like their first overall competitive experience. A lot of players shining through the, the, the regional TRCs, right? Someone like Scar, for example, making it out of day one means we have two Egyptian players, come him and Mujiwara making it, right? Uh, big shout out to Morgan. You know, those are probably, if he was here, he would be not be talking about anything else, right? So a lot of interesting things to, to really, when you start doing the deep dive. Yeah, and if you want an idea of what happened visually, we've got you covered there. We've got a quick recap video for day number one. Afterwards, we're going to start talking about today's qualified players, get a quick interview, all kinds of good stuff. We'll see you in a couple minutes. Hello, everybody. Now, guys, before we get started, give me a T. 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 Give me an F. 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 All right, that's enough of that. Hey, everyone. Welcome to TFT Rising Legends. We are here with Golden Spatula Cup number two. Actually, do it. Can he come into clutch or is Markles holding on tight? The, of course, the healing coming out oh. of the misfortune is insane. No. And with that, Marks will be the winner here of lobby number one. The HP. That is the question. Oh, no. oh the no. long 
Oh, again, the Jax is coming along, and now with him soon hitting the back lane. Oh, no! Okay! Force, and it looks like that Mordekaiser that we disparaged so much when it first got picked up will survive. <laughs> May spell disaster for Aaliyah in this round. Could even take him down. So many units surviving from Zoilash, and he will. Yeah, the problem I'm seeing with him right now is Aphelios is ulting uh, second. <laughs> so... <laughs> Not actually helping soften them up for the first ultimate, and that will spell disaster Ooh. for Clamo. Edge of Night saves Zed for the time being. No second ult here for Jinx. Oh, Whoa. oh my god! I thought he was safe! His moment for at least a few months before he started getting flamed, please. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Two-star Viego coming from Ixasa. Who needs to get a win here, 3 HP. Any loss whatsoever, as small as it is, will be the deciding one for our player here in this game five. And it looks like this might be it. Talia's good, but she's not that good. Onto the back line, smash through Canvas, and will deliver the finishing blow. Scar, with a born born of nightmares, takes our final on stream lobby. Yep. Speaking of, tomorrow we do have an earlier start time, and that is going to be, I'm making sure I'm reading it directly off my producer's message, 12.30 p.m. CET, which is going to be a great time for me. I've already bought two bottles of giant cold brew coffee. I'm so ready for tomorrow. Giant cold brew bottle, number one, says hello. And of course, so do I. We're back. Time to talk about today's players. Of course, yesterday we saw some amazing gameplay. Half of our competitors gone out of here. But we've got a strong slew here at the top left over. Any final wrap-ups here as we go through today's qualified players? I wouldn't want to point out the players, of course, we won't be seeing coming through. Because, of course, we've got big names like Pardabol who didn't make it in to the top 64. I think this is a real testament to how good our players are getting now and how consistent they're getting that we're seeing so many new names in the mix. I mean, double 61, right? At the end of the day, did not yeah. make it to day two of the Golden Spatula Cup. And that's that's a big surprise to a lot of people, myself included, right? But we all, we all know that for him, the final goal is always gonna be the finals and then getting to championships. So there are still ways for him to do that, at least. Yep. Yeah. His cousin Camba is making it through all the way, so at least someone in the family has made it to GSC2, day number two. And of course, some of our predictions have made it as well. Mine with a very tight grouping, not where I was ready for just yet, but it's just day two. Darkest and Salvi both making it through day number one in a pretty healthy position, I'd say. Yeah, and we can see Lyris up there at the very top, so we expect the German players to do well. I would like to shout out for the UK players, came in with eight because of a substitute coming in at the end, and keeping six heading into day two is astonishing. I think it's probably the best ratio of any country. Yes, yeah, that's, that's uh, an amazing one for sure, right? Like, uh, and we, you know, for like when we've been talking about UK TFT, it's been okay, Lalana, does he make day three? Yes, cool, UK TFT is good. And all of a sudden, we have Kefossil coming through and just making a massive splash. And all of a sudden, there's like six UK players? Like, hello? All yeah. right. The UK doing incredibly well, but another region doing very well is the Dach region. And we're going to have one of the shining stars, TFT Marks, coming on for a quick interview. Marks, you just finished the day number two in the rankings. How are you feeling about that? Yeah, I'm feeling pretty good about it. Obviously, it's just um, day one, so there's still uh, lots of work to do. But yeah, I feel it's very good to have such a successful day one. So looking forward into day two, then, you know, of course, we've got, again, the cuts to the top kind of certain players. Reflecting on how you played in day one, you know, what was what was the most successful for you? And are you gonna do you feel like you need to change anything up in day two in terms of the actual way you're playing the game? Mm, no, I was very happy with how I played. Played uh, a lot of consistent comps, I would say. I played uh, Anima Squad a lot. I uh, played Jax a lot. <clears throat> so I chose um, relatively consistent comps that are good at top fouring and it worked out well for me uh, at my uh, TRC and also um, yesterday, so I think I'll just keep playing how I've been playing since it's been working very well for me. Yeah, and again, you, you mentioned the, the summoners in-league yourself here, right? And there has been a little bit of a 
massive overswing, uh, a massive overturn in how the German CFT community in particular, as well as the, the rest of the DAC community, obviously, but primarily the Germans, have kind of taken to competitive CFT after those systems have been implemented. Have that been like a massive driving factor for you as well? <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Um, pretty much my competitive journey started when they introduced the Summers in League in Germany. Like that was like a friend of mine sent it to me and was like, yeah, you're good at this game, you should try this. And um, this pretty much made me um, pursue competitive TFT um, more. So I um, started with that and then also played the GCs in set seven. So that was a major, uh, major reason for me, for sure. We are coming into GSC number two with massive success, both in Summoners League and or Summoners in, and still coming into day number two with that same success. Is there something you're worried about here in day number two? What's your big concern? Mm, not really. I'm pretty pretty comfortable on the on the current patch, and I've been doing really well. So I don't see why I can't do uh, well today. And yeah. I think just uh, tr gonna try and play my play my game as I usually do, and think it will work out pretty well. So awesome. just you know, I mean, of course, you know, we were talking a little bit about the communities coming in. You mentioned, of course, the Summoners Inn. The Summoners Inn's been around for a while, and I mean, it was mentioning as well. You know, if people are looking to kind of invest from the other countries in particular communities, of course, Germany came in with a massive amount of players. How would you characterize the German TFT scene as a whole? You know, what makes you folks, you know, your your unique kind of players? Um, yeah, we're we have like a pretty close connected scene. I would say we have a Discord um, where we share information. We have one particular private Discord I want to shout out from uh, Memo, um, where a lot of the high elo German players are hanging out a lot, and we uh, review bots, we talk about the game, we play the game, we help each other like pretty much every day, I would say. So that's like a major reason. We've been improving, um, or I've been improving at least, I can say, uh, when I started out set six, like I would say I've gotten way, way better, mainly thanks to this group of players and uh, making uh, regionals uh, last set for the first time wouldn't have been possible without uh, this group. And now, yeah, gonna try and do do better, honestly, just uh, make regionals and make worlds is the goal ultimately. And it wouldn't, <clears throat> wouldn't have been possible without this, uh, without this group. Yeah, so again, is there, so with the German scene, right, you're all pretty tight-knit, uh, I'd say. Uh, I think that's pretty apparent when you when you talk to each other. I think that something that's also pretty interesting is that you're like one of the only scenes that I can find that has like a particular tier list for all players within their scene that is done by Memo, right? Like, th those streams are so fun to watch, but like, what is like your personal opinion on those types of systems being put into place by like streamers and like having these sort of rankings of the players? I think it's mainly we've, we've mainly started doing it for fun because it was just interesting uh thinking about like our our competitive scene like who's the best and like it also helps i would say like competing against each other we like push each push each other because everyone wants to beat the other uh players but we're also at the same time like great good friends so it's like a rivalry in a way where we push each other to to better so i would say that uh, that also helps a lot now, Marks, of course, thank you so much for the interview, and we're getting to the most important question of it, so I need you to buckle down and get ready. Uh, okay. What's your favorite Star Wars media of all time? Book, movie, TV, give me some. Give some juicy for the fans. Probably Star Wars The Clone Wars, honestly. Let's go! That's mm. it! That's the good stuff. Shoutouts to Dave Filoni. But who do you also want to give shoutouts to, of course, closing the interview? Is it the Memo Discord? Is it any of your fans, the Summoners in folks? Give me the list. Mainly the Memo Discord. Everyone who helped me prepare, my good friends, they know who I'm talking to, like Memo, Vega, you and Elia, all the, all the good people. And to my family, my mom, my brother, there always watching they don't really understand the game that well but they're always supporting me so yeah thanks to thanks to them as well 
All right, awesome, and thanks to you additionally. Good luck in your games today. We'll let you go and get ready for that round one, starting in about 14 minutes for everyone at home. Uh, always love to talk to the players. Always love to hear my biases confirmed that Star Wars The Clone Wars is the greatest TV show and or actually media in the Star Wars canon. Also, I mean, listen to or read Dooku Jedi Lost, also a banger. I'm going to say... Now you've opened the doors to prequel memes. Yeah, you put those on the table. I'm going to be Look, completely if we can get TFT prequel today. memes, I'm going to be a happy man. That's going to be fantastic. I can't fit them in every time I go. I just think only about two or three people in the chat even realize. Yeah, if you guys come up with some, give me some Photoshop, put some Pingus on some prequel mm. memes. We'll get them on air if we can. Mm, we'll see about the copyright, but I'll sure retweet them. Tag at TFT Esports EMEA. We'll see what we can get going. We'll get some. We'll get some meme contests going. I mean, like look at Ping, like a Pingu having the high ground over like a burner exactly. or something. That would be like it's uh, then like I don't know that there the, the opportunities out there there's, are there's endless. material here. Yeah, I, I hope so. They're so, yeah. they're so creative, it won't be a surprise to be sure. But what's the strongest cinematic universe, Matt? Is it the TFT cinematic universe, which honestly is actually a pretty strong cinematic universe? Or is it the Star Wars universe? I think I think we just need TFT the Clone Wars, and we need to see where Riot takes it. You know, we've all heard of Arcane, people love Arcane, but I want to see TFT swing at it. But of course, we are going to go through a quick meta overview. We've been through day number one. We told you all about some AP compositions yesterday, Gadgetine, Anima Squad, and Yumi, everyone's favorite cat to hate. But today, we've got another set of comps to go through, and Wida, take us through the first one. Yes, we're going to be talking a little bit about our good old friends, the Duelists. So Duelists kind of came and went for a while, but recent buffs have put them back into a strong place in the meta. So there are two different ways of going about it. You can pursue the set carry and BT, uh, Edge of Night, QSS, those type of items that help set survive for a longer time, generally speaking, as well as we know the Nila with those lockets, generally speaking, also a very strong part of the composition. You get that early locket going, you just play tempo. Or you can reroll Vayne as well, which is another carry aspect of this composition. And that's kind of why duelists are so strong, because you play to what you've been given within the composition, and then you play for strong tempo, and then you're trying to see if you can secure like a top three, top four type of placement, because you might not have the board that's strong enough to win the lobby. Mm. Yeah. No, and another composition that I've been really curious about coming into or coming out of yesterday, rather, is this Viego composition. One of the very unique things about Viego is that he doesn't require specific units around him beyond like two Ox Force, three Renegade. Everything else is very flexible. If you have a strong threats frontline before picking up a Viego, that's fine. If you want to toss in Aegis, that's also fine. You have a ton of options of the units you put around him. We saw yesterday Lilia going for Camille reroll that transformed into a Viego carry comp in the late game. He's one of the most flexible units around, but you do have to play around those items because he has a very unique aspect to him among AP carries in that he doesn't really like or benefit much from having mana. Much prefers to have that spark plus another item on top of the gunblade. So that's the only limiting factor there in the Viego composition, but it's super flexible and always super fun to see. All right, Matt, I'm going to need your help for my description of this next setup here, because on the Saturday, 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 if you're looking for 1,000 pounds of quality beef, there's nowhere else to look but for in the Brawlers. Absolutely humongous on the field with a massive quantity of HP. This composition, if you find the right pieces to put together, your rapid fire cannon, your scoped weapons, it can be just a question that so many lobbies just don't have an answer to. You know, we've seen several players making really good use of it. If you don't have massive single target damage, these brawls can shrug off most of what you're putting out. So I'd love to see more of them coming through here because they really challenge our players to make sure they can deal with every kind of opponent. Yeah, not just Jax, but the Ribbon in that composition, always scary, just like in Anima Squad. I've been really like vibing on Riven as a frontline uh, tank for a little bit now. Just seems way stronger than she was initially given credit for. So, bit of a shame that uh, the mid set is coming up so quickly. But glad to see her get her highlights. 
I mean, Riven also has a lot of hidden damage in her ability, right? Like, she does yeah. those free auto attacks that actually can do a significant amount of damage. We saw back to the um, back to the start of the set where uh, Riven was kind of the secondary carry in the composition alongside whatever you ended up hitting, which would be your primary, like, tank item, I say, item holder because she would, the longer she stayed alive in those fights, the more damage she was dealing. That's kind of funny how that works, right? Like, <laughs> you know, Dude, if uh, she doesn't die, she can still do yeah. damage. Well, yeah, that, I mean, you're surviving at it, I know. I mean, we've certainly seen, particularly with uh, Carry Organ, when she can share her shield around, just how impossible it is to deal with her when she, you know, when she's you know, getting the shield, she's sharing the shield, she's just regenning all over the place. It's a massive, massive problem if you haven't got the tools. And before we head into game, we're going to hear from one of our players one last time before we get started. We've got an interview of fresh T-Fight and Tactics from Impetuous Panda and McGarkey. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tea Fight and Tactics. I am, of course, Impetuous Panda, part of the Rising Legends broadcast team, and I'm joined by one of the French superstar players, Magarki, who's representing a team as well, and he's been doing so much in TFT for so long, one of the, definitely the veteran players, and the players that I think everyone recognizes from the French community. Magarki, how are you feeling today? Hello, I'm good. I'm good, very happy to be part of this uh, Tea Fight and Tactics. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. It's an honor. Ever since set six, when I first started uh, casting TFT, you've been there in GSCs. You've been competing at the highest level. Looking at French, uh, the French uh, player, which is, I think, obviously uh, the strongest country in EMEA. It's been proven for a long time. You are one of the strongest players in this country. So that's a lot, I think, saying, uh, considering the level uh, of TFT overall. But before we get into TFT, before we get into you know your whole history and your background, I want to know a bit more about you as a person outside of TFT. Um, are you studying or working in something else, or are you just you know going full in on TFT the last few years? What's your story outside of TFT? Well, so right now I'm full time playing TFT. I have uh, my team, the French team, Aegis, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't the case uh, when I started playing uh, competitively. Mm -hmm. I was uh, studying uh, in engineering, mm -hmm. in engineering school, and uh, I was in my last year when I started to play in tournaments in uh, set two team fight tactics, mm -hmm. and uh, it was kind of difficult to do everything at the same time. So when I finished, I decided that I will take one year and focus uh, only on GFG, mm -hmm. and. If things go well, I will continue. So it did. That's why I'm still here today. Mm -hmm. Going to TFT, um, you've been around okay. for so long. I know your name was, you know, when it's S6, you were already a very established pro player. Um, you're part of a great team as well. But going back to the infancy of TFT in set one, set two, set three, talk me through, you know, kind of briefly your journey with TFT. When did it click that you were not just playing this game at a like kind of competitive level, but more of like, hey, I want to try and aspire to be among the best players in Europe or among the best players in the world? What was your journey like in TFT? Mm, it's really interesting uh, story because when I first started, it was just to try a new game and mm -hmm. pass time at first. I remember I was finishing my internship in uh, in Russia and I was just bored and it just came out. So I was like, let's try. Mm -hmm. And I played a bit didn't really didn't really like it at first because there is a lot to learn and because I like to push myself and be competitive it's not enjoyable when you just are bad right? mm -hmm. <laughs> so at first it was difficult then I started playing more and more I got challenger at the last day of set one <laughs> and uh, I was very happy about it. Mm -hmm. And then set two came out and I felt like it was just the same problem over again. I had to relearn everything, everything changed. I feel so connected to you. When I started playing TFT in any set, I also yeah. feel so overwhelmed because there's so many things and it's a, a, when you're very competitive, it's a feeling of like not having control and, and kind of things being outside of your control. It makes mm -hmm. it very difficult. So I feel you completely. Yeah, exactly. Especially I feel at the start because now the sets are, I would say, more refined and mm -hmm. we can find some similarities. Mm -hmm. But at first, it was a whole different game. It was <laughs> very difficult to learn again. Okay, so moving on. At set two, I started to 
play, I remember during the Christmas holidays because I didn't have to study. And one day my friend sent me a message on Discord and he said, mm, do you notice that you're ranked two on the ladder? I was, what? <laughs> and I was just playing all the time and I didn't pay attention at all to my ranking and I just mm -hmm. kept winning and winning. Mm -hmm. And I was ranked two. I was like, oh, maybe I'm not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> this interview will, of course, be aired during GSC number two, which you are going to be playing in, of course. Before we get to that tournament, what are your aspirations to, to end off the interview? What is what is your goal? Do you want to win the tournament? Are you happy with final day? Um, what is your confidence level and kind of uh, your goals for this tournament? I want to be to do better than last time. So last time I didn't make it to the final day. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would try to make it to final day and score some... Uh, some points. Well, best of luck, Magarki. It was a pleasure having you here for the interview, learning more about you as a player. I think your name that everyone recognizes, but now it's good to know more about your backstory and, and the fact that you're kind of on this uh, very good upswing where you feel more confident, you feel you're in your peak form. I think that's always great to hear from our players in NBA. So thank you so much for joining us and hopefully you can do well in GSC number two. Yes, yeah, thank you. Oh, it's good to hear from our players, especially as we get deeper into the competition. Now that we're in day number two already, we've got so many players still left after the 1,129 that entered uh, in the open qualifiers alone. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge field. And it's such a fascinating place we're in right now. You know, as we mentioned before, with a legendary tournament player like Double 61 not making it through to day two, the TLC's picking up ahead of steam. I love that we're also seeing a lot of players who maybe haven't had the same level of tournament success that they've had, you know, they've had on ladder. You know, Dasic, number one ladder, Ging, number three on ladder, Seligasan, Kefuzzles, Wet Jungler, you know, all making it through here and hopefully going to make a big impact on the tournament overall. Yep. Really looking forward to seeing how that shapes up. Of course, our lobby number one is on its way, about to start. So we're going to put you all in the capable hands of our casters for game number one, Impetuous Panda and Maisie Marzipan. Hey, Nigeria, we are so pumped for this game one to start. So much will go down today that will be relevant, not just for this tournament, but also for potentially regional finals as well later down the line. I'm, of course, Petros Panda, joined today for games one and two, Maisie Marzipan. How are you doing? I assume you watched yesterday's games. I hope, as a diligent viewer of GSCs, what do you think? What was the thing that jumped out to you? Oh, um, actually, the thing that got me most was the amount of German representation we oh, have in yeah. Germany, the powerhouse region that they are. Like, there's always loads of German players, but this time there was just so many, and that's that's persisted into day two. And of course, you know, I watched every second of yesterday, and it was wonderful. This is top class TFT that we're seeing. Talking about the, the different nations represented in this tournament, we had, of course, France tends to be the powerhouse nation, and then you have Poland and Spain and Germany kind of second fiddle. In this case, Germany was the most represented, is also today the most represented. 14 of the German players made it through, so above 50%. Same for Spain, five out of nine made it through. For Poland, eight out of 11 players, so really, really good odds there. But the country I want to highlight the most amazing, I know you'll be happy to hear this, out of the seven British players we had yesterday, six of them made it to day two. That is a lot of percent. I won't do the math on air, but it's really incredible to see the growth from the, the, the British players in this set. Yeah, I mean, even Golden Spatula Cup once, uh, oh my goodness, Golden Spatula Cup one, we had Lilana, we had Chris mm -hmm. Basel, and even then, like, as a person from the UK, I was like, finally, we got some representation, we're gonna do it, and Kerfuzzled so nearly clutched it for the UK. But this time, we have way more players, way more chances, and of course, Kerfuzzled himself has made it to day two. So mm -hmm. maybe a little, maybe a little UK victory today, who knows? Don't jinx it, you know, casters have the cursing powers. I wouldn't go too far onto the side of trying to promote these players. And one very interesting stat as well to mention is that France had 10 players in day three of GSC1. Today on day two, they only have nine, so they already have less players representing the country, but this will be the lobby for game number one. And we have a mix here of big names that you see on ladder at the very top, like Gluteus, for example, uh, Darkus, who's been in so many GSCs, uh, last set and this set as well. But then the names that really performed yesterday, Nicey Boy was one of those players playing Diego in that game four. Uh, we have Cerebrus, who was actually topping the standings after the first two games yesterday with two wins in a row. So a good mix of players, veterans and also new faces to the scene. Yeah, it's great to see everyone good to go. We got Darkus here. This is our only live feed. We've got, oh, of course, the second I start talking, they're away. <laughs> He's <from> out. <laughs> Doesn't want to hear it, Maisie. 
<laughs> just want to hear. But that He's making sure there's airflow. Very important thing for TFT players. You need to get that nice mix of CO2 and oxygen as well. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, things you don't think about too often, but definitely worth mentioning. And uh, special shout out to players that do have their webcam. I think it makes the show that much more interesting seeing their reactions. I know it's it's more of a hassle. You have to be thinking about, oh, how do I look on air? Am I am I panicking when my role doesn't work out? But it makes the show so much more interesting. So special shout, shout out to Darkest for hooking us up with his webcam POV. Oh, yeah, I think we'll be seeing way more webcam POVs as the tournament goes on. It really does enhance the experience. Like you see, I think we had um, one of our German players last time wrapped up in their blankie and just following the players' emotions and trying to get in their heads and think, what are these players thinking as they're battling it out to be number one? It just offers that extra insight and it's delicious. One thing to talk about the narrative for today is not just players trying to make it day three and accumulate points. Um, it's thinking about GSC one as well, because some of the big names like Cambiz, like Snooty Boo, like Kevin Parker, they made day three in GC number one. And to qualify to regional finals, you can do it many different ways. One of those and the majority of players will be qualifying through accumulated GSC points across all three tournaments. And that means that these three names that I've mentioned and quite a few others, if they also make day three in this tournament, they have their direct pass to regional finals, which is I think the aspiration for so many of our top players. They think about the big picture about European finals and then obviously looking into the world championship as well. So that is a big narrative for me today, seeing which of these players can stay consistent and make it to day three. Yeah, day, day one and two, we're looking at players just trying to get that top 50%. So everyone today is going to be giving it their absolute best. Maybe maybe even holding back some of them so we don't see their full potential. I think tomorrow we will see everyone really step up the gear. So again, make sure you do not miss out on our final day three. But why am I promoting day three? We're just about to start game two. Uh, day two, we got game one on the horizon and we're ready to have a plinking good time. I think no players will be holding back. I think it's cutthroat enough today with the players that we have and the players that we don't have. Players like Double61, Magarki, who I unfortunately jinxed with the interview, I think. Uh, Volterix as well. Big names eliminated yesterday, but still so many big names are making it through today, are staying consistent. And again, going to try their best to, to perform at the high level that we know they can achieve in TFT. Uh, talk about the meta a bit as we, we wait for this game one to start off and all the players ready up. Overall, the biggest thing that surprised me uh, yesterday, and especially comparing to GSC number one, was the rise once again of Duelist as this incredibly strong tempo comp in stages two and three that leave you in a very comfortable spot to actually make top four going to stage four and stage five. Um, overall, were you surprised to see Duelist on the rise for this this last tournament or this last tournament day? Honestly, I wasn't. Um, Duelist is one of those things that over the last few patches we've seen getting crept up little buff here, a little buff there, and it's slowly been mounting up and up, and I wondered when that would culminate to a head and see when Duelist would become really, truly fearful boards again. And I think we're, be I think we're seeing it. I'm glad it's now. And biggest thing to mention as well is Admin on the rise. We saw so many different games really uh, defined by Admin. It's a trait that every game will be different for every single player. So it really is one of the most explosive traits where some specific Admin lines with the correct opening can be really, really good of of course, on kill or on death as well are two of the strongest things, giving both AP and mana to a unit like LeBlanc that is just terrorizing the meta at the moment. But we also saw AD lines with admin. So I think it's definitely one trait to watch out for today. I think every single player, the chance they have to, will be buying their admin units, even just to check what their admin is, and then decide if it will be relevant in any of the comps they decide to go down uh, in, in this game one. Oh yeah, for sure. We saw it yesterday with players before that first augment pops up. They are looking for that Camille. They're looking for the Blitzcrank. They're thinking, what is it? Is this an admin lane for me? Because admin is just so strong that people need to know if it's viable for them from the offset. And uh, yeah, no, the majority of players, we will see them check their admin. And Yumi, unfortunately, did not have a, a good showing yesterday. <laughs> Only Canvas played it. He made it to day two, so not punished, but he went uh, eighth with it, unfortunately, one of the games that we saw on broadcast. And I think it's the reason I mentioned top of show yesterday. Uh, it's a comp that you have to play from a very specific spot. It's possible someone played it off stream and found success with it, but it's become harder and harder ever since that first patch. It's gotten more and more nerfs along the line, and players have had to adapt to what the actual strengths of the comp are now. So we'll see, and we'll see. Uh, too much reroll today. I think Yumi and Draven are maybe the two main options for some of these players. Camille maybe as well with the right admin. 
Yeah, I think so. Um, oh gosh, I was gonna make a horrendous Yumi pun. I will save those for later. Um, wouldn't want it to be a catastrophe. No, I've done. Oh it no. No, I've done it already. <laughs> Get us into game one. I'm already unraveling. <laughs> I think we are going to have to wait a few more minutes, unfortunately, for players to get the lobby sorted out. But in this time, maybe I think it's a very important reminder that apart from the eggs, you can win in the chat if you are the wild, you know, the, the fastest draw in the, in the West. Uh, the second way to get eggs is actually going to be a way that, you know, for the skilled players out there, the ones that can make up these memes, these stories, we have a contest on our Twitter, TFT Esports EMEA, where you're able to win 10 eggs, not just one, but 10 whole eggs for yourself, as long as you show us your wits, your, your comedic tones in your responses here. It's not a right answer. If not, you can just say Snooty Boo right away. I'll go ahead and jinx him. But just the best answer in terms of how funny it is or how much uh, sense or how little sense it makes. So. Maisie, if you had to do right now your answer for this contest, what would it be? I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> Don't take Kerfuzzle. <laughs> Don't jinx it, please. No, no, I, I can't. I can't possibly jinx Kerfuzzle. Hmm. No, I, I'm fresh out of wit, but I do know that the TFT community is incredibly creative. So if this is something that you're thinking, I could do way better than that Maisie girl on the desk, then you can head over to Twitter at TFT Esports EMEA using the hashtag TFT Rising Legends and get your witty answers in because uh, it'll be better than me just pulling up my cheeks. And that'll be relevant for today, but also for tomorrow, 10 more eggs freshly hatched will be there for you as well. So stay tuned to that, to that Twitter. If you don't already follow it, I don't know what you're doing watching this, this tournament at this at this time. You follow the instructions with setting up your alarm, but you don't follow the Twitter. You're, you're doing the steps in the wrong order. That's the number one thing. You get all the updates for any tournaments that are happening, ladder snapshots as well, some memes here and there for those that are looking for, you know, some jokes as well, not just serious business stuff like I like. Um, so overall, I think that's that's definitely the Twitter to follow if you're into competitive esports, especially in the EMEA region. That's the, the number one resource for sure. That's where I get most of my news from, to be honest. Exactly. There we go. <laughs> Perfect example. Ah, yeah, no, the Twitter is great. Um, I'm loving these competitions. And who doesn't want more TFT eggs? And one last thing to mention is that this is actually the last competitive tournament of Set 8 as well, which kind of fills me up with sadness. I think Set 8 has been, uh, well, it's gotten better over time for sure, let's just say that. But this last patch I think has been pretty fantastic uh, from a competitive standpoint. Uh, so it will be the last, kind of the last hurrah for this set, which is a sad thing to think about. We still have two more days left, so it's not the end just yet. We're not day three waiting for the winner's interview. We still have a long way to go. And all these players are probably thinking the same thing because I mean, there's six more games today. The I, I talked to Snooty Boo after his games yesterday. He was extremely nervous because of what's at stake for him specifically, where we mentioned that if he makes it day three, he makes it to regional finals. I don't think he's ever made it to regional finals, certainly not in set seven and set six. It's one of the big kind of thorns on, on his backside uh, going into, into GSC competitive overall in the circuit. So rooting for him and rooting for all the players. I know there's so much nerves for all of our competitors today and they have to handle these nerves and perform at a high level as well. Oh yeah, I had Snooty picked as my favorite to win in last Golden Spatula Cup and he came in 10th, which was very, very impressive all round. Um, Snooty is definitely one that we like to watch, but not one that I'm going to watch too hard because we don't want to cast or curse nobody. Exactly. There we go. You, you've already in five minutes on this first desk, you learned the lessons of cast or curse. Amazing. I am so proud of you. The progress <laughs> is here is, is fantastic. Not picking Kerfuzzled as your actual winner in the contest. You're doing so good. You've learned uh, what I learned, unfortunately, across two sets. I should have learned it earlier. Uh, now I no longer pick any Spanish players for my favorite or my dark horse for these tournaments. I pick the illusion my favorite. He got eliminated in day one, so I'm I'm sorry, Lelouch, that's on me. But we are ready for game one, finally. I know our chat is asking, when is game? I'm here for TFT. Well, here it is now. Starting carousel, pretty balanced overall. One tier, one rod, a bow as well. And then a lot of tank components, I think, are the best to start, the most balanced in terms of all the different directions you can go down. Yeah, we saw it come into play yesterday. The players really are prioritizing those giant belt starts, those chain vest starts, really establishing their front lane so that when they get that back lane in, they just have this wall of defense that's impossible to get through. With this patch, with overall balance being so fantastic across hero augments, across normal augments as well, we talked about it yesterday, it really opens the fields for you to play absolutely anything, which is why I think 
at 2-1, scouting other players, trying to analyze what direction they're going in, and maybe trying to avoid that, trying to play something uncontested, is going to be the bread and butter for many of the players today. Of course, also taking into account what they feel comfortable with. Some players are more AP players. We know Gunmei is the key example, a Spanish player. <laughs> he just loves playing AP, will try and ignore any intention of playing AD all throughout, no matter what unit he's given. Um, but we'll see what players decide in this game one. Oh yeah, something interesting here. We're seeing Darkest already leaning towards that Anima Squad. Anima Squad is something that has been huge over the last couple of days and something that we're seeing players really gravitate towards. Do you think that's like the best strategy here? It's just a, a strategy where you have to lean into it early. So it's very important to buy these units to make sure you have the good start for it. And if you get a Jinx 2, for example, right now, you have a Jinx, a second Jinx in the shop, that's almost a guarantee to go at Anima Squad because it's a, it's a comp that really needs to have these stacks early on to do well later into the game. Uh, and if you're given the direction, you're given the option to either through units or through the document, potentially here at 2-1, um, you take it. We saw it yesterday. It did so well, has a very good top four rate if you have a good start for it. Yeah, um, Darkest is definitely gonna be looking for top four. And with these augments coming out, nothing quite Anima Squad specific yet. We can see the cogs turning, though. I love the live player cams. <laughs> Either way, it's locks in a little bit too much to reroll. I don't think, I, yeah, I think the reroll here is the better option. Combat training, also not the best performing augment throughout this set. Prep is also gonna be good for reroll. I'm not sure if Darkest feels comfortable on this line, but it looks like for now, you will be going down this route. You can do it with Anima Squad as well. And it's good just for initial stats, actually. People think if you play prep, you have to play reroll. Not so much the case. It can just give you good stats. It is tricky to play around, though. My my opinion with this with this augment is if I'm feeling lazy, I'm not picking it because you have to do too much. <laughs> Board switching. You have to go too try hard in these games. Yeah, that's too many brain cells for me as someone who is not particularly high ranked. Um, I'm loving the Sunfire Cape on Galio, though. This is Dark is really looking to optimize that board and play as strong as possible early with the level up. And uh, yeah, into Nicey, Nicey Boy here. With three recons already, what a start for <laughs> that. I mean, recon is one of these trades that like duelists if you're able to hit that that third or fourth tier of the trade right away it is so much strength on the board and it solves so much of your problem in stage two and we're seeing here darkest takes a loss but hopefully find some pairs in this next shop here not going to be the case galio misfortune and this nas is still going to be one start yeah it's unfortunate that we're not hitting but that prep on the board is going to do some great work for darkest Ooh. and we swing over to gluteus a very, very strong start here, Draven. A bit of a nerf in the last pack, but still one of the more viable reroll comps in the game. We saw it played yesterday by Turkish player Burrito in that game six on stream. He was playing with Malphite support with the, the Guardian Spirit, which I've never seen before. He still manages top four. Draven is just incredibly strong if you manage to pull together the comp, if you manage to get that Draven three star in time. Yeah, Draven has been one of these units that has had staying power. We have seen him patch, patch, and patch again. It doesn't matter what's going on. If you can get that Draven 3, you're whipping it out as fast as possible, and you're sticking with that. Unfortunately, Gluteus is still level 3, and he's just gone against Nicey Boy again with those three recons, so there are crits coming out for everybody. Yeah, I had to really buy all these different pairs because he had two Draven pairs to, you know, ball fight as well. Needed that gold. Couldn't level just yet. Going to play a Lost Streak for most of this stage. Can't really slam any items just yet. Either wants to wait for that glove to build Last Whisper, which is the number one core item on Draven. And then potentially look at something like an IE, a Gunblade, uh, or maybe even BT now after the, the, the buff recently from 10% AD to 20% AD to those BT units. Yeah, Glaze has got plenty of options there. Um, no, he's level four. He is playing that second Draven, but that is not our concern. Now we are off to Cerebus. Oh, Cerebus. He's playing underground for now, but has a Gadgetine bench waiting to come out maybe after that first mm -hmm. cash out. First cash out no longer as appealing as it once was. And we see a level to five here, despite having underground in. Could just be looking at the first cash out for that one component, maybe with some extra gold as well. But overall, doesn't have that 10 to 11 gold value it had before this last patch. Yeah, we saw a lot of players get stung with Underground yesterday. It just doesn't seem to be the way to lose and sort of still get an advantage. Not that Cerebrus needs to lose because he's wiped out Nicey Boy, who we've seen take out the last couple of boards that we've spectated. 
This first carousel could be so important that loose streaking players want to find their ideal component and ideally on a three cost units to continue that gold advantage going into the rest of his stage two and continue their loss streaks ideally as well. So six dot and Gludia is going to have the first pick here. We'll see. Yep, both going to go for three costs again, trying to take advantage of how valuable three gold is at this stage in the game. It seems like it's just three gold, but really the kind of the exponential scaling of gold thanks to the interest mechanic in TFT makes it so that it's worth somewhere around nine to ten gold actually instead of getting just this one cost unit so very relevant in this first carousel yeah players just looking to eke out any sort of advantage they can here obviously when you're towards the top of the scoreboard you're going to be picking last so there's not those three costs available but hopefully let's see what um brain zapped has got here uh and if it's going to benefit them they've got the sword here on a yumi yeah, Battle Mage picked up as well, so only really two directions to go from once you pick this Augment at 2-1. One. one of those is Yumi, uh, in this case. The board is looking more like it's going to be a Renegade Angle. Already has as a Camille 2. Battle Mage works so well with these units that are kind of AP units, yes, but they're also AP units that like to get close and personal, like Talon in Viego. A little bit too close in the case of Talon, especially in this stage 2. Trying to snipe away these backline carries like this Kale that, despite the glove, no longer going to have dodge chancings for that glove, so we're going to probably die quite quickly to this Talon with Gumblade. Oh yeah, Talon is very much in your face. And when he's got the one star kill, it doesn't stand a chance against a little Gunblade-y boy like Talon. He's just gonna heal back and keep destroying and that's exactly what he's doing. Is that he gonna take a loss here? And with the importance of scouting and not trying to step on each other's comps, you can already see with some of these augments that are picked up, even if they're slightly generic like Battle Mage, if you've been playing this whole set, you kind of know what directions you can go from, from picking these first augments, and you know where everyone is going. We have some players, one player playing Draven, one Renegade player, one uh, Dra uh, Anima Squad player, so you have the direction you want to try and find what works best for your current augment pick and items and units, but also making sure you won't be contested so you can hit all of your important units on your rolldown. Oh, that was Brain Gap there, just checking the admin. I didn't catch it, but it looks as if it's been favorable. Did you catch that there as Hall Panda? I did not, but our observer, I'm sure, did, and he will give us the answer in just a tiny bit. But it's good enough to put in this LeBlanc right now to level to five and try and defend this win streak going into the last fight of stage two. So relevant also for scaling up your gold, making sure you're able to fully win streak or fully lose streak this stage two. Playing this hot potato game of win-loss, win-loss is where no player wants to be, regardless of what comp they're playing. Oh, it just had word from our observer there that Brain Gap's admin is that every five seconds, admins are gaining 18 AP. So Not the best, making sense. but What's serviceable it? for now. Definitely getting you some value off of that trade on both the LeBlanc. And in this case, uh, the Camille obviously scales better off of an AD, but still will be somewhat relevant to get those stats in. Yeah, this is looking good. We are hitting Krugs now. I'm just trying to see, do you think there's anything that players are really looking out for as key items to pop off or Krugs? I really see how much item is the biggest thing with the changes to how the item economy works recently. Everyone gets close to the same amount of components, but the amount of components you can get has changed drastically, uh, both at the start of the game up to nine, five components, which is something that's very wild compared to traditional TFC in the past. Um, so it's important to, to, you know, if you're playing for a win streak and you're not slamming on your items, for example, it's actually going to be a pretty bad plan. So we'll see what exactly players do. Six Thought is one of our loose streaking players sitting already at 65 HP. Has to decide when he wants to turn this around. If it will be a 3-2 roll down and if he will be slamming items like potentially this JG if he's going for a spell slinger route. Yeah, that will be the case. Oh, just as you said it, it happened. Your brain is definitely in this game. Six dot, however, just missing some power on these units. The one, the Annie's still one star. The Poppy, although not the strongest unit, also one star. But these items are starting to look nice, and it's looking as though Six dot is chasing this gadgetine comp that we have been fabled for hearing to do success all through Golden Spatula Cup Two. And of course, the boards at 3-1, especially important, not just for the win streaks and the loss streaks, but also for the tailoring of the board coming into this 3-2 augment. If it is a hero augment, the traits that you have active on your board can be very relevant in terms of what you're offered. So if you get more dogged, sometimes it's your fault for not actually tailoring your traits to make sure you get what you're looking for. What, you know, the traits that you're building towards, if it's a four cost or if it's a three cost in this case, potentially something related to spell slingers or gadgets in here for six stop. But we'll find out. If it will be Hero Augment or if it will be Prismatic Augment to start off this day one. 
It's prismatic and it's glorious. We are seeing our beautiful selection of radiant items. We have the radiant blue buff whose name totally escapes me. Panda, do you remember? Sorry, uh, repeat, sorry? Uh, the radiant blue buff, the name for this. Oh, oh, now, okay, I, I'm not on that level of trivia yet. I hit the, that tooltip mastery coming more into regional finals, into worlds. At this level, I'm still trying to absorb everything else around me. The hero augments especially add so much more to memorize. So no, I do, do not, but I will check for you, Maisie, because our viewers, I'm sure, are hungry to find out what the actual name is. I love the actual naming for all the radiant items. I think they're, they're so cool most of the time. Um, it will be Blue Blessing in this ah. case, so a hard one to remember. I mean, it's, it's also BB, though, so it's not too hard. Anyone in chat that got that, congratulations, you get 10 TFT knowledge points. They will be them, by myself. The lords are going to come out for us. Do not lie to our chat. <laughs> but look at the Draven now, fully equipped. We talked about the items. It will be Last Whisper, it will be IE, and it will be BT, as I mentioned. Uh, now a better build than Gunblade, thanks to the extra AD scaling on an AD unit like Draven is. In this case, still losing, though. Glubius has to find a way to stabilize this four loss streak soon enough. Yeah, important to note there, Nicey Boy has no hit that four recon critical grand slab. You get a crit, you get a crit, you get a crit point in the game. Finally. Ah, the Draven 2. It's a fairly late Draven 2. This is one of the problems with this comp. You have to find a way to stabilize at 3 2 with the Draven 2, Econ back up, and then have a secondary huge roll down at 4 1, ideally, to try and find Draven 3. In this case, Gludius is a little bit behind when it comes to that uh, level up of this Draven. Only three copies for now, so gonna be a tough spot to crawl himself out of throughout the rest of this stage three. Mm, yes, and with 51 HP, is there enough time and HP to get there? Um, the Draven 2 is gonna be huge. It's especially painful because Gluteus was sitting on that Draven pair since stage one, but we got the Draven 2. He's bringing out huge amounts of damage, but will it be enough? I mean, the biggest problem here is the kind of the, the spike from the Prismatic Augment for many of these players, depending on what you ended up picking and the combat strength you get from, well, Prismatic level, which is obviously the highest tier of, of Augment power in the game. It can completely swing away these win streaks into loss streaks, depending on what other players are able to hit as well. And if you have an Augment that gives you immediate board strength, or if it really scales into the late game, maybe something like a high-end shopping that we saw a lot of yesterday, for example. Oh, the players yesterday with the high-end shop, and I always love seeing that augment because you just know when we hit end game that things are going to be absolutely out of control. Samira um, with the sword, hello. Anyone playing AD in this lobby, hello. How is it going into the last pick of the game, Darkest? They are so, so grateful that players seem to be on pretty locked-in paths like that Draven reroll and a lot of AP players as well because that is very rare. In NA games, you for sure do not see Samira going last pick on the stage three carousel. Oh, wow, Darkus has put together a beautiful five anima squad board. This is where we thought this may go early game, and this is exactly what's happened. That woodland charm as well, duplicating the Galio. The preparation is shining. This is a stunning board. For anima squad, something very important to keep track of for stages two and three, you have to be ideally trying to stay as strong as possible using your econ to roll and stay even stronger because if you fall behind the pace of the lobby if you start losing fights that means you're not killing units that means your animus stacks are not really going up and then you'll be way too weak to actually uh, contest other players in stages four and five so darkest has to really have uh, the fine line of making sure he can be winning these fights and continue to get these anima stacks for things like this misfortune yeah, oh, Misfortune did get a bit of a cast off there, but it is not enough. These four recon just gonna chew through. Dark is still looking for that little bit of strength. And Brain Gap finally takes his first loss, almost goes into Wolves with a 10 win streak. Despite the loss here, though, in a very, very good spot, because one of the scariest things with Ox Force is that level sub and roll down. If you've been loose streaking stages two and three, and you don't hit that video two, you don't hit the right units to stabilize. It's really a hard game to solve it. In this case, though, this is a comfortable spot to play Renegades from. From a win streak, where you are already strong, your Viego, your Talon rather, has three items, and you can take it a lot more chill. You don't hit Viego 2, it's not the end of the world. You have HP to work with to maybe go 8 instead and hit it at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Brain gapped. Losing the win streak isn't gonna be a sign of things to come, necessarily. It's just about finding your key units, like you're saying. Uh, we are into Cerebrus right now, who seems to still just be sticking with those one and two cost units. Not quite an archetype coming out just yet. 
Also picked up that Radiant Relics. Of course, there was a, a you know huge buff to so many different Radiant items that the overall pick percentage of this augment will be going up. Players are, are going to be, hey, a lot of buffs came through. Generally, my options will be better, and I will have a better chance picking up this uh, this you know augment pickup for dramatic level, of course. And it will be the Earth Angel staff that is picked up for that player and for that kill that has it right now in the back. Yeah, the radiant items are good, especially when we remember the names of them. We got the blue, bla <laughs> the blue blessing as well, which I uh, will try not to forget anytime soon. That is now going to be burned into my brain as we head into our wills round. And we're going to see here for Brigade, I think a pretty clear fast 8. Has a lot of gold to work with, already level 7. No need to roll considering his HP and, and still the, the board doesn't suddenly get a lot weaker if, if you've been almost win streaking all the stages 2 and 3. You're still going to be strong. You're still be able, if you do end up losing, you will be losing by very few units. And so he'll be able to go, I think, yeah, going right away into the fast 8 for, for Cerebrus as well, who had that gold to work with. We'll see what he wants to actually build towards in this case for Gadgetine on board. Oh yeah, this is a major overhaul that Cerebrus is going for right now. And really with 44 HP left, now is certainly the time to do it. We have all our items out on the bench and we're just working out where we're going. As to decide what to slam these items on, for now it looks like it might just be that Talia and uh, one of our tanks, Blitz, just being a two-star for now. And the fact that you want to sell this Blitz, it's a better decision to, to slam it on him knowing you can transfer these items over to something like the Echo when you two-star that later on. Yeah, not, not, not quite enough time to fully shift everything around, or gold for that matter, but that is a three item to Leah that we're seeing on board now. And she's been left mostly alone. That MF isn't gonna get the cast off and Talia's just free to do what Talia does. One uh, problem here is no mana generating item for Talia. You can kind of circumvent this or work around it by just playing Star Guardian, uh, ideally five of them later into the game, and that is still fine. And there's, of course, the natural tier component giving you 10 mana off of that Earth Angel staff as well. Stone Weaver going to be kind of big here. Be the stone. The support armor is usually better in the stats for Talia boards. Uh, the HP is just better, but oh, Cerebrus went a little bit too deep. Took a bit too much of a risk and now is offered three augments that don't quite fit what the comp he was trying to go for. Is it just Armadillo as a more generically good option for the Ramus? I think the majority of players probably would go Armadillo in this circumstance. That is unfortunate because that Talia augment would have been usable. As you say, not best in slot, but it, it would have at least been relevant. But we have gone for the Viego. This might be a pivot, a pivot that Brain Gapped, if he's watching, does not like, but he did hit his own Viego too right now. We saw on the right there, so I think Brain Gapped is not too worried about other players trying to contest him or pivot into this Renegade comp at this point in the game. Ooh, interesting to see that Xante has already hit the Talia 2 and has the favorable augment on that Talia, Ooh. so more reason to pivot, really. We're going to see where exactly Zante goes with his board. Sitting right now at 41 HP, 7th place in the standing, so has to stabilize. And he has, for now, at least beating out Cerebrus quite handedly in this 4-2 fight. Zwani 2 will be big now for Zwani. Coming to the board, maybe. Unfortunately, the items are already on the Echo, so it's going to be awkward to, to change this up to get all together unless you want to just sell this Echo. But with the Zoe on the board, with the Gadgetina online, it makes it a little bit too awkward to change these items off. Yeah, I think Cerberus is really kind of... Oh, okay, no, the Tulia is gone. Three-star Kaisa in for an icy boy who has been hard into recon since the beginning. That feels very early. And he's windstreaking as well, so in a very comfortable spot. Yeah, three-star Kaisa at 4-3 without any augments that are helping you, like, you know, loaded dice or any kind of reroll augments for, to, to get more of these units online is a pretty big deal. I, I understand now why he is so stable, why he is win streaking, and why he's almost locked himself in for top four at this point, and maybe even a second or a first. We saw Hodrock yesterday in game five, able to win a game with recons as well from a similarly high roll spot where you're able to capitalize on your early game and your mid game. This is stellar. Um, the, the Like you say, no Kaisa augment. We've taken the Zac augment instead. Can't see just which one that is because the Zac has split for now. Um, but just I'm assuming Super Size, the carry augment. If not, we should be a little bit worried. Elastic Slingshot has been one of the worst performing <laughs> augments in the set. It is Super Size, one of the, 
the better augments and one of the augments that are saving a lot of players in this case now with the, the way hero augment rerolls work you're seeing maybe a lot more threats than the dev team intended and the one threat augment that you can always pick and fit on your board is the supersize the zac just works so well as a tank in any comp yeah that supersize with the four recon with the itemized three star kaisa at four three i don't think any boards beating that right now two components open for six dot sitting around the middle of the standings when it comes to hp but looking now at gluteus our draven player who we said would be in a tough spot going to stage four is in a much tougher spot than i anticipated only five draven six now i'll continue cursing him so he finds more of them but overall you want to have your draven three already at the start of stage four ideally on your four one roll down in this case, no gold to work with and still three Dravens away. It is a very, very tough spot. This might just be an eighth place for the German player. Yeah, this is really unfortunate hitting that Jax three star before the Draven has got to feel pretty painful. And I don't even believe he's contested on the Draven. And I have a lot more HP on the Draven thanks to that Jax three at this point, but really it's not the HP you're too worried about. It's more about the damage and trying to pick off units like this Viego who are just raining fire on the entire board and we're seeing why the draven at this two star level is not going to be quite strong enough to even oh well he killed the viego now but still gets cleaned up by the leblanc by the camille and by this acel as well a great fit in renegades because it's able to chunk down the hp of that backline and allow viego to get more resets yeah this is unfortunate this is it's only game one though so this uh if gluteus does not manage to hit the draven and just kind of fizzles out here he is by no means out for the rest of the day there is still so much to play for selling off the sets trying to get any gold he can he can get his hands on to try and find a few more dravens you know this is the make or break moment for his comp to stabilize especially when everyone else is spiking off of their hero augments but Unfortunately, not going to be the case. This is what happens sometimes playing reroll. You put some of the agency outside of your own decisions and yourself and more into the game, giving you what you need to find success. In this case, did not quite work out for Gluteus. No, this, well, this, I was going to say, this may very well be the last round, but we're seeing Cerebrus there also pretty low. Is there going to be enough damage from this two-star Draven to chunk through the team and take it down? It is Draven versus the world right now. And uh, him being thrown up into the air is not going to help out either off of that Alistar, but he is slowly chewing away at all of these units. Can the Soraka do enough with this Archangel stack to 240? I think the answer is yes. Gludia is still alive, but barely. Oh, the three HP, seven gold, at least he has a round here against the Aurelian Soul where he can maybe get that gold, maybe pull the Draven 3 out. I am crossing my fingers right now. The game is not over just yet. It's very close. A very big distinction between our top four and our bottom four. There's a big 20 HP gap there. So it's, it's, these next few fights will be especially relevant for these bottom four players. Whoever is able to win one of their next few fights might be the difference between an eighth place and a fifth place. So we'll see what ends up happening. And if this last bit of gold from this PB round can help Gluteus do a heroic stabilization, finding three more Draven in these last few rolldowns. It was something we saw in is it at least two of our games yesterday players coming back with literally one hp and a dream oh two more up two more one more had one 40 more. gold to work with can more dog help this german player out mall fight is good but it's not the answer we needed we need that draven instead and it looks like it's not gonna quite get there <laughs> three hp and a dream need just a few more rolls to potentially find this draven three star we got the extra 5% damage from the supers from Malphite coming into 3 star there. But is it enough? Oh, I guess who he faces, good. faces Zante in this case, a player that is sitting on a win streak. So that is norm normally not a good sign if you're trying to win this next fight. The feedback is that this player is strong, is doing well in the lobby for now. And, you know, for good reason, it seems like nothing has died on the side of Zante's board thanks to that Be the Stone Augment from Talia, fully itemized and ready to get one more Weaver's Wall to end the road, the game here for Gluteus, and that will be the case. Gluteus goes down with a minus 15 in eighth place. Diga Sparta 69 also goes down in seventh place. Oh, th that is it. Because we had such a discrepancy in the HP there, we either see players rise to glory with very little HP or we're getting down to a top four really quickly. 
And Cerebrus, the player that I'm not surprised to see going down in the HP standings in the sixth place. He took, I think, too big of a risk on his hero augment roll down, skipped the Talia support, went for this, uh, ended up with his Viego instead, which didn't really fit his board at the time, has pivoted into Soraka at this point with the Earth Angel staff, giving her 30 starting mana, so a cast right away. Will it be enough to stay alive, though? Oh, I hate dealing in absolutes, but I also suspect no. We're against Brain Gap, who also took a Viego augment, but had been playing Renegade and Oxforce since the beginning of the game. Not just that, but found an Ox Force emblem onto Belvis as well. The attack speed being so, so good. And there we see it. Cerebus gets taken down in sixth place with a minus 11. Six Thought also gets taken down in fifth place. As I mentioned it, the HP totals, there was a huge gap and a seemingly a big power level gap as well. The players that were bought for going into this stage five have all been eliminated. Four players remain in this game one. Something very interesting to note about our remaining four players is that um, we've got different comps. Nobody's really trying mm -hmm. to cannibalize each other anymore. It seems to be that everyone that is out versus everyone that's still in kind of was contesting the other in some way. But now it's just four players rushing for the finish line. Quick reminder, it will be Recons for Nicey Boy. It will be Anima Squad for Darkest, Viego for Brain Gap, and Talia Spellslingers, which we're seeing here for the Swedish player, for Zante, trying to get these good angles, we need a challenger level AI for Talia. Sometimes, like Misfortune, is one of these units that can seemingly do so much, and then the next fight does absolutely nothing. But in this case, it looks like the Weaver's Walls are going to be pretty good here. One last one coming through on the diagonal does not hit Misfortune, and that could be the deciding factor in this fight. The last cast comes through. Talia almost gets killed. Vayne cleans up, and LeBlanc, without items, I don't think can do enough. No, that's not going to pull through just yet. But yeah, that very much felt like it was down to who ulted where. So keep an eye on this. Um, There's the last Draven. Oh no, Gluteus, you weren't alive until this carousel or else you could have gotten your Draven 3. He was so close, yet so far. <laughs> oh, it's always so painful spectating these games live when you know that one unit makes such a difference and you're just sitting there hoping that they get it. Darkest Hyrule, the carousel there, finds an Anima Spat, can now play seven Anima, and it's on a Nunu as well, so he gets Masket, which is a great trait to have with all this extra HP from the Anima stack. So Darkest, I think they're feeling pretty happy about this carousel and where it puts them, considering they're already win streaking coming into this end of stage five. I mean, this Darkest has a blessed board. We saw the Anima squad created after the first carousel when they picked up a spatula. But can we call this a face cam difference? Do you think you're just more blessed for emblems when you give the casters your face cam? I'm all for it. Players, if you're listening, turn on your webcams. You will be rewarded. More dog will hit you with the perfect carousels for this stage five. We're seeing now the picture in picture here. Both fights occurring. Zante playing up against the Viego board, against Brain Grab. The Urgot doing a lot. Talia still very healthy in the back. Not touched yet by the Viego and the Belveth. Both Belveth and Viego seem to be going down here. Belveth trying her best with the Gunblade, healing up. Can she do it? Oh my goodness, this Belveth is cracked. And this Camille with the Thieves Gloves might be doing enough here. Deathblade and the Dragon's Call able to help her heal up a tiny bit. Get some MR for the Sonic cast. Oh, it was so close, but not quite enough in the end. Oh my goodness, the players are so close to each other. This is great to watch. I, I'm loving Darkest Board here. This this is the Animal Squad dream that we have been talking about on the caster desk all weekend. And I think we're finally we're finally seeing it. Yeah, Full the biggest question now for Darkest is what route they want to take into capping this board out. Do you want to go into five Animal Squad? Do you want to stay with seven since you do have those two different emblems online? allows you to play units like the Nunu, like the Alistar as well. And then just go level nine, try and find a legendary two star or you can consider rolling and finding that Riven 3 as well, but you're so far for now, only three copies. Yeah, this picture in picture is showing just how intense and fast paced these games are moving. That Ox Force Belveth is absolutely decimating everything in her path. All that stands between the victory here is the MF Belveth one on one. The Belveth will take the victory. Looks like Recon's also getting taken down a notch as well. Nicey Boy, who has been in the HP lead pretty much the entirety of this game, who hit somehow a Kaisa 3-star at 4-2 or 4-3, is now finally 
getting contested in terms of his HP going down a tiny bit and has to find a way to recap his board to try and fight for this first place spot or might just pitter out into a top three or a top four. Not too sure where, like my brain is not as advanced as these players. I cannot even possibly think what is gonna give someone the edge over another player here. Just because we're seeing nobody's nobody's streaking either way right now, it's so even that these players are just looking for any advantage, any positional, any item here from this stack. Shot of stillness could be one of those answers. Ideally, for uh, top level players, this is something that is obviously a very small detail, but it's actually very important. If you have your units fully itemized, where you know that most of the time you're getting a utility item or just a tank item for Alistar here because you don't have spots left for Viego and Belveth, one key thing is to open this anvil as late as possible. You're not, you're not forced to open it the moment you get it. You can wait. If you get a Zephyr or a Shroud, you can pick it up the moment the fight starts. Players cannot scout you, can reposition, and can't play around it. So actually, I mean, for these players to keep in mind throughout the rest of this day. Something that I really love that Nicey Boy has done has gone for that second two star Zach with the supersized augment. If you're looking for a front line, it does not get much beefier than the three star Cholgath and two of those Zachs. The Zephyr on the left here only hit the no item echo, so not the most relevant of hits there. No space on Talia to throw up this MF into the air, and her cast are coming through, cleaning up most of the board, but still that last undertow can come through. The CC does come on as well, but not enough damage from Talia. She gets taken down as well. And MF should be able to clean up the board here. Well, LeBlanc might have something to say about this. One last cast comes through. The angling occurs as well. And the fight win does go to Darkest. Well, that fiddle there, I thought, may have the misfortune. He was dodging all over the place and the targeting on the misfortune looked almost robotic. But uh, yeah, Animus Cloud cleaning up there. That was Darkest Sport. This is a crazy recon board from Nicey Boy. Two away from the Ramus 3, two away from the Nyla 3. Usually you can't be this greedy about hitting so many 3 stars, but Nicey Boy was in such a good spot at stage 4 that he's able to do so. Try greed out and go for the win. Yeah, this is the beauty of having our four players on four different comps. We really get to see all of them shine relatively uncontested for their individual units. These, these players are looking for power and they are, they're absolutely giving it to us. The Viego does get Zephyr in this case. The Undertow will be coming out from the Urgot as well. Got nerfed recently, so gonna be a little bit later. As we're seeing here, finally comes through. We're gonna get both the Belveth and the Viego in that CC. Is it gonna be enough though for Talia to clean up and get these kills? It seems to be the case now. The Urgot 2 helping out to kill off the Belveth, and I guess also Brain Gap in this case ends up fourth place. That was well played by Brain Gap. Although he's leaving us in fourth place, this game is so tight Ooh. towards the end. Fiddle 2 is big here. Syndra will be pulling this Fiddle in. You don't necessarily have to replace a unit on the board right now, since Fiddle does not give any traits in start of combat, but other units do. And I'm wondering if, I guess you don't really sell this Syndra. I think it's, you know, you're still, still pulling the Fiddle at some point in the game, and, and he will still clean up and do a lot of damage in these fights. Yeah, I think with this much frontline, um, he can get away with just leaving both units on the bench there. So Zephyr comes in, only hits the one item, Ramus in this case, the Kai'Sa. Gonna be doing a lot of damage on that backline, but now finally the Fiddle comes in right away. The first pull from the Syndra to Leah. Very healthy in the back. Her angling here is not hitting any of the recon units. The Kai'Sa is still full health and stacking the Rage Blade as well. This last cast will be so important, but once again, whiffs to the right. Talia is dead. LeBlanc is good, but not that good, and Zante will be taking down in third place in this game one. Oh, death by cutscene for Zante. He won the 50-50 there. He pulled the fiddlesticks in over that one-star Syndra, and it just wasn't enough. We are down to our top two, though. Very exciting. We've got Germany's Nicey Boy versus Turkey's Darkest 1903. Proud on the carousel. No one ends up picking up that Shroud, in this case, Ramus 3 is found, yet another power spike for the German player for Nicey Boy, uh, making it so that I think he's going to be the clear winner here. We'll see what Darkest can do. Has been level 9, has found an Urgot too. Will that be enough to actually change the tide of these fights, to actually maybe get him the win in this game one? Change the tide, Urgot? I see what you did there, Panda. Uh, even if I'm sure you'd rather I didn't point it out. Um, I'm not sure the Urgot 2 would make the difference anyway, and it looks like 
Darkest has, yeah, Darkest has decided the same and instead put that Nunu back in for what could be our final fight. Ooh, the Kaisa steps up a little bit, but now steps back once again into that recon trade. The MF takes her down to half health, but isn't quite able to kill off the unit, which is a big, big deal. The Undertow is now coming through. The CC comes in onto the vein. The MF casts once again, this time a much better angle than we've seen in the last few fights. Can it be enough? The answer is no. Darkest taken down to 2 HP. Oh, Darkest remains in. They have one life remaining. I am honestly not sure what's going to get him there. The, the misfortune is all in all the right places. It just seems as if this front wall of madness that Nicey Boy has produced is just too much to get through. I'm not sure if moving the MF to kind of the, that second row pocket, it might be enough to actually get that damage onto the Kai'Sa right away. The positioning will be the difference maker potentially in this fight in the NMF, just still in one of the back corners, this time on the left. You saw from the last fight, will it be the difference maker? We'll find out very, very soon. Nunu is a big counter to Recon as a trait overall. It makes the, the AI go a little bit all over the place in terms of how these units move around. But the Nunu will be targeted and killed off very quickly. The MF now is still very healthy and has a good angle onto both the Vayne and the Kai'Sa. Can this fight be different from the last one or will it be the same result? Kai'Sa almost taken down, but not quite. Nicey Boy gets the win in the game one. Darkest ends up second. Oh, you can see on Darkest's face, there was a little moment there of, oh, is it enough? And then the disappointment sets in. It's so devastating to see, but congratulations, Germany's Nicey Boy. And we can't say we are too surprised with the results of this game because all the way in stage four two, if a player has a Kaisa three already, they're in a very, very good spot to, again, not have to roll. Just think about their econ, go to 50, start slow rolling at, at 50 gold to try and find more upgrades, which ended up happening. Cho'Gath three, Ramus three, Nihilith three, I mean, all the upgrades across the board were there for that win to come through. So huge, huge props to Nicey Boy. So important, Maisie, starting off the day with a win because you have this extra level of confidence for the next five games to try and make it into day three. Yeah, and very interesting that it is our player from Germany that gets the win. Germany being our most represented country today. They are coming and fighting. They're like, move over, France. Germany has arrived. And Darkest representing Turkey. Also good to see Darkest on the board and Turkey overall because Turkey went from 14 players in day one to just five in day two. They lost a lot of competitors coming into this uh, second day of the tournament. And hopefully at least these five remaining players like Darkest and a few others are able to actually perform and make it to day three as well. And represent one of the biggest communities in EMEA, Turkey, of course, just huge, huge player base and a lot of competitors trying their best in these tournaments. We have a break ready and we have an interview with my favorite player, Spanish player Snooty Boo, so stay tuned for that, and we'll see you with the analyst desk after that break. Okay, so my name is Balu Antares Moroni, I'm 28, and I was originally born in Germany, uh, but I'm currently living in Spain since pretty much uh, since I was five, and I'm more known as Snooty Boy in the gaming community. Okay, so the, the thing that I enjoyed the most about this, uh, this set is that I actually think they got the grasp on the hero augments, they've been getting much better at that, and the first month I was pretty much playing non-stop, like 12, 14 hours, so I'm really enjoying it. Usually when we're uh, almost at the bit set, I'm kind of tired of it, but I'm still in the mood of gaming 8, 10 hours a day, so I'm really loving it. So TRC is definitely have to be important because like the reference we have in, in Europe is uh, France and their system revolves around their, their national competitions, their TRCs, right? And they've always been a step ahead and they've kicked their ass forever. So I think that Spain is actually catching up is really important. Myself, I've always been good at ladder but struggling with these tournaments. And now that I've been playing in these much more often, I think it's getting better. Oh, so I've been competing in pretty much all the Rising Legends competitions ever since it existed and even before it was called Rising Legends. But I think uh, this, uh, this year has been my best performance so far a GSC one where I got 10th. I think I could have done a bit, bit better, but that was still pretty nice for me because I actually get a, a real shot to get to the European Championship, which is pretty much my dream ever since I competed. So that's pretty nice. Of course, everybody who supports me every day, thank you very much for the for the cheers every day. And everybody who's enjoying TFT, keep on doing that. Uh, this is an awesome game. We're going in the right direction. Have a nice uh, day and uh, thanks for watching.
Brand new game, brand new day, comes with a fresh flavor of lobby for me at the very least. We had very little contests across the lobby, very chill until the late game a little bit. Everyone just handshaking, even from the early game. And I know, uh, Peter, you wanted to talk a little bit about how that recon board ended up making it so deep. Oh yeah, well, I mean, just to jump right to the end of the game, I suppose. The, I was really expecting with Zante in particular, having got the level up and playing a level 10 board with some truly ridiculous stuff in it, you know, that's just kind of taking the power level beyond the normal ceiling we see for recon comps, but you know, we saw Woodland Charm coming for both our top two players, and along with you know, Super Size as well, Nicey Boy managed to cap out this recon board higher than maybe, I think, even we've ever seen. Yeah, and also, like... He got really, I'm, I'm not gonna say lucky, I'm just gonna say fortunate here, right? Freeze a company to one, drops a vein in a Kaiser. Like, all right, you just ping and chat and like, yeah. me recon? So. Well, yeah, me recon, me no scout, me no pivot. And that was kind of the story for a lot of these players. This game, of course, Glute Gluteus, one of the ones we highlighted very early on, found two Dravens and was like, clear Draven angle. And then, unfortunately, never found the Draven 3, even with Mecha Prime Emblem, just was not enough to make that game work. And I feel like that was the story of the game for a lot of our players. Very early committals, like you already pointed out, Nicey Boy, we able to find that recon early darkest very early committed to that uh anima squad composition as well and as a result we didn't have uh cannibalization we had a lot of parallel lines going at once and it was really just up to the players to maximize what they were able to do with their chosen line another thing is also worth noting here right is that for someone like Mateus you really want to see the hero augment either 2-1 or 3-2 when you're playing the Draven line. Yeah. But at a point, he was so deep into the into the mixer that he could not get out of it. And that really ended up being a, a huge, bummer for, huge bummer for him, for sure. It's like one of those things where when you are in these lobbies where everyone is just going to spike very highly, which is the case with Prismatic Seconds, because the people that have had a lot of gold sitting on the bench, okay, I can just pick level up and start playing capped out boards, etc. You just already know that you're going to be playing way from behind here. Yeah, like you said, those augments really making the difference in a lot of these late game boards. We talked about it yesterday, but Bunny Mercenary, which is what Darkest picked up for their misfortune, one of the strongest augments in the game and makes an already incredible comp just that bit stronger. And that was enough to get that second place. Yeah, I mean, we absolutely, you know, talking about the committing from early on, Dark is absolutely running down the lane. Of course, you know, Dark is your Dark Horse pick, Niberia. I was wrongly calling out in the chat saying your, your picks hadn't made it through, but no, in fact, both of your picks have. And I think Dark is, you know, a player we've seen before, and gotten very excited about seeing before. Their play has generally been extremely fun to watch, and this game was no exception. One of the things I'm really excited about seeing from Darkest is a little bit of a switch up in strategy from uh, the previous sets. During set seven, really wanted to play towards those later game compositions. I remember a lot of Guardian play focusing around that Idis and those four cost late game boards. Now showing a little bit more flexibility. So we head over to the standings and see how game number one went for our gamers. Yeah, this is just going to be one game, right? So you can see everyone here finished either fourth and above, which is just being again another day where you just want to be in that top four. You don't have to be pushing very hardly uh, for that first place finish. But look at that, Kevin Parker and TFC Marks. Remember Marks, he was talking about, okay, I'm just going to stick to my consistent lines. Guess what he played? He played Jackson this game. Kevin Parker also played Recon. So at least two lobbies being taken home by these Kaiser reroll lines already today. That's incredibly impressive for Marks who finished yesterday in second place. Now to win the first game again, and Kevin Parker as well. It's you know two of the top three to come into this first out of the first lobby with two first places as well. Certainly speaks very good hopes for Germany's chances to maintain some very strong players into day three. Something I pulled out earlier on yesterday was the idea that Recon doesn't seem to be showing up as much as a primary line, but it's fairly uncontested, is able to secure those top fours, and as we've seen today, starting out with even some top ones. So I'm wondering if we're going to see a little bit more of that. Maybe yesterday was a sample size issue, or if it's still going to continue to be one of those things where it's just like, yeah, okay, I hit, it's time to go. Yeah, and I, I think, think that... 
the big thing that's worth noting here with recon as a line in general is that if it isn't contested, you can just go for it. But the thing is that very often, and people on ladder will find this as well. I mean, my master games is like, okay, that's always three people playing Kaiser, right? And it, it, and that cannot be, be the case in tournament, which is why you'll, generally speaking, see it do quite well in tournaments. All right. yeah, and with that, oh, sorry, go ahead, Peter. Hello, no, no, please. I think we do need to get to the next game, don't we? Yeah, we've got a game already ready to go, so we're going to toss it over to Impetuous Panda and Maisie Marzipan for round number two. Take it away. Thank you, Niberia. We are ready to rumble. Once again, Maisie, we had a pretty good spread of comps, as we mentioned, not too much contesting occurring, and overall, I think a lot of what we will be seeing today was represented in game one. But is there anything you were missing from that selection of comps? We did see Gadgetine get a bit of a fair shake. We saw someone building towards it, but it never quite came to fruition. I still haven't seen a Golden Spatula Cup yet. The big Gadgetine set and all its little Gadgetine buddies, and that's something I'd really like to see, honestly. We saw yesterday in Game 6 from, from the Georgian player, 1ASA, but did not end up working out. He ended up getting a fifth place, and I think that might have not actually made him uh, call heading day two, so hopefully we'll see it, but hopefully we'll see a better showing from it as well. I think it's so important to have the right items for it, a good start for it, and, and things didn't really go as well for that player yesterday, because the lobby was very, uh, was a strange one. We had, you know, Canvas going from eighth to second place with Admin, and then, yeah, it was definitely a strange lobby as for game six. Yeah, we saw Wonder yesterday almost go for it, and I was like, get the spat, get the spat, get the spat. The spat never showed up. We had that three-star Lulu being hacked into the back lane. There's all sorts of madness with Gadgetina, and you know I'm here for madness. We are ready to get into this game one. Darkest, again, choosing a tier and starting Carousel, so it seems they do have a preference for AP in general. Anima Squad last game, but this is the magic of AP on this patch. There are so many options to go down. Some patches, it was really just uh, Yumi reroll, and, and that's it after Spellslingers got gutted after that first patch of the set. But in this case now, you can play Viego, you can play Anima Squad, you can play Yumi, you can play Spellslingers, Admin, Arts. I mean, there's so many options to choose from. Such a testament to where the game is right now. I am struggling to think of a time when the game was quite as balanced as it is now, both for casual and competitive play. I just, I just love TFT. We did not have a chance to go over the players in this lobby before we jumped right into the game. So let's quickly go over some of the names here. Guillosco and Dalesom, two of the best performing Spanish players after this game one, are in this lobby. Darkest as well making return. Nuki, Jinx IRL, we saw yesterday playing a lot of Anima Squad, also popped off and, and played really well. I think finished 10th on the day. So really good showing from him in the tournament until now. And Mujiwara, the, maybe the, the key face now of North Africa, representing Egypt, without Bricks being here, uh, a key figure to, to look at for today. Yeah, Mujiwara is not someone I've ever seen play before, so I'm actually really excited to see what he pulls out. Love to see underrepresented countries finally get some representation, so I'm sure he's ready to stand up for Egypt. And it's not just him, we also have I Am Scar, who we saw in Game 5 and 6 on broadcast yesterday, also from Egypt. And he's one of the players that really surprised me the most yesterday. I, I loved his play style, I love how he navigated those two games on stream, and, and hopefully we'll see him finding that success today as well. But we're gonna stick to this lobby for now, and we're gonna stick to the augments that are being offered here. Knife's Edge, we talked about it so, so strong with a duelist opener in day one yesterday. Yeah, Knife's Edge is definitely the one that I think I would probably waver towards in this situation. Is it going to be good enough for seeing Mujiwara really think on this one? With the items, maybe not so much, leaning more towards AP. Could be a true twos if you want to try and gamble that very good win streak start. Can't really slam any carry items with both a rod and a tier unless you want to build Archangels, which is kind of iffy. Chinese players have been doing it, but has not really caught on in the West right now as an, as an initial slam in stage two. Could be a reroll at this point, could be maybe Axiom Mark, depends on the admin and what LeBlanc can do with that. We're gonna check now, you have to check the augment as well, Mojuara. Decisions to be made. A oh, little risky, yeah. oh, sorry. Axiom Mark was a pickup in the end, so leaning towards this AP. Yeah, a little risky perhaps taking Axiom Arc without knowing if the admin settled that way, but it's all coming up Mojuara right now. He is blessed. That was probably the decision point there, and yeah, it's in a slam Archangel, I love to see this. We saw it in the Asian Cup last weekend where a lot of Chinese players were playing into AP, playing into LeBlanc, and they were not scared to slam Archangels, an item that has been 
pretty much underrated and not really played at all in the West all throughout this set. So love to see players adapting to this to this final patch and saying, hey, I need to slam something here. Archangel is good enough. Yeah, Muji seems to be a player that's really played attention. And honestly, that gamble has paid out beautifully for him. We're throwing in a little brawler spice, keeping that admin active, of course, and hitting level four. I think this could be a player that's looking to win streak early. Gonna have to find some upgrades, and for now, doesn't even have the right pairs. Only a single copy of Renekton and Blitz on the board, nothing else on the bench. A mix of units that you don't really want to have for a win streak, like these underground units on the left. So it's a tough spot for Mujiwara. I think the admin was also not ideal. In this case, every five seconds, admins gain 18 AP. It fits with AP, sure, but it's not really that strong. I see you get a team spent. Oh, I think it may happen this game. Your caster powers came through Maisie. We talked about the top of, of, of the game and it has occurred here. And we'll see where Guillosco takes this. Spanish player, I know he's been prepping with the other Spanish players. They are all very aware of how to play with this augment picked at 2-1. We're gonna build towards that set mech for now. We're gonna be the Draven instead. Oh, Giosco, please hear my casting cries. I am very excited to see if that all comes to fruition. Oh, yay! We got the yep. Ionic Spark. That is a beautiful thing to be throwing on your Annie once we find her. Oh, it's, it's all coming up good. It's all coming up good. Sorry. <clears throat> Giosco cannot uh, stop himself from buying this Yumi. For anyone who does not know, Giosco is one of the most degenerate reroll enjoyers on the EU West ladder. There's certain patches where he only played Yumi and, and he's played a lot of reroll comps and done very, very well with them. I think he's one of the best supers players in the server for the set. And in this case, the Yumi goes in and, and we'll see where he takes his Gadgetine Crest. Obviously not going to be really a reroll in most cases. We saw Solo rerolling uh, the Gadgetines yesterday in that game four, but not the most likely path you tend to take. Oh, uh, something interesting to note here is that Darkest is not started Anima, which seems to be their comfort point. It looks like they're going for some sort of Defender Recon mix for now. So one that has started Anima is Dalesom. Dalesom has Anima Squad Crest as his first Aquaman pickup. And he's not healthy, which is not a good sign for Anima Squad. You want to for sure be win streaking ideally and stacking the Anima stacks throughout the stages two and three. So we'll see what Dalesom was able to do. Doesn't have maybe the best items with uh, really all three components open for now. Could not slam anything just yet. Yeah, Dalesom has favored that vein with the Giant's Belt there. I'm going to just guess that that will get you and the Giant Belt will be put on the front line just for a little bit of strength there. To be losing with Anima Squad really isn't what you want to see here, but we still have plenty of wiggle room. It is only stage 2-4. And of course, a vein is a vein. If you're playing Anima Squad, that might be the key to start getting these Anima stacks. It's a unit that does get a lot of kills in stage 2, so that could be the relevant factor in that pickup there. But Defender Crest picked up here for Burderp. It's going to be right away this Defender Crest put onto the Blitzcrank, who did get a buff in this last patch. He's going to do a little bit less or a little bit more damage reduction when his ult comes up in this case. So we're going to be a little bit tankier and a better option in Stage 2. Hmm, just wondering if I can see what Burderp has Anima Squad uh, admin-wise. Um... I we had it from our observer, yeah. Every five seconds, your team will heal 150 health. Perfect. Oh my goodness, the observers are on point today. Thank you very much. And we're seeing Yosko getting a different Gaijin Crest user every round, spicing it up, making sure everyone gets some love. In this case, it is going to be Renekton with the Titan's Resolve. It's going to work so well with how he has his built-in healing off of his ult. Can he survive enough for this Lulu and Yumi to clean up? It's going to be a close one here. If the Blitzcrank finally dies, it's the last bastion of defense crumbles, which it does. The Croc is onto the Zoe, and in three punches, the Zoe has been obliterated. Another win for Giosco, who is still defending this win streak at 100 HP. I love the history you gave us about Giosco there and the Yumi. I love that even though it's not technically part of the Gadgetine comp, Giosco has just went, you know what? I'm taking my lucky charm with me. Yumi is joining the team. That's it. I only, you know, I called him a D-Gen reroll enjoyer, but I am the same. We've we've gone one and two in lobbies, uh, you know, both playing D-Gen comps and just handshaking at the end, which is why I think I, I definitely know his history. I, I've seen it up close. And in this case, it's going to be a little bit different for this game. Do you know, only in TFT can we say someone is a D-Gen and mean it in a good way. 
I love this. If the team. results are there, I mean, this is this is definitely a good thing. And Diosco has been popping off. He qualified through through ladder in the end for this tournament, so that goes to show how strong he's been this set. And yeah, well, I mean, that strength is continuing on. That gadget team, uh, Renekton, is just formidable. It's he's just not taking any damage at all and just being the ultimate frontline early on in this game. I really and like it. Diosco secures the five wins. Should we talk about it being so so important for your economy? We'll see where Giosco goes from here. Definitely a good spot to be in. This is the, the real test for a player of his caliber and the start he's had. If he doesn't top four in this game, maybe we start looking at Gadgetine Crest not being as viable after the nerfs to, to Gadgetine overall into this past 13.5. Oh, certainly. I think in 13.4, even without the Gadgetine Crest, you could still get away with playing this comp. Now I feel like it really relies on that. And this is the ultimate test. Does it stand up in Golden Spatula Cup 2? Looking at the rest of the HP totals, Darkest and Nuki at the very bottom there, seventh and eighth in the standings. Overall, there isn't that player that's already at 50 HP, like we saw yesterday from a few players like Aka Wonder. So a little bit more parity when it comes to the HP totals. No one is full on uh, open forwarding in this case. So trying to keep hold of their HP totals for now. And we'll see in stage three how that changes to the players that are at the bottom decides to start rolling at 3-2 and trying to find a way to stabilize. Yeah, stability is something that Darkest and Nuki are looking for. It's very interesting to see that the game that Darkest doesn't immediately throw themselves into with Anima Squad is one where we don't see that win streak that we've come to get to know from Darkest. So it will be interesting to see what sort of board is being thrown together on their side. But for now, we are... Oh. Oh, we've gone prep again. Darkest went prep in the last game as well, so that's two prep games in a row. He's trying to tell us something, Maisie. He is prepared for this day two, clearly. And Talia is going to help him with that because they're going to have a Talia to really stomp throughout this stage three. Very early on, the Shiv and the JG. No no mana item just yet, but still going to be a very relevant forecast for now. But LeBlanc with the Archangels, the slam for Mojuara. Will it be enough? The APS stacking. The last kill will not come through, and Talia will clean up house. It's kind of beautiful. It's not the Anima Squad that I've come to expect from Darkest, but it is a very, very early Talia. Unfortunately, not many preparation stacks uh, kicking about for really any of the units there, but I, Darkest has got a plan. I feel it in my bones. It's going to be 3-2-2 two, two for the hero augments here. We mentioned before the tailoring at 3-1, so important. And in this case, it will be the support augment for Rel. And the upgrade to Rel as well, channeled Furmancy is going to be the pickup there, which means the more casts you're able to pull off, the more your team is casting overall, the more resistances you will have off of this augment. So going to really help with making this board a tiny bit more sturdy, especially to Leo 1 that doesn't have really the HP pool just to stay alive after some units are able to target onto her in Stage 3. Ah, I take back what I say about those preparation stacks. I'm only just now seeing them on the units. I guess they were not active in battle there. I apologize. Um, but now with five star guardian in, we're going to be getting a heck of a lot more cast than we were before. And we got the Yumi. The Yumi seems to be a good omen in these games. Ooh, to see this LeBlanc carry Augment LeBlanc, one of the strongest units in this patch. Regardless of her cost, even just being a 3 cost, she does so much with the right admin. In this case, with the carry Augment as well, the aim assist, gonna make sure she does not miss her target. She kills off all of them. The extra sigils gonna be able to clean up house as we're seeing here. And Darkest takes another loss at this 3-2 stage. Usagi also going 7 as well at 3-2, which is very rare, but with the gold lead he had, it does make sense. Oh my goodness, yes, still win streaking at 3 2. Oh wow. Uh, we we did see a player in the last game make it up to just before Wolves with that win streak, so it's still not her longest win streak of the day. But I don't think Giosco is even slightly done with this win streak just yet. Curious what the admin is going to be for Jedusor, who had that LeBlanc and he's leaning into that very heavily. I assume if he did pick up the carry augment, that means that it's already a good augment. Uh, uh, admin rather for him as well to try and scale with that into stage four. Um, and curious to see where he also going with this board as well, considering he's level seven. Uh, what gadgetine crest is, is where? What is what item it's on or what unit it's on rather? Uh, could be maybe just leaning towards that mecha. Yeah, I very much doubt it's still camping out. Oh, there we go. I was going to say I very much doubt it's still camping out on that Renekton. But once again, I shall eat my words. Did pick up the Zoe carry, so it makes a lot of sense. He's already fully 
into Gadgetine. He has the first Aguin that, that, you know, locks him into this path. And one of the scariest things when you are fully locked in is getting a hero augment that does not uh, synergize with your board, with what your final board, what you want it to look like. In this case, there is perfect synergy between Zoe Carry Augment and that Gadgetine Crest going into stage four. Yeah, this is gorgeous, even though Giosco has already gone up to level seven and that Nunu is a possibility, albeit tiny. He doesn't even need it. He's got his Gadgetine Crest. This man is raring to go. He's gonna have all the damage reduction. He's gonna be doing all the extra damage. He's gonna look stylish doing it. Look at that little legend, stunning. High tempo in this lobby, only one component open for every player. So players have, have felt the pressure from the top of the board and have decided to slam their items to try and stabilize and stay somewhat strong going into the end of this stage three, especially for players like Jinx IRL, Nookie is his in-game name. He has to find a way to, again, become stronger coming to this, this next stage because 49 HP is not where you wanna be at this point in the game, unless you have a lot of gold to work with. Yeah, not hold Nuki, uh, Jinx IRL is on an 8 loss streak and with 49 HP to go, it's like, we, we, we gotta start getting the goods going. Uh, 6 Brawler though, this is something that we saw do real nice yesterday, especially we got that Jax with the RFC. I mean, it's, it's doable from this position. Awkward combination of Augments here though, double trouble with this reverberation. Well, playing two Rivens and two Jaxes is not the easiest for trying to play six Brawler as well. I assume he was trying to tailor for a cleansing safeguard, a leasing carry augment at 3 2. Did not hit it and now find himself in an unusual spot. RFC and Gunblade are slammed on Jax. They can win matches for now, but a loss streak is not a good sign, not good feedback for where the, the strength of your board is right now. Last catch from Dalia. Oh, almost able to clean up the board. Oh, well, we have came to Jinx IRL just as that win streak is over. I, mm, I'm doubtful on if that win streak is going to continue. We need a little more power. We need to be utilized in that double trouble. But we are back to someone who does not need any more strength. It is Spain's Giosco. What a comfy, comfy spot. Nine win streak. One more and he's able to 10 win streak into Wolves. And that is just a sign of absolute dominance with the HP you have to work with for stage four, but also the gold. He's level seven, 50 gold already going into this last fight. Extremely rich, gonna be able to fast eight and build towards an extremely capped Gadgetine board. Yeah, this is outstanding. This must feel great as well. Um, as a caster who has representation from this company, uh, from this country rather, Casting thing is, uh, one of your fellow countrymen doing so well. Wow, I am going to have a small drink of water for I tripped over that whole sentence. <laughs> the Jack putting in work here for Jinx IRL seems like it's going to be enough to stabilize here. He has rolled down at level 6, down to 20 gold, so has used a lot of that gold to try and get stronger, and it seems to be working for now. Even with just that Jax 1-star that we're seeing on the board, enough to kill Giosko, who, again, because of his HP, because of his, his overall power, hasn't felt the need to use too much of his gold to get stronger just yet. Oh, very interesting. That's just before Wolf's our longest win streak of the day so far ended on 3-6, but Giosko now takes that mantle. Uh, sorry, 3-5, yeah. And now he takes the mantle with 3-6. Ah. I'm curious where he wants to go level 8. Uh, I assume if he's rolling for set, he does want to go 8. He has a goal to work with for sure. Doesn't feel too much pressure yet with the HP. I wonder if it'll be at 4-2 or if it'll be at 4-5 rather and go extremely greedy with it. It really depends on how strong you think you'll be once you do hit your comp. If you think you'll be stable enough to still maybe not really take any losses at all, then you're fine losing more HP uh, throughout the rest of these next few three rounds, for example. Yeah, that is the uh, the fight that must be going on in his head. But I mean, you see this bloodthirster, you see the sunfire, you see the items on the bench. Like it's all just pointing at Set entering the battle very, very shortly. The admin there, I think, will not be too relevant from the options that we saw there. Ideally, you're going to be playing the four Gadgetines, the three Mechas, and then one extra unit. In this case, usually going to be an Alistar to get that Oxforce online with the Annie. Um, and also maybe just an Echo to get Prankster online. So that's the board that Giosko, I assume, will be building towards itemizing the Zoe in the back as well. Maybe even three-starring here if no one else is contesting the Gadgetine tree. We have a Spain versus Spain rumble with Dalison there on the other side of the board. Dalison going for that Anima Squad with two Anima Squad emblems. This is very similar to the board we see from Darkest in the previous game. And actually, it's incredibly strong. 
Yeah, we picked up, I think, uh, the, the final component for that spatula that he built himself. Didn't get it from any augments for that stage three carousel. And, and that really just frees up a spot to still play seven anima while not having to play both of the, you know, less strong uh, one cost. I don't want to flame these one costs too much. They do a lot in the early game, but late game, they fall off a bit in power. Silas and Nasus usually want to be replaced. Mainly Silas, because he has no extra synergies for Anima Squad overall. But looking at the options here, anything that, that jumps out to you, Maisie? Um, well, with the cybernetic uplink buffs, well, yeah, this is exactly what Giosko has gone for, but with the buffs too, oh. cybernetic... There's oh. a Nunu! Oh, it just hit! Easy! Easy! That is going to be a good holder for the Gadget Team Crest for now. If you want to stop rolling and then wait to build up the Econ to find the mechas later on, or just play Zed overall, could it be the option. No mechas yet. There's one Jax. Yeah, it looks like Yosuke just kind of sat on his eco through the mid game there, rightfully so with that win streak, um, and hasn't quite hit the units yet, but I mean, he has plenty of HP. He's actually now tied with the UK's Bird Arp at the top of the scoreboard there. So there's enough time, there's enough money, there's enough HP. There's nothing to sweat on just yet. So he has to itemize and, and, and refine his board a little bit more. The mythical six gadgetine in right now, gonna drop down to five, I assume, after this fight. And gonna try and, again, econ back up to try and, and hit the next level of uh, power strength or, or just board strength overall for this comp, which will be the mechas. Ideally, has to has a chance to buy the jacks, not buying it now, so this could indicate a completely different angle, could just be going for that Z2 with the gadgetine crest instead. Yeah, maybe just um, Kiosko gonna make his own path there and, and just shun the mix and maybe has something real spicy up his sleeve to show everyone at home. Uh, we're now jumping over to the UK's bird art, so from one of your countrymen to one of mine. Um, this is someone that I don't remember seeing on broadcast yesterday, although please do correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe we did. I think I would remember. I think he has a, a, a nice name, a nice ring to it, bird art. But in this case, Playing Draven, Maisie, we saw, yet last game, Gluteus from Germany did not do so hot with the Draven. Similar spot now, only four copies of Draven at 4-3. I think even worse than Gluteus, Gluteus had five at this point. Mm -hmm. Is this maybe an indicator that uh, slowly this, the HP fall off might end up happening in this stage four? Um, you know, almost certainly. One thing that Burjarp does have in this game that we did not see in the last game is a decent gold pill to roll from, mm -hmm. but that's not really saying that much when there was the Draven lead in the other game. It's doable, but it's 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 oh. not. Yeah, it's doable, but it's not a guarantee. Not 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 even slightly. And this is, of course, a different variation of Draven board. It looks a little bit different to what we saw from Gluteus in the last game. You can play Draven with supers and just play two defender, or because of the defender crest that he got at 2-1, you can play for four defender instead and just ignore supers altogether. If other players are going for reroll strats, and you think you won't be able to hit that cap with the three stars. Yeah, not seeing, not seeing a tremendous amount of super supers definitely more favored in the previous game. Um... Tarkis at 47 HP. I saw that his final augment was Star Guardian Crest. He had five Star Guardian in stage three, maybe going for, yeah, just gonna stay at five while taking off the lesser units. As now that epitomized Ramus with a Star Guardian emblem, not something you see every day. Enjoy it while you can. Do you know, I absolutely need one of our very wonderful creative viewers to create a Star Guardian Ramus skin. Oh, because... um, I, I live for that. <laughs> oh yeah, Riot would absolutely take my money on that one. I think he's the, the least Star Guardian unit in this set. Ramus it's, does not vibe at all with, with, with the skin line, but you know, sometimes that's why it would be so funny. It would work so well. Uh, we'll see Darkest now what they're able to do with this board. Two win streak for now, so it's a good sign. Looking at Nookie on the other side, did pick up Battle Mage. This is a third comp that can actually utilize Battle Mage well, aside from Renegades and the Yumi reroll. Yeah, you give us some great intel on that at the start of the game. When I'm presented with Battle Mage, usually I just think Yumi, but it's uh, really great that there are other applications for that. I feel like every time oh. I say Yumi... The Ramus? <laughs> the Ramus does it. Star Guardian Ramus, you heard it here first. Riot, take my money. <laughs> so first we had Recon Ramus, which is also a sight to behold, seeing Ramus just duck out to the left corner of the board and then jumping back in uh, as if he's just cannonballing into a pool. Similar, Similar here. Different, different emblem, but still Ram is performing at a top level with both the Bramble, of course, uh, which is just the best item for the Ramis because of his scaling with the armor stat. Yeah, that is one punchy armadillo. How is our boy Brank getting on? 
Second Animal Squad player can't make this Riven 2, doesn't have the gold for it, doesn't have the MF2, so my answer is probably not too hot. This might be a big troublesome spot here for Brank, especially when he's facing Gyoksko, who has assembled what we've been talking about this entire game, the set with the Gadgetine Crest. Oh, he's got the set. He's got that beautiful Nunu with the Sunfire as well, just absolutely microwaving anything he comes into contact with. The MS Execution. is going to get really great. Oh, but it's not enough. I'm going to have to lock this shop as well, Brank, last second, or else you'll, you'll be missing on this Riven. Maybe valuing the chance to hit MF above trying to get this Riven 2 in the shop guaranteed. And it seems to be the case. Does not lock the shop in the end, which is, I mean, just goes to show how difficult his spot is right now. Yeah, it's just it's the key units. It's prioritizing who is going to benefit me better in the long run here. And with a two-star Sejuani here, I think it is correct to look for that MF. It's just a matter of whether it gets hit or not before our next PvP round. You know, that is almost also playing this enemy squad line. So it could, again, prove harder for these players to hit their two stars, especially the Misfortune, which is what really you live or die by in stage four. If you don't hit Misfortune two, you start slowly bleeding out. You don't have enough damage. You don't have enough units cleaning up these final few kills in a fight. And you end up pittering out, as we're seeing here, uh, Brank down to 20 HP already at the end of this stage four. Oh, that, yeah, that is, that is happening pretty quickly there. Brank does not have long to stabilize. Something really interesting, though, for Delisom is there is no misfortune on this team, instead opting for that beautiful vein carry. And this is a good call. I think that is someone very clearly, you know, scouted, saw what Brank was doing, saw that, that hey, misfortune might be hard to hit. Do I want to put all my eggs into this basket or do I want to just uh, play it safe, itemize the vein instead and stay stable enough to maybe not commit for a top one, but just try and get a top four in this game too. Yeah, I also really love what Dally Sum is doing here with the Zoe in the front lane. Now that we've got that prankster activated, really just utilizing that trait to its full ability, which is something that I always enjoy seeing. And this might be a loss, and I'm not surprised. Once again, Dedazor is incredibly strong, 43 HP, has Mana Zane on this LeBlanc, and it is LeBlanc carry augment as well, so just an absolute menace. Guardbreaker as well, I think one of the most slept on items in AP overall. Works so well with JG, of course, on Talia, but also really on any AP carry, it does so much in this current meta. I was just looking to see... Oh yes, so Jedizor is admin there. Not only do we have that beautifully optimized and itemized augmented LeBlanc, but every five seconds the team gains 12 mana. So this is a LeBlanc that's going to be casting and casting and casting. The Echo coming in, the Annie as well, sitting on four Spell Slinger for now. You don't have to dip as far into Spell Slinger as you do with Talia in this case, because Admin does give you some of that combat strength, that power on the board as well. The front line lacking a tiny bit, you would like a two-star Echo and a two-star Annie at this point in the game. But with his HP total, I think he's sitting still pretty comfy. And Jinx IRL, someone we've seen, not their main board, just seeing them load in as the opponent, and is still alive and, and has somewhat stabilized. He was at 40-something HP in stage three, so not too bad now sitting at 27. Yeah, uh, we were seeing Jinx IRL go for that full vertical board. We've since added the Giant Slayer to the Jax, which is now two star. It's full oh, on, this rack is just gonna dink. So you know, just as we're celebrating the success of Jinx IRL, he loses just that little bit more HP, but Brank is on the brink with nine HP remaining. And we're seeing now the gap is not really as big as it was last game from top four to bottom four. There's actually a pretty close gap between Darkest at fifth place and Nighthome at 29 in that fourth place position. These next few fights will be so, so influential, especially as you're mentioning for Brank, who is pretty much one loss and he's out. Nookie's still in that, that kind of sweet spot where at 17, unless you get a really big loss, you should still be able to survive at least for two more fights. Yeah, and with HP looking the way, it is, it's kind of similar to the last game where we either see a top four incredibly quickly or are we just going to see someone with like one HP rise up and take us all by surprise? Big Shroud here, but Sejuani's on the opposite side of where you want it to be for this fight. And Misfortune, depending on the pathing of this Jax, could be in trouble very soon. The first cast comes through. The Jinx is there to protect, but the Jinx has now gone down. And Riven is on some Misfortune instead. Can Riven do it by herself? With the Sunfire ticking, the second Riven comes to help. And it will be the case. A big loss there for Brank. And yeah, that's going to be big enough. Minus 8 HP for him. 8th place as well. 
That's unfortunate to see. It's now the UK's bird derp. This was our Draven player sitting in the danger zone. I'm gonna assume that we have not hit the three star Draven if we're down on oh, four HP there, Pen. Targus is doing it. Another star guardian emblem. Who else is gonna join the skin line? First, it was Ramus. Can we get another scary threat to join this theme? Uh, gonna be able to hit maybe seven star guardian though, which is, is pretty good. Oh my goodness, star guardian set. Yep, th that's it. I think I just want all the star guardian skins really, so maybe I'm just biased. One very strange thing, Sure Shot Crest on the carousel. No one playing Sure Shot this game. No one played Sure Shot last game. It's a comp that caps out higher than pretty much anything in the game, in my opinion. If you're able to hit the two star Aphelios, the two star Samira, joined by all those two star legendaries. But in these first two games, very little AD overall and, and no Sure Shot whatsoever, which is, I think, a little bit strange to see. Oh, some AD that we are seeing here, though, is Burdarp, who actually has hit that three star Draven and is still losing fights. We just saw him lose his last fight there on the scoreboard, but we're going to watch and see if three star Draven is enough to rescue Burdarp. And the Ramus, of course, scaling with armor, going to be so, so massive to have the Defender Emblem on this Ramus as well. But he's facing off against the other mech player, this time Gadgeting Mech on the side of Giyosko. The set still remaining strong shielding himself the titan's resolve stacking all the way up to 25 giving extra armor along the way and i'm not sure if draven has enough damage even at three star to take down the set in time the nunu robo ball is coming through the damage comes through as well the sona and the annie last remaining units left after Giosko. can they clean up i don't think it'll be quite enough the whole game is watching every player on the top left there spectating to see if birder can stay alive I the think, answer is no. I think I think this is it. I think this is the confirmation that for Golden Spatula Cups, Draven just perhaps isn't the move unless the game is physically throwing Dravens at you to take them. Yeah, it's. I think maybe not as black and white as a Yumi reroll comp where you really you have to play it from the very specific situation. But it is, again, a reroll comp that you put a lot of agency onto the game. If you roll down at 4-1 and don't hit anything, no matter how good you are, how skilled of a player you are, you're going to be pretty doomed from that spot. Yeah, it's unfortunate to see. We're now with Darkest, who has two HP and one heck of a dream. Has a Star Guardian emblem onto this LeBlanc. Extra cast going to be coming through, but he's facing off against a LeBlanc that is also fully stacked. Archangels, Giant Slayer, and the JG as well. Can this LeBlanc get through the Echo? It's going to be hard with the Dragon Claw as well, providing extra MR. And it seems like Darkest will survive to live another fight at the very least. 2 HP for them. Dale Som at 5 HP. The Anima Squad Spanish player also in trouble. Uh, the board is looking pretty tight with the exception of Jezu at the top there with uh, 43 HP. But everyone's looking so close. We've had a really beautiful comeback from Jinx IRL that is Nuki on our board. Um, yeah, Nuki had like 50 HP at second carousel or something and has like come back to what could be easily a top four. Yeah, he had to, I, we mentioned before, I think he was definitely looking for that cleansing safeguard hero augment. Uh, Pick Reverberation instead, went into fully into this Brawler tree with the Jax carry. Did have the RFC to slam on the Jax, so that's definitely a good sign. Had the Thieves Gloves now as well, potentially. Uh, Hector's Vow also a really good option, but I think Thieves Gloves will be doing more for his board right now. Uh, usually with Brawlers, when they have so much extra HP, the stats you get from just items overall are going to be better than on, than on most other units at this stage of the game. So a good pickup there from Jinx, and we'll see what he can do. 10 HP or 10 gold to roll with, rather, and 17 yeah. HP to work with. It's uh, really beautiful to see that um, Jinx RL slash Nuki has managed to utilize that double trouble as well. This is big. Because, yeah, we last checked in and there was there was no double trouble progress, but now it is being fully utilized. Oh, I really like these items on the Thieves Gloves Jax too. Not terrible. I mean, would have loved to have an RFC or a Rage Play, but still, uh, I think it's great to have both of these Jaxes itemized. Thanks to the double trouble that we saw, of course, the very first augment picked for Jinx RL. And a chance that to maybe take down that is here. The Anima Squad player still has the Vayne as the main carry with the single Rabadons onto the MF on that top left corner. The MF cast will come in very slowly due to the lack of Shojin. Doesn't have to take down one Jax though and stay alive. So actually huge timing with the ult there for the MF. Can a second cast come through? I don't think it's the case. The Riven is hungry for blood and that she will get the Jax as well. Jinx, despite Jinx IRL, 
doing his best. He actually kills the Jinx and kills Dalis home in the process. Fifth place for the Spanish player. Uh, we did not get another death by cutscene there because we don't have the skin on Ari. I love when Twitch chat sees the death by cutscene. They go absolutely crazy. That is an unfortunate place for Dally Sum there, but fifth still very admirable. Now uh, we got Egypt's Mujiwara here. This is someone that's kind of been flip flopping about all game. Um, we got the Syndra, we got the LeBlanc. LeBlanc being very, very contested in this game. Seems everybody just wants to get their hands on this unit. Has a Zephyr as well. Can really get maybe a fight win off of this Zephyr in this case. Can bling up the set ideally, or maybe the Zoe. Gets the Zoe up in the air. In the end, didn't have a good placement to get the set Zephyr instead. The Nunu doing so much here as well, but LeBlanc is really going to be the star of the show here for Mujiwara. Hextech Retribution is the augment, the hero augment from the Camille, so extra. Damage will be coming through as his units end up dying. Can LeBlanc carry though? The set is just so tanky, it just not go down, but Mujiwara does. It's a very respectable fourth place for Mujiwara there. That set was kind of huge, and the LeBlanc just did not find the target needed there. It's really unfortunate. In Someone the end, our top, our top three will be the Gadgeting Crest player Giyosko at the top of the standings. Not surprised from the spot he was in going into stage four with a ten or nine win streak going into Wolves. We have Jedizor with the LeBlanc carry. Also not surprised you mentioned the power, especially with Mana Zane as well. And then Nookie, I think the most impressive player who from the spot he was in managed to now get into the top three and, and still is win streaking now. Yeah, I, I really loved that because uh, this was a player that was in so much peril at the start of the game, just clawing it back, utilizing that double trouble, getting that vertical brawler that I know that the casting desk was very, very fond of yesterday on day one. Uh, it's really nice to see a little comeback. I don't have a comeback. What an attempt at an outplay here from the French player. Sends LeBlanc with Hacker. Instead of getting stuck on set the entire fight, sends her into the backline of the opponent, tries to kill off most of those AP carries for Giosco succeeds, but then the set just turns around and one punch mans LeBlanc out of his existence and also this last unit here. So another win for Giosco in the process and now the HP total for second and third are very, very close, Macy. Incredibly close, although important to note that Jinx IRL has now been on 17 HP for six rounds. This player is holding on and it triumphing almost who knows i i think this is really hard to call usually by now i have a bit of an idea where i can say yeah i think it, i think this player could take it but right now i'm not so sure big upgrade though here for giosko it's why he picked up the zoe he knew he could probably pop off the chain if he found the second one in shop and he does still far away from going nine doesn't really have too much more to spike with if he rolls here but also just not much more hp in the lobby to actually make it to nine not that many rounds left in my opinion uh, Giosko also sitting on that beautiful cheeky shroud on the bench, so whoever encounters Giosko is going to get a bit of a shocking surprise. It will be Jinx IRL, Nookie, the brawler player, the double Riven, double Jax going up against our AP player of the lobby that's been doing so hot with this LeBlanc carry, the aim assist, the extra sigils, the extra damage coming off as well has the Janna online as well, the Twister CC helping a tiny bit, but clearly not enough. Riven and Jax are onto LeBlanc, they're onto Soraka. Massive fight win for Jinx IRL, who manages to secure second spot in this game too. And the French player, Dedizor, goes out in third. Yeah, well played, Dedizor. I, oh my goodness, these are two players who have had one heck of a story going through the game. We have had Giosko win streaking since the very beginning, and then we've had Nuki slash Jinx IRL having that real struggle in the beginning and coming back strong now on a seven win streak. Which of our two players are going to have the metal to pull out and take the win here? Positioning matters a lot here. You have to be careful with the, the mecha set bringing in the Wukong towards the middle. Jax might have a way to sneak in around the sides onto these AP carries in the back. And we'll see how the positioning ends up panning out in the end. And it might be the case here. We see Wukong going to get into that set mech. But no, both Jaxes target the set right away. And that, because of his defender, of course, taunting both of these Jaxes, it means that the Sona can deal her damage safely on the back. And I assume the Jaxes will be stuck on the set for a little while. Maybe enough time for the Zoe to do her work to spread those stacks all across the opponent's board. Gonna be a close one in the end here. Nunu trying to do his best, the Sona and Zoe as well. Can Sona do it by herself? It seems like it is gonna be the case. 
Jinx IRL taken down to 4 HP, and Giosko can even go 9 at this point, has enough gold to do it. Oh, Giosko. Ah, Giosko's gonna... Yeah, Giosko is very likely to pull out the victory here. I really thought that Jinx IRL may just have it there at the end. Um, this is this has been one heck of a game. It's, it's gonna be a ribbon, a ribbon 3 though, so another little small power spike for Jinx IRL. Similarly, maybe kind of comparable to going 9 for Giosko. Both players finding a way to strengthen their board, even a tiny bit for what could be the last fight of this game, too. Oh, these players, yeah, they're just, they're looking for anything they can get off of Urgot here. Not a Star Guardian Urgot, unfortunately, but looking for any strength they can get from here. Yosko having some trouble taking down the crab. The crab finally does end up going down. Shroud and Zephyr. So the full rat package is present presented to Giosko going to this last fight. He ends up picking up the Shroud. And that's going to be really, really scary for... Uh, well, actually, there's no Sejuani on the board for Nookie. Just noticed. So the cast coming in a bit later for some of these units. Not going to matter too much. The mana pools overall going to be somewhat small for most of these brawlers. Yeah, Nuki has decided to stick with two of the one-cost brawlers there, but it seems to have, I mean, it's worked out great for him so far. I think this could hiding, be a final fight. Hiding the Zephyr on the bench, going to sell that zone the last minute and see who he wants to bring up. It will be the Jax, looks like in the end, so the perfect hit there for Giosko. Sets going to tank for as much as he can, stacking up the Titan Resolve as this fight goes along. And quietly, the Zoe and the Sona will try and take down the massive health pools these brawlers have. Especially this Ribbon 3. It's an absolute menace with the Redemption. Healing off the Jax in the process as well. Sona almost taken down in the back, but stays alive to get a few more casts in. And that could be the deciding factor for this fight. The Spanish player, Giosco, looks like he will be dominating the lobby with the start he had. Nine win streak going into Wolves. Wins out in the end as well, showing that Gadgetine Crest Maisie is still very strong with the right setup. I'm so glad to see it. Like, we went into that game and I was saying, oh, you know, I really want to see the Gadgetine Crest. It said uh, that would be really nice. And do you know what? It delivered. You ask, you get, apparently. I was nervous yesterday because we had, I think it was game three on the on-stream match. Two players for Gadgetine Crest did not stick to the game plan of trying to build towards this mega set. Both went bought four and I thought, all right, this augment is done for. Players are not trying to go down this route. But Eosko shows us that, no, that is wrong. It's actually still a viable pick at 2-1, especially if you have a good start like he did. Um, overall, uh, I think a fun game. Still, we saw some players having struggles with hitting their reroll comps with Draven once again going, not just bot four, but uh, seventh place in this game, eighth place in the last one. Players have to be very careful what direction they choose a 2-1 because some of them are a little bit dicier than others, Maisie. Yeah, it seems to be quite turbulent. And actually, in both of our games that we've seen so far, that's been when people have cemented it. That's when we're seeing people go into their Anima Squad comps or into Gadgetine Crest in the case of... Um, oh my goodness, the game winner just there. Thank you. Um, he yeah, wins the game and you forget his name, Maisie. Come on, give, give the guy some respect. He I needs it. I'm After sorry. being a D-Gen reroll player the whole set, he needs it. Some respect at least. But I think our break is ready. We're going to go to an interview with Aaliyah, another player that deserves a lot of respect. Popped off in GSC number one and is here for day two as well. So we're going to hear from him and then from the analyst desk to break down this game too. Ilya. That's why, that's why I named myself Ilya TFT because I'm not that creative. I'm from Germany and my goal this year is just to get day free so I qualify for regionals. I really enjoy playing this set. It's so much better than the last set like the hero. Hero augment mechanic is really fun, especially now that they, they introduce four rerolls and you don't need to waste, yeah, you don't need to save your normal augment reroll so you don't get more dog that often and I didn't really like the dragons, so that's nice that they are gone. That's pretty hard to say, like, like a lot of good, really good players, like like the French ones, like Dub Double, German Legend, Salvi. I played with him in German League and he, he, he destroyed us really hard, so he's probably one of the only people I'm really scared of in Germany, but yeah, that, that's that's a hard question because there are so much good competitors and it's it's always 
decided by like who got the best opener, who got a good day, like who is com and who is comfortable on the patch. And because the patch is really fresh, it's really hard to say right now who is who's gonna be the the most difficult player to play against. I want to shout out the German community, especially especially Memo and his Discord, because they are the reason I even I made it this far. Without the support of Germ of the German community, I would wouldn't have been. Been, I wouldn't have gotten that far in TFT. I would probably have stopped at like reaching Challenger, resetting and quitting. Gen Z really taking over here in TFT is the Gadget Teens are the name of the game coming out of that one across multiple lobbies, Peter. Yeah, I mean, amazing shot. Yeah, amazing showing that from Giesco and Snooty Boo winning with the same setup. We know, you know, we've talked about during the cast as well, just how ridiculous the ball can be, particularly if you can bring in that set Gadget Team front line. Yeah, for sure, right. Again, the, the, the double up of the fact that Seth gets extra damage as well as that huge amount of damage reduction just means that he stays alive for so long and is just able to clean up fights. Yeah, and of course, in case anyone got lost, we'll reset and let you know where we are. It's the analyst desk. You may have figured that out because we're doing analysis. I'm Niberia, joined here by Counterfeit Gas and Wida as well. So we're going to break down that round number two and prepare for round three because I think the big thing I want to take away, extract from the game so far, is Gadgeting Crest performing much better this game. Still a composition people are willing to contest. And I think one of those compositions where we We've lost the vertical outside of having access to that crest. Additionally, uh, Wida, one of the things that you pulled out earlier on uh, was the admin, but you really wanted to focus in on that brawler double trouble composition as it shaped up for Jinx IRL. Yeah, uh, or trouble brawlers, as Peter called it in our in our analyst chat, but he can fix them. It's kind of good. I saw a lot of people in chat being like, okay, so so Nuki is in, a, in a, is in a super bad spot, and like, how did he come back from this? In reality, the spot wasn't that bad. Jax's reroll composition has always been about getting to level 8. You tend to not want to roll on 7 because you wanted to get um, some of the forecasts put into place, the Sejuani's of the world, etc. But going to level 8 when you're playing Double Trouble is actually the main name of the game because you need to have 6 Brawler in plus you can then fit in 2 Double Trouble units. The biggest issue for him was that he didn't find a 4th copy of Jax to put in for a while and Jax 2 is, is quite good but if you can get 2 Jax 2s it's a lot better. Yeah and I think that's the reason why we were having our doubts about the Trouble Brawlers being a viable option but they managed to hold on incredibly well. So yeah, we had the double trouble coming in across multiple units to help buff up the effective HP pool for any of the newer players coming in. Your, your, your maximum effective HP is dependent on how much you, you raw HP you have multiplied by how many resistances you have in an appropriate amount. So in this case, the double trouble helping giving magic resist and armor as well. You get more armor coming out of the uh, battle mage buff as well. So the effective HP pool was extremely large. I think if we hadn't seen Geos with such a cracked endgame board, I think the Brawlers could have taken the whole thing. 
And across the rest of the lobby, we saw exclusively AP lines because that Jax was really the only AD carry happening. We saw, of course, the Star Guardian double emblem coming out from Darkest. We saw Anima Squad as well, fully committed from Dalasum early in the game, even crafting a second emblem for himself. So lots of flexibility coming out in the meta, but that Jax line, the only thing contested this game, as we saw... In the last lobby, Samira really lowered in the estimation of these lobbies so far. It's just full on AP, right? Like this has been has just been what's been going on all throughout this this weekend so far. Like the the priority on AP now. That everyone knows the lines are strong and they know how to navigate them. It's just been kind of baffling to watch a little bit in my mind, right? Like. Like, it also comes down to which Aquans you were offered earlier on, and we saw the, 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 the Draven board in this lobby also kind of struggle a lot, right? Because we're going for the defender front line, and when the entire rest of the lobby isn't really playing AD, that's kind of, you're down an Aquaman already from 2-1, so it's kind of rough to play for. Yeah, I was very disappointed, honestly. That seemed like a real puzzling choice from Bud Up, who be, had been doing very, very well. It is worth noting though we were watching Lobby 2, so all of our players had done very well in the first round. So that was a tough setup, and we're gonna see things mixed up as more rounds come in. Yeah, and now at a bit. Can't talk today for some reason. Off the back of that lobby, there we go. Finally getting some English out today on the broadcast. We're going to see the standings here. Snooty Boo, uh, friend of the show, having a mm. great showing in the second game. A couple of UK representatives you'll be very excited about, Peter. We were talking in between where it's just like, well, let's leave the countries out of it unless there's something worth noting. I think those top 32 finishes definitely worth flagging. And we've also got our German players remaining incredibly strong as well. You know, this still seems like we're on course for this to absolutely be Germany's tournament to take center stage as a TFT country. But there are plenty of other flags in the mix as well. I think more specifically, something I want to pull out, you know, Wida, you have consistently been highlighting Kevin Parker, and we haven't necessarily seen consistency in his results, but today, already starting off incredibly strong, two first places in a row after finishing yesterday second in the standings. I think this could be his tournament. Yeah, for me as well, right, Kevin Parker has been consistent all throughout Rising Legends, but again, missing one tournament here, missing one tournament there, yeah. not making day three in one tournament is going to be a, a really rough factor. Like going all the way back to set six, he ended up not making finals on like a tiebreaker through ladder points because someone performed well in GSC 3, right? So very fine margins has really been what has been separating Kevin Parker from like finals where we would finally see him come out to really to do his thing yeah, yeah it's absolutely and, wild to be totally undefeated at this point yeah and of course a reminder to everyone in chat we do have a contest going on on twitter at tft esports e m e a we're doing a contest for who can predict the winner in the most interesting way doesn't necessarily need to be correct does need to be entertaining uh, the last winner was a truly horrifying pun so if you're looking for the biases of the selection committee i would definitely uh investigate that alley in the meantime while you guys mull that over we are going to have a quick break as we prepare for round number three and catch an interview with losher see you soon I'm Lesha, I'm 28, I'm coming from Germany, but I'm currently living in Norway and, well, playing TFT for fun. And since I like competing, I guess uh, I also got pretty good at it, playing for fun. So yeah, excited to be here. Mm, I really like the units in this set and traits, especially threats. I think uh, threats are very flexible and uh, I like that. Um, I'm a bit torn um, on the set mechanic because on the one side hero augments introduce uh, a lot of cool unique ways to play champions like they add new dimensions to specific comps but uh, i'm not really a fan of having such a strong indicator on uh, what to play when you pick it so um, i think it's an interesting mechanic that could certainly be uh, improved and maybe tweaked a bit to make it uh, well more flexible as well after picking it 
I think there are lots of players that have a good shot that can be considered the best. Um, I, I mean, obviously, Saru won the first one, uh, which was a strong showing of, from his side. But, um, well, obviously, I myself have a good shot as well, right? I think I had good performances uh, on ladder in the last weeks. My first GSC was decent as well, hitting the finals. Uh, and then we have other legacy players like Double, Basic or Salvi, who I always think can win a tournament. Um, I would like to thank everyone that's supporting me, like in my stream or on Discord or wherever we interact. Especially the other players in the German community, uh, in the German community are well, always very friendly, eager to help and also are always good for some trash talk. Um, so yeah, thanks for that and see you hopefully all on day three. Welcome back, one and all, to the Golden Spatula Cup number two. We are in day two, and we're almost at the halfway point. My name is Kanabit, here with Vita, and we are going to be bringing you an absolutely astonishing next lobby, as we may have one undefeated player in Kevin Parker, but everybody else is going to need to keep up the work to make sure they get through to day number three. Yeah, I think that's the big thing as well, right? That right now if you're all you can already kind of tell how your day has been going so far do you need to just keep on doing what you've been doing all day or are you gonna have to to go deep and figure out what you're actually going to need here to, to make it to day three because that's where people want to be they want to be in day three you have all the golden special circuit points to get your spot to final secured and also prize money and a chance of becoming golden special cup number two champion but we're heading to lobby number seven. So this is almost at the bottom of the table. So previously we've shown you lobbies where players need to say finish in the top, you know, half to be able to climb up the table. For the players we're about to see, that may not even be enough. We're really looking for our players who can finish out first and second to make a strong climb in the back half of the day. Yeah. And overall, Peter, like going into this now, do you think we're going to be seeing any Samiras? Because, uh, She's been kind of AWOL really today, you know? Like, I don't know if she's, like, singing Sail while she's riding or something like that, but she is a part of the AWOL nation right now. Like, she's just, she's, she's nowhere to be seen. I know you were very upset when she got left on the carousel before with a sword, but maybe this is just the day we're seeing here. Our players, they're choosing their lines from the start of the game, and if that up doesn't happen to be sure shot, then they're like, sure shots, that's for nerds. And speaking of our players, though, we have got our way into the next game, including our players who has taken the number one spot on the EU West ladder, Dasic, the strongest ladder player right now here in Lobby 7. Yeah, we're a little bit down the road here. Uh, Narkas, when we talk about Vent Hacker, is one of the players that has the most games played in TFT in the world. You heard that this right. So I know that Chad has been watching for Soju and wanted to see Soju. He can't compete, obviously. He's not EMEA region based, this is right? The but, next best thing. but this guy has played more games of level than K3 Soju has. So I'm just gonna point you it out. You can always say this is, you know, this is the Soju that we have at home. I mean I, I hope hopefully not, because that would be making him that would 
bring down Van Hager, right? Like, I think that he is a pretty strong player overall. And when you play as many games as he does, there's going to be a lot of fluctuation in your rank and in your LP in general. But also, you get a huge base of recognizable spots because you can always go back and figure out, like, what did I do here before? Did it go right? Did it go wrong? And someone that also has a huge base to kind of compare with is Daisic, who has spent the entire set so far splitting time between EU West as well as the Chinese server. Yeah, and I think you know, this kind of brings it into focus some of the, you know, the route we need to take. Because I was about to ask you with the, you know, Van Herker, but we, it applies just as much to Dasik as well. You know, for all of our players watching who want to be like these players, you know, competing at this kind of level, trying to fight, perhaps eventually to get to the global championship, much as we've seen Dasik there before, you know, what, how should you split your time if you want to be a professional player? Should it be masses of games, or should it be, you know, how much time should you be putting into research and looking to other regions? That is that is such a, a, a loaded question because it, everyone's process is different, Peter, right? We all go for life on, on different paths. No, there's no right way to get there, right? Because I've had, um, back in my day, I used to, to play card games at a pretty high level. And one year, I did nothing but play the game 24-7 and I failed miserably in the qualifiers. The next year, I had a lot more of a laid-back approach, and I made and I made it right. So it, it's really hard to say because everyone thinks differently about how their time is spe spent the best way possible here. So Peter, good selection here. Freeze, freeze the company. Mm -hmm. We saw it earlier on. Lean directly into a Kaiser line. But what would you take here? Oh, well, I think Three's company makes a lot of sense. It worked incredibly well for because it's actually said it gives you that direction straight away. The Daisic doesn't actually necessarily need it. Underground in from straight away, so I wouldn't even have to try and hit a lucky Sona from here. We'll see, I think it might be just be spinning this lot off to make sure for maximum econ. Yeah, we're gonna go 20 gold here, I'm pretty sure. Um having this talent too in the bank is also a different Something like you could do here uh, as well if you want to, but he's just gonna go level four instead and try to see if that's gonna be enough for him to not lose into the HP. Because I think that if he goes for 20, H 20 gold here, I think he might be sacrificing too much power. And he has an interesting position here as well, looking at the bench, Peter. That's a Yumi, at least in a, in a GP pair with a tier as mm. well as a rod opener here. So potential Kaiser game from Daisic. But Kaiser Yumi did yeah. game, obviously, as we do see Dan starts with the Kaiser game, obviously. Yes, very well. There we go. We've got the immediate Triforce coming for Dan Star, so really much, you know, laying claim to that location. I do think Daisy could have potentially headed down the recon path of Three's Company and sent him that way. We check in with Narkeds and Vaga from two German players. Of course, got a fair few German players, three different German players, in fact, in this lobby, all trying to fight again for anyone who's coming in late. Our players here are very low in the standings right now. Lobby seven. There's only one lobby below this today. They need to finish strong, and we need to see some amazing boards. Yeah, this is a pretty, pretty name-heavy lobby, right? Like, you're looking at Lyra's former championship contender, Daisic, former championship contender, Matzla de Volta, one of the more recognizable names across the Hex League, across Rising Legends as a general circuit overall. And then you have, you know, some other players that have coming in around here that people will recognize if they've been in around the high end of the ladder for, for quite a while. So... Very interesting lobby that kind of showcases the variety that we have on display in Rising Legends. We have got more kids who's going to be bringing out one of those comps we did see, you know, showing that variety. We've immediately got the Jacks in the mix, but won't be able to stand up against Lyris, who is looking pretty darn good. The Draven set up initially, but not so many the items we'd expect to see heading down this path longer term. No, it's on Salvage Pin, Peter. Which means that he has all of the options in the world. It's an, it's a fully open canvas for him. So just playing what he can, just slamming items to maintain as much HP as possible, and then you can start working your way towards best in slot items further down the road. So look, I mean, since it's, we've got a little bit of time to work with right now, we see Lyris popping through to say hello there. Can you talk to me a little bit about you know what the possibilities are with Salvage Bin? You know. What's the kind of the way which you would go through the game when you know that you can break up your items and reconstitute them at will? I think that the static ship slam onto the Draven is a pretty good example of that exactly, right? Not an item you normally prefer to have onto Draven, but its attack speed is a bit more mana, it just helps him out and helps him deal with the early game board to a certain extent, right? And then, when you know which unit you're going to start prioritizing, that might become a last whisper plus a redemption or something along those lines in the future. I suppose what you are giving up is the direct immediate power, and Dan Styles has that in spades. So the Kaiser in place, the Triforce active right now, 
powering up the vein as well. Dan feels like they're in a really good position to keep this win streak going. Yeah, and, and I think that Nigel's spot here, for example, I think is, a, is also pretty straightforward and really interesting. Right, you're looking at a Riven pair and a Jax pair, but still has to work his way into the items, and with his ever-growing priority on these carousels, he is going to be at least with a pretty decent shot of getting what he wants here. Dasik picking up the Sona here, I believe, for Fall Underground. I think that is why he picked this up, not necessarily for the Cloak, but again, if he is going to be going for the Yumicon that we've seen him already start angling towards, that Ionic Spark is going to be a massive benefactor for him. So where we are in the game right now, we're talking about the idea of bringing in Fall Underground. It, we know that you're rewarded roughly the same level if you go to Underground you know, for cash like they were before, but it's much different now. Uh, the actually hold that thought because we've got something more immediately coming up. Built different is a, something we haven't been seeing at all, and we're seeing it buffed in this patch. Metellus is going to try it out for this game. Yeah, and I think that Metellus, if I recall correctly, he did have a build different game in the Hex League finals. I might be thinking of someone else, but there was a build different game in the Hex League finals for sure. And it, it's kind of difficult for me to say what the best way of going around playing this because. A lot of the really powerful traits to set are uh, two ticks, right? So you think about Recon, you think about Duelist, you think about all of these things that have very strong units that you might want to play that would benefit from having the attack speed bonus spe specifically from build different. Just really ha having a hard time figuring out the strong surrounding units around them. Yeah, and it's for, you know, we, well, we know Built Different does scale up a little bit during the game. Matella definitely taking some pretty heavy hits here, along with Dasic, both of them down the bottom of the table, which has allowed for Dan Stars and Norby to keep on winning all the way through Stage 2. A chance that both of them will carry that on into Krugs and really reap the rewards. So something that has been done as well has been people uh, playing multiple Ace units because they don't have a trade active, technically, because it's 2 out of 1, so it's not active. And that is something that I am not sure it's going to be good or bad. I have I don't have enough reference frame really to to do a deep dive and say what's the best way of doing it because it has been a lot more straightforward in previous sets where you go for build different. And it's not working out so far, at least as we do check in with a trade sector player who's hiding themselves away top of the screen. Ah, oh, there we go. It's Metellus, of course. Uh, no, no, it's not Metellus, that's two Metellus. We're, oh we're, we're seeing double, Peter. It's a, you know, it's because you, oh, need it's two double double. Of, you need two picks of Metella for the two copies of Malphite on his board. That's why. Oh. And you well, see, like, it's, a, also, it's, it's, it's the same color scheme, yellow and red, kind of, you know, it, hmm. it, it, it just fits. So all the clues were there the whole time. But for Metella, the lost streak is staying in place, while for Norby, up at the top, we actually are seeing Hustler coming through, which you know which you've got a great affection for, and also Sure Shot. This feels like a board made specifically for you, Ito. I mean, this is just the way you play this composition, right? Look at all the pairs he's holding on the bench. There's no economic punishment for him holding these units. He can roll aggressively he wants to. He can also start just pushing every single bit of gold that he's going to get into going level 7 instead. There are so many ways for him to play this augment out. And with that early Samira as well, pushing levels might be a priority if he has just a relatively stable front line in front of the Samira. We saw that yesterday with Narcus in a game where he had like a four mascot front line that just took him all the way through stage three and stage two because he found that early Samira. And this is kind of the same concept. Yeah, we can see. Absolutely very strong indeed. Dan Stars, the champion of the rest of Emir. TRC taking the loss means that Nobby will be the only person that wins streaking. Ironic, indeed, that we've, yeah, we've got all of the uh, money in the bank now for Nobby, who doesn't get any interest goal. Yeah, but Nark is also going double six here, and he's in the pool of Nobby. This could be interesting to follow. He's obviously not going to hit him because we're going to see Van Tager here, who is... Farming Underground right now has a two-star Nila, though. That's a pretty solid unit to build around coming forward. Yeah, even post nerf still seems to be pretty darn popular. It's holding up the front line pretty well with a Dragon's Claw, but I think it won't be quite enough. It's going to be tight, but it won't be quite enough to break through. The Riven doing a good job of item holding for the time being to keep the short shot win streak going. Wait a second oh, no. here. Norby might end up Boy. losing this. Oh, that, this is actually really bad. It's kind of bad for both players. I want to shoot. Oh, that's a rough one. 
Norby could have rolled, oh, could have missed the gold, but wants to go for that early level 7 instead here. It's going to be a gold into gold, so a relatively normal level in terms of, you know, just the pacing of the lobby right now. Oh boy, yeah, we well, does take the pressure off. Yeah, Norby really is suffering there. A Hungarian player now has a choice of these next gold augments. Both gold so far. There are a bunch of upgrades coming in from the bottom of the table and levels coming in as well. Of course, 3-2 is a traditional power-up point. So Norby's gonna, maybe going to be taking some more losses in the future. This is a very interesting proposition as well because these augments are not necessarily fantastic for Norby. And there's a chance of this being a triple goal, but he's just going to take it. He's just going to give up now already and say, you know what, Jewel Lotus here is going to be great. Okay, he's going to be going for an Ace Crest instead. Okay. Wow. On, on this, the four, on the this four seems eight. counterintuitive. It's not counterintuitive. He's already now committing to saying, you know what, I'm going to go for a four Ace board. But it could be counterintuitive because that's one of the most expensive boards to put together in the game, Peter, right? Just overall. Just, and he's not going to be able to go that. for that. I was going to say, the, yeah, right now, we, we've got the ace in play already, so we can't even use the ace end of the time being. Because, of course, we've got Draven on the back line. We're going to need the misfortune as well to bring the ace four online. Working well enough for the time being, I suppose. Nobby will keep go back to his winning ways as Lyris will take the spot at the top with the winning streaks. You can see that this really interesting salvage bin board we were talking about before has also picked up a component grab bag. I mean, we've got a lot of components to play with and make the most of the salvage bin. Yeah, and that's what we've been talking about right here. Right? He's, just, he's just slabbing, making two stars, not really caring about what's going to happen for him overall throughout the stage so far, just making what's the best items for him in this very moment. Curious House is an, as a, kind of a slept on item, I would say, in general, so might not be something that he's going to dip in the later stage of the game when he's going to be remaking this Draven. Obviously, it's not going to be the main item holder for him going forward. Did you get a chance to check in with Van Herker? and see that we've got a threat level maximum ball coming to play. It isn't online as of yet, so Lyris will be able to keep that win streak going with a kind of a grab bag of a board fronted by some pretty darn strong brawlers. Yeah, and looking at his board as well, you're talking about the brawlers here. Um, that threat level maximum will also be a very good thing for him going forward as well. He's going to be looking to play for a Belvef angle, most likely staying within the AD tree. Depending on his cash out, obviously coming through from his heist now, he did go to 10 out of 10 exactly. I'd assume he's about to get out of it now because I think that if he starts going deeper than this with the way the lobby is splitting up here, it could spell trouble for him. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly plenty of trouble brewing. Day sick and tell us. Both down on around 40 HP. We've, of course, we saw Daisy going for the lost streak before with the underground. It does feel like we've got a lot of that going on in this lobby and a lot more risky play coming in from our players. I'm more of a Bad Moon Rising type of player, uh, Peter. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> you very, picked up that one. I don't think anyone else will. Very, very niche, very niche shout out right there. But now Daisy going for a hard Zoe roll down. Gotta hit these, uh, gotta hit these free cost two. Start here, hitting a Zoe two should put him in a stable enough position for now. Getting closer and closer to a Zona three actually as well. So that's an interesting preposition to work from. All right, that's pretty fascinating. So we know the situation with Daisy and Teller in particular with a built different board. They're fighting back from the bottom. They need to be able to basically beat everybody. And now we see on the other side that Zoe is apparently going to be contested if Daisy wants to hit the three star. Yeah, the, the, the thing here to note with um, hard so is you don't need the free star because the way this works is that the comp just has so many threats spread out all across because you end up going into the six hard potentially further down the road, but then you'll have the Syndra pulling in strong units from the bench to then act as the primary front line, and that's just going to give your units so much time to ramp up the damage. No, I take your point. Absolutely, the heart is spreading the AP across the road, so that's at least a relief for Daisic. As Vitellus drops down to 30. I can't help notice though, at the top, there is who have been puzzled as to the direction that he's going. He has managed to just land a Jax 2 to go with that pick and mix support, which is still somehow remaining the only streaking comp in the lobby. 
Yeah, this is actually pretty rough for Daysec here as well now. He's rolling into pretty much anything but the set, the last copy of Zoe here. And the Zoe 2 is going to be such a big stabilization point for him now because his board is essentially a 4-1 board. He's not going to feel like rolling on 4-1 anyways. So this might be also the worst matchup for him in his current position. This board from Lyris, which you were talking about, Peter, right, just a second Ooh. ago, it's the only streaking board in the lobby and it has so much power put into it. And it doesn't look like Daisy is at the point. As exactly as you said, the Zoe 2 is missing. I don't know if this board can stand up against Wait, the Draven. Seconds. The frontline brawlers are being chewed through, oh, though. Oh, never mind. And that's the end of the streak. What a surprise. And that's, that's actually a thing that I probably should have touched on as well. Hard boards, they get deceptively strong. And also, Lyris has been holding on to his goal, so didn't want to go for the early level 7 because he has not had to do that so far to match anyone else in the lobby. Meanwhile, Matella de Volta. Finding that Miss Fortune hmm. 2. And he's got a right. build different. So this is the thing I was talking about, right? With hmm. the with the pairing of the two Ace here, he's not gonna be able to get ensure this misfortune will benefit from the build different as well as the jeweled loads as Peter. Yeah, that's pretty wild. We haven't got the item slam, but we've got some good drops coming in. So it can really help amp up the raw power. Tellus only has a little bit of room to maneuver though. Lowest HP in the lobby, but highest, well, almost highest gold. Actually just notice the top of the lobby is also rolling in cash. Yeah, a lot of really big spikes gonna come through right here. The 4-1 power spike is gonna be massive here. Putting in, you having to navigate this board, right? Because you look at all these things that he's gonna have to navigate right now. It, it's gonna be it's gonna be trouble here. Both Star Guardian as well as Ace are active in this very moment. And this is gonna spell trouble for Matella in just a mm -hmm. second. Because he's down on Aukman essentially right now. He's oh, wow, yeah. Doesn't bring in the extra ace to allow Misfortune to get an extra attack speed. You can see up against the other ace board, which of course is going to make it rather troubling to work with the build different board from uh, Norby. We've got the incredibly strong frontline set with a double redemption. A huge amount of regen that's very hard to punch through. And there is a discussion to be had whether or not you think that the base stats from build different are worth more or less than the ace execute. And that's a very fair discussion to be had as, uh, going forward, but I think this might have just been an oversight because he had so many different things to uh, to look out for. So I think that his approach from this very moment on now, right now is going to be the big thing. He also could just be um, putting his board together for the hero augments coming through. Okay. Ooh. All right. That's an interesting one for sure, but Void Mother obviously, Belveth doesn't generate, uh, doesn't get anything from Build Different because she's a threat. So you need mm. to figure out which other units you want to put onto the board here. Oh, Bunny Mercenary, that's a big one, never mind. Make it rain seems ambitious, but I suppose if you're going to get anywhere, no, still going to throw that away as well. And we go all the way down to the end where we've got two threats and only one which could possibly benefit from Build Different. Might have been, might have been fishing for Daredevil there. Um, because he's very low HP and just mm. uh, it could be could be an option. Looking at the items on the bench here as well, they do lean very well into an AD type of, uh, type of build. You can see there there comes the Samira into play. So that have most likely been the situation. We've got a ton of items to slam right now, Matellas on a incredibly huge loss streak. We'll finally put everything in. So we've got the Thieves Gloves coming in. On the Adam Squad Misfortune, we've got Samira being allowed the primary items despite only being one star. We'll see if this board is good enough against the big old brawlers. So interesting position thing here now, because you're, you're talking about brawlers, Peter, right? We saw Narkis very early on with the early Jackson Ribbon pairs, and now Lyris has kind of found his way into that same position and composition as well. So whether, whether or not Narkis and Lyris are going to be in a two-way contest here, that's a big question. Yeah, and of course, the contest is going to slow everyone down, as we've been seeing from the various different players crisscrossing their paths. We'd like to note, though, as we come into the close to the mid part of stage four, Dasic on the win streak. We really need to check them out in a minute, but Telus is still very close to elimination, so we'll, we'll keep an eye on them on the side as well. Yeah, you're talking about Dasic on the win streak. He found this Zoe 2 that's ever so important just to ensure this board. Can stabilize and just do enough damage. Also has these Soraka augments ensuring mm. that continuous flow of mana to this composition is massive. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be amazing for our hearts again. Zoe can use the prankster by staying up at the front. We've got a huge amount of ramping power. Zoe at least is fully itemized. But as you said, you know, with a Zoe 2, 
ideally not the primary carry, and Soraka right now doesn't have any items at all. Now we do see that Norby has found his way into this 4 A board, but I don't think it's going to be enough right here at least to beat Day6 board. That is an, an absolute menace right now. His primary goal is going to be to go to level 8 and then slow roll for Zoe or Sona or whatever he needs to find there. Instead right now, you don't want to roll on level 7. Telus going it down to 7 HP, Waga dropping as well. Our current bottom two players are in major trouble, especially when you know, players like Daysig, who they need to get past to get even into the top six, are playing so strong. Yeah, we did just get a quick glimpse here of Narcus's board, and he is going to be on the contest here uh, together with Lyris. Uh, he has eight brawler with the brawler emblem and also has a Soraka augment as well, so he's very much locked into position right now. So it does seem like we're going to be seeing more Brawler during the course of the day. Of course, we saw it come second in our previous game. I mean, you know, we haven't necessarily... I know we talked a little bit about it on the desk, but in in this particular lobby we're seeing here, what do you think about Brawler overall? You know, is it the choice to be pursuing more frequently? I think it's a good comp, and we also we heard uh, Marx talk about this type of show, right, in our, in our interview with him where Brawler is just a super stable composition most of the time. I don't think that Narcus is going to go end up going 8th in this lobby, because still stabilized to a top 4 even. Jax 2 on his own is a pretty strong comp. The big issue for Narcus here is the lack of range extension. There was no mm. rot, so he couldn't go for the RFC. There was no scope weapons, none of that. So he has to carry augment for Soraka here on top of everything as well. So he can start building that secondary carry out, which is going to be super important. And I certainly do like to have that extra option, and on the guard breaker there as well. So absolutely, you know, if the round goes along, the Soraka will be pumping out AP across the team with the heart, and also pumping out the damage. Up against Atelas, who is one round from a dead, asking quite a lot to get these brawlers down low enough and get the kills in. We have got a fully stacked up Samira, though, who is pumping a ton of damage through. I think it might just be enough. Yeah, but again, remember, Soraka is in Berserk mode right now, so it's going to get all of her all, all of her casts are going to be powered up. But again, if it had been a Soraka 2, this fight would not even have been close. It would have been over in a, over in a blink the second she ascended into that form. So, but tell the Volta, get it. Fighting Nark is at a very fortunate time for himself here. I do think, you know, for Metellus, though, you know, fight out of the corner with the one win in. I mean, it feels like this is such a narrow place for him to be able to come back as Narquez does hit the three-star ribbon. We don't have the three-star jacks on yet, but it feels like this brawler board has still got space to grow into an even stronger version of what it is right now. Absolutely. And the issue for Metal of Vault you're talking about in, in this narrow spot is that there is the player in the lobby, Nopi, that's on the four ace line and has all these mirrors as well. So he's he's trying to fight for a contested board in as in as an optimal way. We check in with Lyris, we can see that his board has gotten pretty spicy as well. We've got Ophelios, so Sure Shots returning it to the stream for this particular one, including a fascinating choice of an Archangel's Urgot as well. When he eventually does cast, that does mean a lot of extra stuff coming in. Yeah, we kind of see here, he's talking about that's going to be a big one here. He's kind of got into a more elevated position of this comp. And then we saw the power oh, off yeah. the rock in these late stage situations. And Narcus is one copy away from Soraka 2, is in that blue op on his board, but there are a lot of people in the lobby also chasing for Soraka, so it's a lot of overlap between different comps in this lobby in general. And we have to announce our first elimination, the Telus from Switzerland out in 8. They built different board, unfortunately just didn't come to fruition. I think as you said, it just wasn't quite the right environment for it, having to fight for some of the key units. Yeah, now we look at who is kind of primed for a comeback here. Vecca and Dan Styles both have a lot of gold to work with, will probably pursue that level 8 before rolling. 5-1, 5-2 is the only way you'll see people go for that level 8. But Dan Styles, he's, been, he's playing this uh, Kaiser actually, I kind of forgot, we haven't been really touching this overall throughout the day, mm. so... Uh, throughout this game, so now he's going to see a, a massive roll down instead, he's just been building up here. Has a lot of things here, Spence going to be super busy as he's chasing every single... Um, Freestyle here pretty much outside of the S roll. So a lot of decisions to be made in terms of what you want to prioritize. With that carry augment for Belveth, that's gonna be a big prior for him. 
Oh, for sure. I do like as well that Dan Sars is holding off on the items until he knows exactly what he's going to end up with. So the Kaiser ends up getting a lion's share of the items. Belveth stays at one star, while a recon at one star, which means that she will be keeping her distance very, very well and doing a ton of damage. This board from Lyra said it has such a high cap. It's actually wild how, how high this cap is going to be, especially with the consistent scaling coming through from the Urgot. Again, he has to ensure he doesn't randomly die and take 25 damage out of nowhere, but on paper going forward, this board has an insane cap. I do believe, let's see. Yes, so we've got the, we have got a Soraka 2 in there actually up against some of Brawlers taking the L. So perhaps one of the reasons why Narquez hasn't been able to hit the Soraka 2 is that we've got a few of them in the rounds right now. But we have also got some decent upgrades coming for Narquez, even if he can't find Soraka 2. Yeah, getting that blue buff from the Aurelion Doom here is a massive one as well, because it really helps you yeah. elevate the damage that you're able to do. And the funny thing here about uh, Soraka and the interaction with Brawlers is that a lot, a lot of the time you'll see Soraka with a Gunblade. But because you have the Brawler Emblem, her healing just naturally through that way is just going to be so big that you don't need a Gunblade. Yeah, so certainly remember Soraka before she got nerfed on a percentage health healing, being incredibly strong. We check with Vega, who has got the four hacker board set up. You can see the LeBlanc in the corner and the two star Soraka, which we saw before, doing a ton of damage across the squad. Up against the. Uh, what was, no, sorry, not the recon board from Forgot, baited by the Belveth, but this is a three, a three item Belveth from Von Herker. Yeah, and we saw this earlier on in the stage. I was remember, I brought this into live, we saw he picked the. Fed level maximum on free two. This one keep want to be a clear priority for him. And he's been able to do it quite well so far. It's not going to be mm. enough to beat Vega's board, though. These type of boards are really hard to deal with for Belvaf because there's so much HP to go to get through and so much healing with the four hacker as well. Yeah, that's absolutely wild. And we're left in a situation now where multiple of our players are really worrying about their matchups coming up. You know, Vega is, of course, on just one HP with Dan Stars, Van Herker, all very close to getting knocked out in seventh, with only Norby really sitting above the pack with a decent amount of HP to rely on. Yeah, really making great use of that early Hustler. And, and Lyra's here has now gone level 9, 5 to fast 9. Still yet to upgrade a couple of key units to really start pumping out the damage, but the ground, the foundation has been laid. It is a strong foundation indeed. Now we've got the two-star Argo with the Archangels to be able to knock out a whole bunch of extra rewards to keep this one going. Very, very strong board. Vega is a little unfortunate to run against it at this point. Though the Soraka is still very, very strong and will be building up in power, I think it may not be quite enough. We've still got a lot left, but no, I'll eat my words, and Soraka will eat everybody else. Yeah, and this is the power level of the of the of the Berserk mode, right? Again, you also pair it up with that extra additional carry in LeBlanc that really benefits from the units being brought down and being chipped out by the Soraka, right? So LeBlanc getting closer to double resets. That's the Soraka too, potentially on on the line here for Naka, depending on how the priority pans out for the rest of the lobby. Oh boy. Yeah, if we're getting very close in the line here, the player damage is, of course, ramping up as we go from stage to stage. There is picking up the Duelist Emblem, in, in, leaving a fair amount of decent options left here for Daisy Kenobi. Oxfors Emblem going all the way through here without being picked up. This kind of surprises me a little bit with the high priority has been on Belvaf's here, but I guess you really want to have the BT instead if you are Dan Styles. The additional healing from Backs of Lot as well as the BT shield really does give so much longevity in the fights for this Belvaf. Yeah, giving, you know, giving a huge amount of survivability to Belvaf and I think putting the main damage stakes on the Kaiser, who is only two star, need a couple more to push her up all the way to three. But Dan Stars is out of money. At least the Cho'Gath 3 frontline should be very strong. But I wonder if there's enough damage to punch through the other Belveth board. Yeah, bring up the 2 out 2 here because there are so many big things going on right now. So many people are low in the lobby here. A single unit surviving could be the big difference the difference maker in terms of placement. And on the right side, one of these two players is out. Vega, buying on the left. 
with all of the Sorakas and Hearts, and Soraka still surviving to the end to take on Belveth 1v1. Our Belveth fight on the right-hand side of the screen leaves the two of them dancing with each other, but only one gets to survive the threats. The real deal, Belveth, gets the win. Dan Stahl's got and sixth. You can see it on his face. Not happy with how that one played out. Not impressed, right? And that's kind of the power here in the in the combination for Vantagger Sport, right? The additional CC coming through from the Velkos, as well as the Edge of Night on his Belveth, meant that the Belveth could not get through for Dan Styles. And again, Vega dying here means that Narkis gets easier access to that Soraka too that he just hit there. Yes, it's a breath on the brink. Our top five left in place again in this lobby coming up on the midway point of the day. These are the players in this lobby who need to climb the table over the back half of the day. A top two finish is really required. Dacic currently on the win streak. Van Herker trying to hold on for at least the top four. There's so much HP on this board, by the way. Full stack threat level maximum against eight brawlers, Peter. I think this is mm. actually... There's so much HP here. I could only... Yeah, I was looking around to see how many different ways we got of hitting the max HP. We've got the Sunfire Cape in for the brawlers, but it's, it looks like it's going to be mostly left to Soraka to go to the end of the round and pump out the unlimited damage. Jack said, this is just like way too hot. There's too much HP to chew through for Van Herger. Like, Belveth really benefits from chewing down relatively squishy targets. And that means we have a top four in place here. Leris here, who has just been trying to assemble anything to really combat the rest of the lobby. Wait. He has finally found a two star Samira. Has the potential for two star Flayos as well. I think. I'm sorry, I don't think I've ever seen a player doing this before, but we have got a bucket of crabs comp from Lyris. Three different Urgots being played, and I believe this is the, the carry Urgot being coming in here. So, gonna be, I believe that's one, the, is that the spreading out the attack speed or the extra drop chance one? I'm trying to remember. So the thing here is worth noting about this is this is only for this fight specifically. This, you can actually farm potential chests from the blobs that come from Sack, not from Sack himself. So since they're kind of trying to get a little minor bonus, I assume he's going to be putting the uh, Sejuani or the Aphelios back on the board here now and going back to just a double Urgot. No, you're right. I was I was hoping we would get to see a composition that was composed entirely of Urgots, but what we will see from Laris is a composition composed entirely of buckets of cash. There may be no money in the bank for across all four of our many players, but this board is laden with power and potential. The only upgrade here left for Lyris is a second Urgot 2. Everything has been hit right now, so if he has to make this board stronger, it requires a pretty significant rebal rebalance of the board. You can see here Norby, who's got a lot of HP in the bank, the Ace Setter from before, and the Hustler bringing into a really strong point. But yeah, the Urgot Gold is flowing in. Lyris may be just down on 5 HP, but I think he might actually be unstoppable. And that's kind of what, that was, that was, this was what he was playing for. And this is what we also saw a lot of inset for when France was really strong. Going deep into the lobby in general, uh, into HP, sorry, and then just coming back with these massive boards. Very often uh, pivoted by something like a fortune cash out, but here we just kind of see that playstyle and how it's kind of ever present. As we check in with number one rank EUS, Dasic. Much like Nobby has a lot of HP in the bank, but also has a huge win streak. As you see Laris hitting another Urgot 2, I still don't know, even with Nobby hitting the Morkaiser 2, if Dasic or Nobby have got enough to take this board down. This lobby in general is just so stacked here. We're going into a direct elimination fight between Narcus and Lyris here. This is going to be the final test for Narcus's board. If you can take down this, you can take down anything. It's a mountain to try and bring down the waves crashing against the rocks of the Brawler Come, but we can see Riven gets torn to pieces. There's so much crowd control from the Sejuani to buy a little bit more time. Keep your eye on that Jax as he chews through this pile of two-star crabs. The Sejuani is going to be very hard to put down, but Jax ignores the Sejuani. Aphelios is too good though, Soraka stays up at the end of the fight. She will be going berserk, but it's not enough! All right, this is, a, this is a game and a half, I'd say that much. The, uh, there are a lot of things going on here. Um, 
I think it's all about positioning right now. Uh, you don't even want to put something like a Nunu on the board instead of the Alistar, because you need the Oxforce for the Aphelios. So you would need an extra spat coming through on the carousel to have any chance of, of upping the unit quality on this board by itself right now. This is a... If you could Google perfect endgame board in TFT, bar some freestyle five cards, this is about as far as you're going to get. Yeah, it's just so ridiculous. Oh, we go up against Nobby, and of course, Day6 is going to be loving this, because Day6 is still on the win streak, and it's got the HP buffer that even if Day6 can't beat Lyrus, this, you'll still be able to take second place comfortably. Look at all this gold that's just gonna get that's just getting farmed through to the Ark, but this is like this is wild. There's just so much stuff going on. Like you can't oh, wait a second. Just, random four chests just dropping in there, but that is gonna be Lyra's going out here. Okay, so the outer board, the far ace board was just stronger at the end of the day here, so now Daisy and Nobby in a heads up 1v1 here. Can this hard board take down the four ace? Oh, wow. And Dasik lost in the previous round, so it might have even been the Tanobi. These final items will be very important. Dasik does pick up the Shroud as Norby goes up to two-star Ophelios. They're both laying in for one last ginormous fight. Urgot 2 for Norby here is an option. A lot of them obviously being put back into the pool by the death of Lyris, so... Dasik... At the start of the fight here, just gonna preempt where these shrouds are gonna go, but there are, there are two of them, so it's gonna be a lot harder. There's three of them even with that get oh, wow. shroud. It's impossible for Nobby to dodge this. And especially with the Argov, it's gonna be so hard to even get those casts off. Keep our close eyes on the carry, so we've got the three star Sona in the far corner, but it's those sure shots, those ace, you know, even an ace of Felios, getting a little bit of aggro in the early going. Waiting for that Soraka to come up fully online. Both these balls off the chart, but Dasik just looks a little bit stronger. In comes the big hammer, and Norby gets annihilated. Dasik allowing himself a little smile. Yeah, and this is, a, this is the first step for Dasik to getting back into day three contention against six points. That's what you got if you just finished third place in a game in game one. This was his total after two games, so a mountain to climb to get to that magical 28-27 breakpoint, but what a way to at least put yourself back into contention. And of course, last season, Dasik did promise us that he would be getting it to Worlds. It's a strange situation for him now to be kind of to fight to stay in this tournament at all, but an incredibly strong performance that does open up that possibility, exactly as you said. We will be headed to break. We've reached the halfway point of the competition. We will be having an interview with Witch during that break. So stay tuned. Our analyst test will be back. And then we will be getting into our final three games of day number two. Okay, so yo, uh, my name is Witch TFT. I'm from Sweden. I'm 26. I mean, to be honest, I started playing this set, uh, so I haven't really seen a lot of other sets. I played a bit in the end of set 7, where I remember I played Lagoon, and I used to play double up with my friends, but that's about it. But so far, I can tell this. Uh, I love this set. Yeah, it's pretty good. I think it's very. feels very balanced. It's like. I have a lot to learn in TFT. Like I said, I'm still new. I have I need to learn like the bit more of the basics, like economy and all that. Shit. And also, I feel like TFT. I feel like it's very like it's based on your knowledge of the patch. Like last patch, I felt unstoppable. I felt like I was the best player, like on the server. But in this patch, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I'm down 700 LP since the patch came out, and it's been like a week. So I have a lot to like practice and take in before the golden spatula starts and it would be kind of cool to win it the first time you play like in the first set you play but i know the competition is like the competition is really good so i don't really have any expectations going into golden spatula all i know is that i'm gonna play for first wave that's all i know i mean my goal is probably to improve try to like compete as much as possible and then go like all in in set nine when I have all the basic knowledge and like feel like I understand the game better than when we like climb for real and compete for real. 
big shout out to all my like Twitch viewers who still support me to this day and have been doing that since I started streaming. I just got another shot of espresso, which means much like that lobby, I'm supercharged and a little bit weird. I feel like we've been seeing a lot of meta changes come out of that lobby. Of course, we saw Dasic top the lobby with Heart Zoe, which we haven't really seen this weekend. And there were a couple other oddities about the lobby and changes that you wanted to talk about, Maisie. Yeah, something I was really interested in was Lyris's way of play. So we saw Lyris win streak all the way through season uh, the stage two, and then push for level nine, uh, really, really early on in the game. And from there, we just saw him pull out Ergot after Ergot after Ergot. And even at one point, we saw the three Ergots, as beautifully explained by Wita on broadcast, just to like try and farm all the Zack blobs. Um, really utilizing some extra meta stuff by bringing back the Samira and the Felios, which have kind of been absent today. But uh, I think, David, you want to definitely speak more out on that. Yeah, no, Samira is game one and two, but we saw it finally on game three. I think it, it makes sense very strong for both Lyris and for the ace player Norby as well, who I have a very interesting point to make because he picked up Ace Crest at 3-2. If you look at the stats, Masters Plus, uh, can any of you tell me what the absolute worst augment is at 3-2? I feel like I feel like you're setting us up for success here. Can I guess that it's the Ace Crest? That's correct. 5.5. Let's go. Placement, Masters Plus, GM Plus. So really, if you are just completely focused on stats, this is where stats don't tell the full picture. The first augment pickup was Hustler, which allows you to go seven months earlier and find more of these aces to have for Ace Online. 3-2 or close to it. Otherwise, you'd have a dead augment still stage four. In this case, for this game, for Norby, not so much the case. Managed, uh, you know, an absolute crazy game here, finishing very high up in the standings, despite picking such a, a terrible augment on paper. So it goes to show TFT, I think it's quite interesting how an, an augment that's really, really bad ended up performing so well for Norby in this game. Second point to make here is the cannibalization, once again, of certain comps. We have Dan Styles playing mm. Recon, a comp that's been hit or miss all throughout days one and two. And in this case, at 3-2, we saw Von Herker picking up threat level maximum. You know, going into these, this threat level maximum pool, you go into the Ramus, into the Cho'Gath as well, and ended up both players getting bought four, fifth and sixth in the standings for them. And not just that, Dan Styles losing to Von Herker and getting sixth because of it. So even more salt in the wound. It must, you know, been a, a terrible end to the game there for the Dutch player. And what's really interesting to me there about that interaction is that's not something you'd run into every game. Generally speaking, if you're a recon player, you know your threats are going to be uncontested. Maybe someone's running a Zac, maybe someone's running a Belveth, but you don't care about Belveth without an emblem. So usually you're just like safe to go for that Ramus. And if you don't hit, it's usually just because you didn't find the units, not because you're contested. But there's one augment that messes with that, and it's exactly what the other player got in that threat level maximum. So again, just the lobby showing us some interesting meta interactions around the fringes of this patch. 
not just that there was a recon emblem as well for the the, the recon yeah. players. So that's also not just threat, you know, Ramis and Chuck, but also Belveth being contested. Both players trying to find that Belveth two in stage four. So it was definitely an interesting game. I think uh, built different as well. Um, you know, a few different augments that we don't see very often. They completely warp the play style of some of these players. Antelas, unfortunately, uh, not really able to find success with BD going eighth in the process. Yeah. Really rough time for him. I'm, I'm feeling pretty bad coming out of the standings. Just give him a moment of silence there for a second. But coming out of it, we're going to see our top 64 at the moment. This is actually the full standings for the day. And we can see a couple players that started off really strong falling down into the back half. You see uh, Vega, Wet, Jungler, who came out of yesterday around the top of the standings. And we're seeing a lot of changes coming in halfway through the day. Maisie, I'm not going to jinx it here, but I'm seeing all six British players in the bottom 32, and I believe all five Spanish players are in the top 32. So I don't know what went wrong in our first cast for games one and two, but the caster curses are flying in the opposite directions that we usually expect in these tournaments. Well, I am half from the UK and half Spanish, so you know what? <laughs> this, I guess it works out, but it is very sad to see everyone from the UK in that bottom 32, but we do still have three games left. We're only at the halfway mark, and I mean, this could just be me applying way more caster curse than is necessary, but you know how it goes. All right, David, say it. I see it on your face. Just say it. <laughs> I'm just going to say, I figured it out. You know, it took me two sets, but finally I've learned to not actually pick Spanish players as my dark horse or my favorites. And look at that, four Spanish players in the top 16. Guillosco leading the pack, our D-Gen reroller, showing that he has the, the width in his meta so that to go into other comps and still do well with them as well. Yeah, really exciting seeing that pick up at the top of the board. We'll keep an eye on it. Still three rounds to go. And to bring us back into the action, Wida Counterfeit, take it away for round number four. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, I don't have a dual nationality to keep the tears away. I just wanted to re-emphasize, uh, because I think I can, from the bottom eight players in the tournament right now, half of them are from the UK. It's a very it's a bad day for rain, but... We don't, we don't care about the bottom of the table right now, we care about the top because we are heading into Lobby 2 where we get to see some top quality players who are absolutely having a great day. Yeah, and a lot of these players that we are going to be looking into are players that are pretty recognizable names. I want to highlight Simply Wojtek here for a second because in his previous game he had Soraka and Sack free. Uh, that, that, that funnily enough won the Lobby, in case you were wondering out there, that combination <laughs> I think if you put that into a stats explorer anywhere, that's probably a 1.0 average. Uh, I'm not yeah, the expert I mean, though, but you never know. I mean, so we kind of, I wonder if you kind of put this because the answer to this may well just be, you know, be no. But I'm curious to see, you know, we were, previously we were at table 7. So our players were desperate, desperate to get top 1 and top 2 finishes. If you're at this point, if you're in lobby 2, do you have a different approach to the game than the players who have to get, you know, top 1, top 2 finishes? Not really right now, because you, again, you want, you want to build up your tiebreaker to get the total uh, points over the course of the weekend. That is going to be the first tiebreaker going into tomorrow. You want to get that as high up as possible. And also, some of these players could still whiff. You're still just playing to ensure that you do make day free. So as you can see, the points across the table is very similar. So just for, I've never mentioned this before in the chat, but for anyone who wasn't there, we are doing Swiss approach this. So we'll see for the entire way through the competition, nearly all the points will be pretty similar. So if you do well here in day two, or indeed in day one, you'll be playing against other players who are performing almost exactly the same as you are. So in this lobby, you know, these players may well have played against each other before, and if they stay towards the top, they'll play each other again. Yeah, and also worth noting here, Chuso is playing from the venue in Madrid together with a bunch of other uh, Spanish players where they're running their own like Spanish production. Uh, oh. So if you are if you are Spanish and you want to see how that's going, I believe is that the link to that is going to be in one of our co-streamer things. Um, and again, it, we, we've seen this before. We saw this last set when Lumapin he won GSC number three in Dragonlands, where like we had this whole celebratory ceremony for him. Mm. In the in the air in, in the arena, right? So just an interesting one to follow for sure. Yeah, definitely. Shout out to our Spanish fans for doing such a great job of you know creating their community. Of course, you know we were talking about this on Twitter as a whole yesterday. 
And I'm sure there are many other countries who'd love oh. to be able to imitate them in that regard. As we check in with so we can see that a Lulu 2 is dropping from the beginning of the game. Yeah, and also something on the new things we can talk about here, right? The um, the Lesser Champion Duplicator is a new item introduced to regular CFT. I know, Peter, you play a bunch of mm. Double Up, so you see oh, this yeah. Duplicator all around and know the power level of it. Can you kind of like guide us through what the best use for this is going to be? Oh boy, I mean, well, the thing is, I got a little confused with this one before because I keep I kept thinking that Jisoo was going to be sending some units to one of the other players in the game because of Double Up, but no. It said, yes, anything up to three costs can be duplicated here. So we've got the option to go you know, deeper into some of the cheaper rerolls and get there just a little bit faster, but of course, for maximum value, you always love to have the three cost rerolls that you can get up to two star or maybe even quicker to three star than you would be able to otherwise. You can kind of make an argument here as well that Chuzo might have lost the carousel, Peter, to a certain extent, because he started Cloak and now he's gotten another Cloak. <laughs> and while... No, but in reality though, right? Because while Decoy is a good item further down the road, um, it's not necessarily great on 2-1. We are going to be seeing a 2-2-1 two, two, setup here, so we might see some 1-cost rerolls coming in, but there's a lot of 2-cost power on the field. We know Burning Spirit, a very, very popular one if you are headed down the gadget team that starts. And for Juso, we know with a 2-star Lulu already in place, that's got to be tempting. Yeah, and both Auction Rage and Burning Spirit are both pretty interesting ones to work through if you want to go for an Aviego AP line. I think the big issue right now for Chuzo is that if he goes for uh, a reroll here, he's going to have a hard time finding anything that is as flexible as the Burning Spirit from Annie. And then he's also this close to the gadget scene opener here. He has a very clear direct idea about what he wants to do here. Goes for early level 4 and puts in the Ox Force. Yeah, so we've got... Well, we've got the early, yeah, the early Ox Force in place to provide a lot of frontline. Not slamming any items so far, so... Yeah, uh, perhaps a little dissatisfied with the cloak start, as you say, up against a brain gap, who's also brought out a burning Annie. So we are going to be seeing a little bit of contest on a, on the incredibly popular frontline unit. Yeah, it, again, it's, it's just kind of fun. With, with AP being so prominent as it is right now on this patch, Burning Spirit is going to be picked when, when given the opportunity to do so. Um... Moving over to, this is actually an interesting thing here, because I was looking through what the best augments in the game are in general at the mm. higher echelons of play, and when you look at the hero augments, Hextech Retribution actually has very good stats. Kind of the same concept as the Burning Spirit from Annie, where it's just super flexible and easy to slot into pretty much any composition. I know when the hero augments were initially revealed, the Hextech Retribution was definitely one that people were favoring because of that flexibility. Just getting extra damage each time one of your units dies does mean you've got a huge amount of options. Right now, a pretty solid bob of Havali Nick, who's going to be sharing a Winter's Bite onto the Vi frontline. And what's looking like, yes, that will be an underground start for Havali Nick, while still maintaining a reasonably strong board. Yeah, like, and that's like, that's the big thing when you are playing these underground openers, right? Getting those stronger bots that don't get run over here, yeah, it kind of actually ended up getting run over just a tiny bit, right? You get to kill one unit, so that's a win. May Again, you're trading HP for gold, or just general value when you're playing underground. Oh, that's a rain of anger, Peter. Oh boy, I know this is one that you were really excited to see being, being played. Why don't you really break it down for us, because you know, there's a lot going on with rain of anger. Yeah, rain of anger is one of the when you also look at augments and hero augments, Reign of Anchor is incredibly strong. Uh, it is a reroll composition that tends to do the same setup that a Jax board does. It's ended up on pretty much the exact same board, so it's a very familiar board for a lot of people in general here. I'm not too sure whether or not you want to see these types of itemizations because there are some like dis disparities between what people like to prefer. Uh, this is a new one. Uh, the tourist <laughs> board of Spatuopolis really want to show the great rooftops that the city has to offer. Oh, we're here to raise the roof, absolutely. We'll come back to that a little bit later on and we check in with Zonash, who of course has the admin set up before with the Hextech Retribution. We can see, if we check in again with you, so that the, the current board is pretty solid. Zonash Despite not winning from the beginning, it's actually starting to build up a decent head of steam. 
And just a quick little wrap to, to Loris's position. Loris is one of the authors of the DL list, the reroll tier list, right? Mm. That, hence the name, because you press D, DL list. Um, so he has a very clear idea about how you navigate these lines. So super excited to see where it takes that. Yes, definitely a resource I recommend to absolutely anybody. Uh, if you're looking to improve your TFT play, there's so many resources out there from so many great creators, and I think it's one of the things that makes TFT so special. It's a, it's you know, for all of our players here, you know, even from the very best players to the newest players, everyone's benefiting from how many resources are out there to just grab hold of and make yourself a better player. They really want to sell those rooftops. It's like it's like some sort of ad that we haven't been told about. Like we have this strategic partnership with a, with a roofing company. I can only assume so, but Org has got a strategic partnership with a lot of money, but he has been spending it aggressively to make sure that streak stays in place, with Snooty Boo also currently undefeated. Yeah, that's gonna be the big thing here if they're gonna hit gonna hit each other. Then this point with the early two stock Camille, you don't need to have the renegade for Camille to do a lot of damage in the early goings here. But he is gonna run into Havali, who is gonna get a hook, but again, Camille doesn't really care too much about being focused since he has that hand of justice. An underappreciated item, I will say. We've talked about this a lot, where we were, we we're going through some of the augment changes the two of us yesterday, Peter, right? Mm. To the crowns, where I think a lot of people are underestimating how much power there actually t is to a hand of justice. For sure. I mean, we know Mort's been talking before about right now how the Hannah Justice is, you know, especially when it rolls the healing, is a premier self-healing item. And for Camille, that uh, works pretty darn well. Or keeps the win streak going. Snooty Boot does as well. So we have got a collision course maybe coming for our two winning players. It's, no, we've been denied Snooty Boot's point of view. I do apologize to you, dear viewers. We'll do our best to report on what Snooty Boot is up to because... Currently, Org and Snooty Boo both win the streaking while the rest of the lobby drops away in HP. But this is a big fight, right? Snooty Boo versus Org, you're pointing out here, 100 versus 100. Can they dodge each other? And they can. They can. I mean, that's absolutely huge for both of their money. We know their boards are strong already. We're, when we're in a lobby, we've got the Hextech Retribution in place, presumably the more levels you can put in, the more units can die, and the more your overall team's damage can get boosted. And that's one of, also one of the reasons why this augment is so strong, because even if you're not playing Renegade or Admin, you can just you just have the Camille on that. It's kind of like a pseudo Dark Star to a certain to a certain extent. So really fun to watch how he's gonna navigate this. Has the opportunity to take pick up these talents if he wants to play for something like the Viego, but we also saw yesterday, remember Peter, we saw Lilia play Camille reroll without the Camille, without the reroll augment, or like the carry augment. And you can play Camille reroll with this augment as well if you want to, but him picking up the early Camille to combine to Camille 2 makes me think that Ork would rather play for tempo more so than a reroll line. And the tempo is certainly pretty darn strong in the lobby overall. So we've got three win streaking players right now at the top of the lobby. And we can see the streaks just popping up on the side there. It does mean that on the other side of the lobby, for Wojtek particularly at the bottom, down at 63 HP, presumably even our players who are lost streaking are going to have to start spending to make sure that they don't get hammered. Is Wojtek, okay, I was about to say, is Wojtek going to lose or like tie with Crocs? Whatever, that's not going to be the case. And yes, you're talking about these, like, you have to start investing into this round. This free one is going to be super important because the win streaking players have each other in the pool. So Ork has to do a lot of scouting work if he wants, whether he wants to push level six. And on top of that, he has to find a strong unit to put into play. This talent one might not be a decision maker if he goes level six. And leaving it pretty late, of course, our players want to get every advantage they can. I think there's a little bit of a showdown here as both players... Oh no, sorry, Snooty Boo does go up to level 6 and of course it's too hot for TV. So should be keeping that win streak going. I believe our two other win streaking players did not do so. So we may end up leaving this round... We're starting this round with three win streaking players and leaving it with just one. Yeah, and again, this is very good for Snooty. We are on a, we're on the second table, right? Lobby 2, as you also would like to call it, as it says in the top right of your screen right there a second ago. And Snooty is about to potentially make day three on back-to-back -back Golden Spatula Cups and finally putting that reputation to bed that he's not able to do it and put up consistent results in these tournaments, Peter. We are going to be going into Prismatic Second. There's a high-end shopping for Sulu Nosh. 
We've seen what uh, high-end shopping could do for you. The boards it was able to put together were ridiculous. Wait, is the make them think faster? Like, look at all these upgrades coming through on the right side of your screen right now. It is a prismatic, and he is playing a reroll line, so... We will turn into that later once we get the decision here from Sul Unash here. Um, I mean, this I'm is a really tough like, one. Yeah, I mean, you can see Sul Unash is thinking deep. Has got the reroll ready. Will have, of course, one more Augment after this. Could go deeper into Admin if you wanted, or pick up a knife's edge to go further in. It will be Admin for entering the field. It's a big question to be answered here to go with the initial setup. We'll see if it's good enough. We've got some big uh, admin bonuses coming in. Yeah, and these are going to be triggered at 66% HP in combat. So right now they're gaining maximum HP on top of whatever he just chose here. So could have some incredibly interesting scaling decisions to make in the later stages of the game, making these frontliners nigh unkillable. You don't know the, the, you know, the conundrum, of course, with, you know, with the with some of these admin ones based on max HP is that the back lines aren't really going to benefit from them unless you're either having very close rounds or losing rounds because otherwise they're not going down to the 60% max HP. Yes, and also it is going to be gaining 100 mana, so you're going to get those extra clutch casts, for example. So this actually has a pretty interesting interaction with Sejuani, right? So because a lot of the time she's going to take her quite a while to cast due to her higher mana cap, but if she goes down to that, HP gap in the earliest parts of the fight, you solo frontline her, all of a sudden you're going to get that first cast out so quickly. Yeah, having the max mana at 66% at HP is pretty spicy, but you said it's going to be spicy enough as well. We've got the hacker we've noted before in our previous logs. We've seen some players playing hacker 4. That's an enormous amount of Omnivamp on a Renegade LeBlanc as well. Yeah, and this LeBlanc could probably end up getting transferred into something like a Soraka further down the road, right? Blue buff here could be pretty indicative of that move, but even blue buff LeBlanc isn't that horrible either. No, we can see it's doing pretty good work against Brain Gaps, who did pick up a Gadgetine Emblem. Of course, we know what those can look like later on, but what we've got right now for Juso is good enough to keep his win streak going roaring up the table, and we have ended up in a situation where we've got one win streaking player only. Carousel time. There's a Belveth with a sword. That could be interesting for a couple of players, I suppose, if they are going to be leaning towards those AD lines. Um, also, that set with a belt also could be the foundations of a pretty strong setup all around. So, a lot of interesting things to look out for here, Peter. Yeah, it'd be fascinating to see, particularly for some of our players. Well, if you see, from towards the top of our lobby, we've got our players with almost exclusively defensive items, and I imagine that's going to remain the case, being that, you know, of course, when you're up at high HP, you're going to get those last pick of items on the carousel. And Wojtek is going to be on this Yumi, Peter. Has the hold the line augment from Rel, so a lot of power being put into Rel. It's not being put into Nila going forward, so... I say probably praying that this lobby is going to take more of an AD centric approach, I guess, at the end of the day. But that's going to be the freestyle rail found here. The golden Ooh. ticket, obviously, putting in a lot of work to help further the gold tier for Voice. But he's running out of gold now. And that's a really rough situation to be in if you, you know, golden ticket. The more you can proc it, the more value you can get, but for the time being, Wojtek's going to have to rely on putting together a win streak. Unfortunately, Rel, who's so incredibly tanky, is on the opposite side of the fight that she needs to be. Most of the board's going to be gone before she even starts taking serious damage. Yeah, and this board from Orc is also still pretty strong, but I think this Rel is going to be enough to just stand by. The, the Yumi did not get taken out, so that mascot healing is going to come through and secure a pretty big win. But looking at Orc's position here, he's about 50 gold, did not go on early level 7. He has an idea about what he wants to do, and is probably going to execute on that for one. So please do give as many plinks as possible in chat to keep that Yumi Supers board going. As we check with Studio Boo, having had the roofers in to remove our obstruction, we can see clearly that we've got Recon board being combined with Binary Airdrop. That we've seen a little bit throughout the tournament, but I don't think we've seen it in this particular context before on stream at least. There is a massive issue with this situation though for Snooty, and that is that... Uh, Havali Nick, you saw him pick up that thing fast, and he has a lot of upgrades on the same line, and it's a bit of a race between the two boards, and it's a very hard position for you to be cannibalized in. 
And we've said it again and again because it's always going to be true. The recon threat board does need to be as uncontested as possible to really hit through. It does make me wonder if maybe Snooty would change path, but the Raiders' spoils for Ezra means that Snooty's likely going to be wanting to keep that one in to make maximal use of the binary airdrop. Yeah, but Haval is actually losing, so maybe the, la the lack of combat power uh, from like having things fast compared to some of these other augments may or may not be an issue. We can see Loris here, speaking of combat power, has that freestyle Renekton Ooh. on lock here, as well as the secondary carry in the jacks. So let's break down the Reign of Anger for anyone. In fact, thank you, production. Perfect timing. So 65% attack speed, just a base, and then 2% per 100 missing health. So it's not per percentage missing health, per 100 missing health. And when you've got a lot of health, that turns into an absolute absurd amount of attack, uh, attack speed. Yes, and that's why something like the Warmax and the Vertical Brawler is so powerful, and why it's such a useful bonus to have to this Jack Sport that you would normally consider with this line of play that this is a Jack Sport, but in reality, that's not going to be the case here. And again, has potentially a good admin as well online. I feel like if that's a your team gains permanent HP team wide, that would be a huge one for sure to work with. But it's time to figure out if he wants to prioritize putting the Soraka, like the Soraka, the Soraka or the Syndra in play. To be fair, it's a lot more common to see the Soraka going in. If you check in Wojek, of course, who noted from before, needed to put together the win streak. This time round, we saw before the Rel not having the biggest impact before being out of position. This time, Rel in a strong position to absorb a ton of damage, with the Ogwen will have the extra damage reduction to keep Yumi alive. Yeah, but... Uh Worth noting here as well, Yumi doesn't have any items yet. It's the same concept as when you have the Neela as your primary tank. It is defensive items first, and then you're going to go for the offensive components afterwards. And Voysik has so little HP to work with right now that he cannot skimp out on anything. He couldn't hold that second uh, tier. He couldn't hold the tier to pick up a second one to go for the blue buff. Needed the immediate power in slamming that redemption. I mean, it's working pretty well so far. I'm very close to getting the upgrade on the Malphite as well. So the damage... It's a battle match? Oh, boy. I mean, this, presumably this means Wojcik's going to keep the win streak going then. This is a huge thing for him in terms of being able to have some combat power for his Yumi, who is currently struggling a little bit outside of his super scaling as well. Now, speaking of battle match, an option here for Brain Gap, who is going to pick this up. And with the... Pranks for the Zoe, etc. It is an option for him to start frontlining that as well. Five Gadgetine just waiting to come in at the tail end there. Brain Gap is pretty low on HP and doesn't really have too much round to build up a big loss streak without actually being taken out of this lobby. We've got Annie being built up to maximum power. And again, as you know, we were discussing before with David, the front lines. Um, you know, as well as on the Super Scum, in this case, two also being prioritized, will be going up against the Reign of Anger Brawlers. See, yeah, Loras finds a Brawler Emperor, meaning that now he can go for an 8 Brawler set up on top of everything that's going on. That's going to mean so much attack speed for this Renekton. And we can already see that he's a, he's a monster. Does get held up a little bit on these Omega Tanks because he's doing a little bit of damage over and over again, but he's very hard to shift. Jax does step in front of Renekton and gets cut down. And I guess we'll get to see here how much Renekton can do on his lonesome. Got the Soraka as well in the back line here. Also being able to push in just a little bit of work for healing coming through oh, from that Hextech Gunblade. Might be just enough here to ensure that Brain Gap is going to take a loss. He's ever so close to a lot of spikes right now. He's struggling a little bit. Has He needs one more copy of Annie. And then he has a very solid frontliner going on. And Brinkaps is desperately looking through to try and fight. Just isn't happening, though. So at least from the last round, Brinkaps took as soft as loss as he could have done. But everybody else is up in the 40 HP or so. Brinkaps has said much, much further below. Very little room to work with. Very few more chances. August now found his way on to an Ophelios here, so it's, oh, that's a hook coming through oh. from that raid of spoils. Oh, that is pure misery hour here for Ark. That's a big loss potentially going his way, depending on the strength of the sport from Snooty. Yeah, so a little win streak in the making for Ark. Seems like it just goes down the toilet immediately. Raid of spoils. Such an exercise in frustration when it turns against you. Og will take the L, at least has enough HP to fall back on, but will be now become 
the second lowest player in the lobby unless we see simply take an L as well. Oh no, my, my mistake. Zunash is also heading down there as well. Yeah, the two reroll players in Wojtek and Loris have both hit and they are both still streaking. So that's going to be I mean, They're just going to try to stay alive for as long as possible until these very capped out boards that are going to be playing more into the vertical leveling aspect of TFT are going to start striking through here. So a fiddlesticks with a chain vest being offered around <laughs> some of these players that are struggling for solutions. That might be the one they're looking for. Bizarrely low priority. Let Snooty Boo at the very top of the table pick it up. I do want to point out though, in terms of you know what we're seeing in the inventories on the right hand side, Zulanash picked up well he already has an emblem, picked up a cloak. I think we're looking now at admin six coming in. Well, that is going to be an interesting one to follow. There's so much amplification in that aspect. So the two admin emblems as well, giving that to the two front liners. That's so much extra HP generated every single fight. Remember, he has bonus HP and bonus mana depending on the ticks. So this could be the missing X factor for him because he's still lacking items for that Soraka. A lot being asked of this... <laughs> Uh, LeBlanc on the back line. We've got the big pile of beef that is the Brawler come. Interesting to see the Renekton and the Jacks being pushed to a far flank in this fight rather than being front and center. You don't want them to be taking initial contact. You can get the Renekton to take initial contact, but you want them to take a lot of damage so you can start ramping up that attack speed and they can drop the aggro with that Edge of Night. And look at the boards here, Peter, right? There's going to be two Sorakas on the board for Lurus. Direct contest here against Sulanash. So that is also another thing to keep in mind. It's going to be a lot harder for Sulanash to stabilize here. And we were, talk you know, we were talking before really nicely about how Zulanash had this end of round potency with this composition. The maximum mana burst when these units, or when the admin units hit the 66% health means they should be good when it comes to the end of round, but even with six admin, that still wasn't close. No, and look around the lobby, Wojtek and Laura still streaking, so they haven't hit each other just yet, which could be a defining thing. Brain Gap has found that free star and he get a little bit of extra oomph in the front line but he's still lacking that final defensive item because he put the he put the um Surat portal onto the poppy instead oh yeah that's true that's going to be a significant amount reduced but at least leaving space for the gadgetine item a lot of the damage from the composition will be coming from that gadgetine so one star Soraka at the back line being amped up by now just 30 percent just 30 percent damage and but no other damage items. Looks like it might be enough. Havali's Recon's frontline does evaporate pretty darn quickly. And the Recon's can't roll away from the Soraka damage. Such a big lack of any useful items here for Havali. And on top of that, he didn't find like an early free stop with a spike from the Think Fast. And when you're re when you're rolling for free cost compositions with free to Think Fast, it, it is going to be a lot harder. It's one of the reasons why we don't see Think Fast 4-2 anymore, because it helped those types of compositions a little bit too much. Yeah, risk not paying off. As you said, simply will remain our only win streaking player. Snooty and Loris just above with a little bit of an HP buffer. Snooty looking pretty good. As you noticed before, the recon's being contested has definitely slowed Snooty down, but I'm kind of surprised. Snooty's still doing pretty darn well, even if his board isn't quite what he would like it to be right now. Minor correction, you can obviously still get uh, Think Fast uh, for two. Um, but yeah. Uh, We'll just like erase that. We can we do like can we do like the men in black meme, the, the blink, you didn't hear that. <laughs> I um, don't e yes. Everyone quickly plink everyone in the chat and we'll all forget. I guess that's kind of the, the equivalent, right? We just plink and everything is good in the world. But Snooty as well, he's on a contest here, but he's able to spread out his resources a lot more due to the nature of having the binary airdrop. And his board is a little bit more well rounded, has that recon fiddlesticks and can put in a lot of work. So a lot of extra additional sources for the damage here. So looking at this long time as to go up against Brain Gap, Brain Gap, to come back to this in a second actually, because I think we might be about to see Brain Gap getting taken out. Lovely Zephyr onto the Zoe, takes out a big chunk of the comp's damage immediately, and then we've got the Recon Fiddlesticks dancing in the middle, when Zoe goes down to minimal health, but doesn't, oh no, I was going to say doesn't die, but takes a stray shot from Kaiser. This could well be the end of the line. Brain Gap is going to take a fairly big hit if the front line collapses, and it's just about to. 
Still alive at 1 HP, so 1 HP and a dream here on 5-2. Maybe he can find us a Rocket 2 out of nowhere to kind of help him potentially get a little bit more HP and and get ahead of Sulanash, because right now that's the big question for him, is trying to find a way to at least outplay Sulanash's 6 admin board. But that's it, Ooh. they're both looking for Soraka, they're cannibalizing each other, and it's gonna be Sulanash who finds that Soraka too. It's a tale as old as time, holding hands to 7th and 8th could well be happening here, while other players like Havali Nick, who is holding hands with Snooty, hits the 3-star Kaiser, a 3-star Rambus as well. Pretty bad news for Snooty, but amazing news for Havali. And Chuso just hit this 2-star Viego, that could be the bringer of doom here for Sulanash. Oh boy, yeah, we're in real elimination territory here, maybe even double elimination territory. Keep your eye on the players from the bottom of both of these windows because they're the ones in the major peril. You can see the Caps is getting absolutely run over. The Renekton is still so incredibly beefy, not even close to dying. Oh wait, the LeBlanc here is actually going to be staying alive for Sula Nash. It's going to be Brain Cap going Aether. There we go. I, I genuinely thought we were going to be seeing two eliminations, but just one. Zulanash holding on by a thread. You saw an Org on around 15 HP each. We're getting very close to stripping away half of our lobby here before we even hit stage six. Yeah, and Brain Cap going out now freed up Loris to find us a rocket too. You can see the top of your screen. Snooty now going into more of a Belveth centric line here, trying to find those strong individual threat units instead, because now with Havali having hit the Kaiser Free, it's going to be a lot harder for Snooty to capitalize as well. We'll spend a second just checking to see if Zulanash is going to actually survive this one as we check in with that binary board from Snooty Boo from before. Of course, yeah, we've got the recon emblem in play, the final one. I was going to actually ask if maybe Snooty would be deciding to pivot to something else, but apparently that won't be the case. We've got at least our friend Belveth, who's a recon as well, for an additional damage source, but surely this board is capped against some of the other stuff we're seeing. Yeah, we can kind of see now what this board from Sulanas is actually able to do in these longer drawn-out fights. Really putting in a ton of work as Chuso and Ork wow. are going to get eliminated by a 1 HP difference here. Sulanash suddenly all the way up into a 5th place. That is an amazing hold on for Zulanash, especially considering where we saw them before. The admins, you're praising them from before. Admin 6 in particular, this ability to bring in the ultimate form of the composition is proving to be extremely impressive. Enema Squad Fiddlesex being left around. It's kind of the first lobby today where we haven't seen Enema Squad really have high prio. But this duelist Kaiser set up here for Avada with double freestar backliners as well as a Ramus. Oh boy. It's going to stop potentially doing a lot of work, but Voice again just keeping getting on that value from that golden ticket. He's been able to keep his economy going due to the win streak being kept up here. More his entire board now is Freestar. Freestar Nyla, Freestar Rel, Freestar Yumi, you name it, he has it. Uh, that is going to be a really challenging board, but luckily not for Havala, that's not in the pool. He also could be playing... Oh, he is in the board. He's in the pool here, sorry. And that is going to... We're going to see on screen here, double elimination again on the table. Reroll versus reroll. Yes, they both fought back from the brink of what looked to be a pretty awful game for suddenly being in contention to make it to top four. We can see the recon power is enormous. Yumi is not getting the one shot, but she does get the second kill in. That's really huge. I think the Yumi will plank her way to victory. One more shot in. And down they go. Havali holds on barely, but Zulanash will not. No, I think at the end of the day, Sulanash is going to be very happy with that fifth place here. It was looking incredibly doomed for him that Soraka 2 eventually saved his game and brought him all the way up into a fifth place, potentially. So, that is a win in his book. And when you are in this higher lobby, it's fine. You just got to maintain these types of positioning and finishes. And then you are going to find your way into that day three. But Loris back in a win streak. Wojtek on a win streak still. Just keep on plinking with that Yumi, Peter. And it seems to be now we've moved, at least in this particular lobby, and of course in the back half of day two, the reroll seems to be everywhere and everywhere all the time. I'm still so amazed that Snoody Boo is holding on as well as he is, given that he's seemingly the only player who hasn't managed to hit the full capacity board. 
but he has the recon bell back for that gun blade, right? So he has this additional carry. He has three backline carries. He's able to itemize due to the power level of that binary airdrop. But in the mirror matchup, however, he is going to meet his maker, and that's going to be a win for the stronger board of Havali, I would assume. And that's going to bring Snooty into, into elimination territory. Wojtek taking a huge loss against Loris on top of this. Of course, do remember, as you noted before, we are in table two. So at this point, with these players, this is more like an exhibition match of seeing how good our players will be likely coming into day, th day three. You noted that if we see you know, eight places, seven places coming in for our players, maybe they could get pushed out of day three. But for these top four players at this point, they are making sure that day three is very, very likely. And we're set for a hugely explosive last few rounds. Yeah, cutoff point normally 27, 28 points. So if you're someone like Havali right here with, with 17, you're guaranteed at least five points now. It's gonna put you to 23, of 22, sorry. Vortec, for example, is guaranteed at minimum 23 points. So all these players right now, they are looking kind of in a good spot to get into that day three if they start avoiding those eighth places in the final two games. I love this from Vortec as well, Peter, right? He's not popping this anvil right now. He know he needs to roll to get those final upgrades and then he can see what he wants. A yeah, very, very smart play. And it's a crazy difference from what we saw before. So you see our econ readout on the side there. Well, take the only player who's got money in the bank after being in such a dire position before. An incredible comeback with the Yumi Comp to get back to economically sound Wait, and also here? with a super strong board. Or is on the opposite side here, but this triple stacking here from Havali could potentially have been an issue. Like, allowing them all three to get CC'd. Yeah, Havali and Snoodyboo up on the chopping block here. Surely both of them head out and we head into our final two. The recons, of course, very, very strong. We can see they're busting through. The reign of Anger Renekton is going to struggle to keep up, going down very, very low. And it's down to Soraka to do the final touches. And she can't quite do it. No, and that means Snoodyboo goes fall here. He did have the HP lead compared to Havali as a play from the war on the same sort of line in the game here, but it is going to be Havali who's going to come out on top, which is the expected outcome. But if you're Snooty, you're going to be incredibly happy with that fourth place. Galoris building up power as well as, yes, our three re-roll players all looking to roll away into the top position they possibly can to smooth out their path coming out of day number two. And of course, potentially battle for a place to get interviewed at the end of the day. Havali still looking incredibly strong. We didn't see this matchup go well last time. No, and look at like all these golden units on the board here. That's so much extra damage coming through from this super straight. Even has the Syndra now on the board by going level eight to start adding in these strong individual units further down the road. Looks like we're going to be seeing history repeating here. Havanik, I think, pretty happy with the contested recon lobby to end up going out in the third. So we do have our final two. And apparently, you know, the reign of anger living up to the hype. We'll see here. This was a ghost fight. We haven't seen them match up in a fair situation for a while. It looks like, though, Loris going chasing for a Soraka free as an option, as a potential outcome here. Jack Ooh. free also. Something he wants to go for here. It's going to be unrealistic for him to go for level 9. But he has a lot of HP to work with. He doesn't have to start sending it yet. You can see, yeah, as you mentioned before, our players looking to try and keep any amount of information from their opponents as possible, saving on the buying their Soraka, maybe into, even to the end of round here to try and keep that strategy concealed. Let's see how the brawlers do. This is a massive bucket of HP up against each other. The Jax does have the rapid fire cannon to keep himself out of trouble, so he should be able to do a lot, but he hasn't got the healing for when he does take damage. Good, Sejuani ultimate here is going to buy a lot of time for the Renekton and the Jax to start chewing away. The Yumi has gone down, so now it's all up to these remaining units, but this Renekton untouched. A lot of HP missing, so a lot of attack speed stacking up instead, and Wojtek taking a huge loss. That's going to be so disappointing for Wojtek, because we know that Loris' board can get stronger with the Jax 3, potential Soraka 3 down the line. One more item coming in, but, Wait. I mean, simply has very little room to maneuver. That's going to be four hard for Wojtek here, I think, right? So that's going to be another additional layer of damage potentially being added. And that might give enough age, not enough damage to the Yumi to one-shot one of these bigger brawlers and buy more time. 
As you said, we've got it being dropped onto the ribbon there, just to make sure that extra bit of punch is there. And we do know that the Brawler Board likes to play long rounds, so stacking hearts seems like it should be very effective. Another thing here as well, worth noting, is going to be that positioning of the Sejuani. If you can get that directly onto the Yumi positioning here, that's going to be big. Spreading out the CC as well as that Ionic Spark shred. And as you said, it's the Sejuani going to end up being on the opposite side of the team. So good prediction from White Tech to try and hold on for an additional round. We'll see if the four hearts are enough. You can see already the Brawlers are ripping through the Plink board. And it's it seeming like it's going to be right up to the end. And, oh, my apologies. I got mixed up with all the different ribbons in the mix there. I thought that was the Brawler board. But no, instead, it's going to be the comeback. And it's Soraka getting ripped through instead. Yes, we can see this going back and forth another times, a few more times. We do know that Loris has an additional X factor in the potential of a Jax free, um, so that's something you got to keep an eye out for. Here. He's going to go out. He's going to stop chasing this rocket free and just going to go for the Jax free instead. And you're talking about hiding this before. He's going to hide it again, Peter. He's not going to show his hand until the final second possible here. I mean, this is the puzzle our players face here, is knowing where is the maximal priority. Loris will be able to confound that by throwing in the last second jacks. You can see White Deck will be immediately looking forward to say, oh, I was hoping that wouldn't happen. One more time round, Loris has got the chance to take a, a shot and not die. But if it goes the other way, it's all going to be over. Good shroud, good CC here. Is that going to be enough in terms of buying the time? The Jax free, the damage increase is so big here. He's an absolute mountain and he's doing the damage. The secondary carry coming in behind the Renekton is absolutely huge. All the hearts and all the world will be broken. And the Jax remains alive here at table number two. Brawlers brawl their way to a first place and punch a further ticket for Loris to make sure he stays safe for day number three. And I will say, these German players and combining with these Brawler reroll lines, I mean, it's just a match made in heaven. Honestly, at this point, right? Like, we, talk, we, we heard Mark talk about the top of the show. Now we see Loris do incredibly well with winning a lobby. Not exactly Jack's reroll, but kind of the same line. It's just something that they are so stable on in that practice group. Yeah, I mean, absolutely love what we're seeing then. It, you know, with this being a comp that we're not as, you know, as familiar with, but did emerge with the, you know, with the hero reroll augments coming in, opening up these one costs to much more experimentation. It feels like as the games go past, we're getting more and more, you know, out of these kind of compositions that maybe we just weren't seeing before. Yeah, absolutely. And this kind of shows how versatile this patch is in general, right? But I think that we are going to let our analyst desk talk about that instead. In the meantime, we're going to have an interview with the God ready for you. See you after the break. I'm the God. Uh, my name is is Philip. I'm from Portugal, and uh, yeah, I'm a cool Portuguese guy who likes uh, this game, basically. Oh, uh, I start playing in set six, so I had set six, set seven, and set eight. So set eight is basically my favorite set of all time. I think my performances right now is the best, I guess, because. I'm a first or eight player, so I may be first versus first or eight eight eight. But I I think I'm getting more first now, so my performance I, I think is good now. I hope. <laughs> I really enjoy them. I think the new format is really, 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 really good. And I said really six times because it's really good. Uh, because we are playing for uh, our spot, but also for our uh, our region, and uh, we yeah I really enjoy it because it seems like uh, players that aren't that well known like master or something they can win and enter and i think it's really good that uh, they open the doors to everyone i want to give to all of them i can say everyone's name but chilendario maestro tavas ipanina the those people but all portuguese and uh, like we are really like a family so all all the portuguese family 
I really want them to to get a shout out. They they deserve. Welcome back, everybody. We are here after round number four, which featured a very important player, a very important feature of the game, if you will. Our key feature, of course, the D key, really just showing up a lot. I'm doing an impression of every player in the lobby right now. And it showed up in several compositions. Of course, the winner of that lobby was Loris with Reign of Anger. And I really loved the Renekton itemization, which I'll touch on briefly with the Gunblade and Warmogs to allow he at additional health as fuel for Reign of Anger to get more attack speed, and then the Edge of Night to make sure once Renekton's too low to keep tanking it up, he has time where he's untargetable and can get a little extra burst of healing. But that was by far not the only reroll comp in the game. One more thing to mention, Loris is one of the co-creators of the legendary deer list, this tier list of reroll comps that the Germans have. So, so fitting to see him finding success with the Angry Croc itself. But someone else that simply followed the rules is simply Wojtek. Top of show on day one, if you were paying attention to the meta talks, he literally followed every single rule I highlighted. He picked the hero augment hold the line, the best hero augment for the Yumi comp overall. He was uncontested on supers and on Yumi, on the Yumi units overall, Rel and Nyla as well. He picked Golden Ticket, top five prismatic augment for this comp, as well as Battle Mage 2, or two. He built the items on Rel first, then Nyla, and then the Yumi. So, I mean, him being second place here, I am not surprised at all. This is a player that knows how to play Yumi and from what spot to do so. And he dominated his sitting at 41 HP for pretty much all of stage four and five once he finally assembled this Exodia board. One more thing to mention, Snooty Boo picked up an augment that I think we can all agree has not been too hot in set eight, Binary Airdrop. We are actually reviewing the VODs from yesterday on stream game five. We saw YLCO, the British player, pick up Binary with a five component start. He went eighth place and Snooty said verbatim, but we all know Binary Airdrop is unpickable this set. Lo and behold, this came, he picks a second augment <laughs> and finds his way into the top four, which I think is hilarious. Thank you, Snooty. Yeah, Snooty Boo is one of those tenacious players that maybe he's like, yeah, you can't pick it but I can. Maybe that's what was trying to happen here. Snooty Boo was someone that I wanted to talk about anyway. Him and Havali were frantically fighting it out for the recons during that game and they ended up holding hands and going third and fourth. Um, but this was a game where contestion was just really, really high. If it wasn't the recons, it was people looking for Soraka. We had Brain Zapped, Loris, and Zulinesh all rolling for that Soraka. And as a result, all placed fairly low in the table. So who knows what we'll see going into games five and six. Niberia, is there anything you're particularly looking out for? Well, I mean, it's it's not just the compositions that we saw doubled. One of the things I noted the moment we had those hero augments out was outside of the hold the line and reign of anger we talked about, which happened to be first and second place. Wonder if there's a pattern here. Every single other augment was doubled up. 
Hextech Retribution from Og and Zoilanash, Burning Spirit from Brain Gapped and Chuso, Raider Spoils from Snooty and Havali, and naturally, that turns into those contested compositions. So either the player's not scouting everyone else's augment choices or saying, I can do better. I can just win this 50-50. Don't worry about it. Really ended up leading to them taking the bottom half of the lobby, which kind of makes it shocking to me that Recon was the one that made third and fourth place. But given what we've seen across the rest of the days where Recon can succeed even with just two stars, it's starting to come into focus for me. It felt so good, I imagine, for both Loris and Simply Voitech. When they have these extremely strong comps and they see they're uncontested on them, Ray Langer has under a 4.0 average placement as a one cost reroll option for Burnecton, especially the 8 Brawler. A buff was big on this last patch. So we're seeing the standings now. We don't see, we see two Spanish players here, rather, but a few more, I hope, in that first page. Also, the Greek, three out of the five players yeah. are hanging on for dear life, trying to make it into the day three. And that is something that I wanted to flag coming out of uh, day number one. The Greek player is looking incredibly strong overall. This country that has not traditionally seen a lot of representation here in Rising Legends. After the showing from Sorrow and GSC number one, everyone from the country is coming gunning for that title. Uh, I gotta say the UK side of my DNA is very sad not to see much UK in there. But the Spanish side of my DNA is having a wonderful time. And of course, Kevin Parker, German player, still holding that top position. That's three first side of four games. That is incredibly impressive. Kevin Parker yeah. and Cambys in that top three, Niberia. Both players pretty much already in day three with the point total they've already accumulated in just four games. And that means that both players are, I think, 100% guaranteed to be at regional finals at the end of set 8.5. So big congrats to both players showing such consistent play across ladder, across tournaments, across open qualifiers in the case of Kevin Parker, and, and coming up to this tournament and really showing up as players as well. Something that's really heartening to me, of course, is that they have been in the scene for so long. As much as I love seeing new players come in and find dominance within the scene, it is comforting to see players that we know, comforting to see players that have already found that success, either coming back with a vengeance in the case of Canbiz, who fell off for a couple of sets, or just being consistently strong in the case of Kevin Parker, who, as Weta mentioned, was present throughout all of set seven with varying results. Now that we're in set eight, has been showing so much more consistency, so much more strength in his play, and I think days number one and two have shown that he's an absolute exemplar of that high placement and consistency in doing so, which is insane. So I'm, I'm looking at you guys. We're coming into rounds five and six, of course. Is there anything that you've been picking up over today that you either didn't expect to see coming out of yesterday or that you want to pay attention to going forward into these final rounds of today and day number three? Quick answer for me would be just seeing more Samira, more sure shots. I think it's a very fun high cap board to see with the Felios too, especially. We haven't seen a lot of it today, only a little bit in game three. So hope to see more of these high end legendary boards. I was going to say something similar, just the return of Samira when she was so prevalent yesterday. And then she's just kind of beat absent today. But no, I'll, I'll swap it up and I'll say more admin. The admin variants are so fun. And we saw six admin in that game. Unfortunately, it didn't play out. Maybe just the Soracas were too hard to hit, but uh, I would like to see players not abandon admin and continue using it in their compositions. I think it makes the game more exciting. All right, a couple of things we have to keep our eyes on as we take a quick break and then head into the final two rounds of day number two. Don't go anywhere. So my name is Magarki. I'm a French uh, TFT player. Um, I'm playing for Team uh, Aegis and uh, I've been playing TFT since uh, set two. I feel like uh, this set it's a lot more flexible, a lot more complex and uh, as pro player I really enjoy playing it. Yeah, I prefer this uh, format because it makes uh, the regional uh, uh, tournaments have more importance and uh, it's nice to have uh, each country or each region with uh, different ways to qualify. Otherwise, 
if you miss out on the ladder, then it's see you in six months. It's how it used to be, but now it's better. There are numerous ways to qualify, so I like it. Uh, best way to qualify is through the open qualifier and uh, to win this qualifier. And I feel like most players feel like the open qualifier is a lesser way to get into the Golden Spatula. But I think if you manage to win the qualifier, it means you you're prepared for the real golden spatula just the week after so i would say playing the open qualifier so thank you for everyone who's been following me and uh, like sharing for me in the chat and merci à à tous les fans notamment d'Aegis qui sont qui sont à fond derrière nous ça fait ça fait plaisir Baby, my name is Niberia, still joined here by Impetuous Panda and Maisie Marzipan. Now we're swapping our roles from the death to the cast. We get to keep the synergy flowing, keep the points going. Uh, Panda, Maisie, what are you looking forward to coming into these last two games? Still just the admin in the Samira or anything specific about the players? My main looking uh, thing I was looking forward to is you not continuing to wrap past those first two lines. I think you ended at the perfect moment, Niberia. Well, well analyzed there to know when you had to stop. Uh, but I'm just I, I to would like to say it's closer to poetry because I am far too white to rap. Okay, I, I also agree with this take. <laughs> We're in complete agreement until now for this part of this desk. Uh, my main thing to look out for is just how the players react to this being games five and six, and a lot being on the line from these players. We talked about players that have done homework already, like Canvas and Kevin Parker, pretty much already with a foot and a bit more in that day three. But these players are still in a spot where they have to try and get around seven to eight to nine points for the next two games. I think uh, yeah. for myself, the thing that I'm looking forward to the most is game five and six. This is when the people in the middle of the pack really have to pull something special out. And we're privileged enough that we get to present those lobbies to you and hopefully tell that story in the best way possible and watch these players as they fight for a spot in day three. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to admit to my caster bias right out the gate as game number five starts. I've been watching a ton of Solo Gasong and learning a lot from his stream. So I'm really excited to see him doing well so far. We saw him start the day off at the top of the leaderboards up in that ninth place spot, gone back and forth throughout the day. And I personally am wishing him luck to keep his strength up through these last two rounds and make it to that day number three. Yeah, Solo was, of course, top eight in last set's regional championship. Not just a GSC day, but the actual regional finals he made to the among the top eight players in all of EMEA. Hoping to do the same in this set, and this is just part of that path. Two more players I want to highlight are Sage and Stinky Abuser, both from Poland, both fairly young. I saw my first, uh, you know, show of seeing Sage play in set six with Mutants and a lot of AP lines with Malzahar, I remember back in the day. Very, very yeah, accomplished player from Poland. Exactly, yeah. He did really well there, expecting to see him do similarly well here, I think, as well. For Solo Gasong, you mentioned he had a lot of success last set. Another one of those players that has been present since the beginning of the scene. 
back in set 3.5. Battlecast reroll, eight out of eight games, uh, but kind of fell off a little bit from the competitive scene and now is coming back to a prominent spot. I would also flag Sweller Tiger as another one of those very experienced players um, who I think has had more consistent success throughout the seasons, but is yet to reach another high like we saw him in Galaxies. Yeah, Sweller Tiger is a player that I have been following around for some time. I had the privilege of interviewing him at DreamHack Hanover. Um, he's part of the sort of Italian blender mafia, a player with a lot of personality, a lot of heart, and hopefully a lot of success. It's, it's good to finally showcase them on the broadcast. Oh, with a scrap trait in set six, so many good Italian players played <laughs> so well with that trait. Set seven, not so much. Set eight, especially at the beginning, Really bad showing in terms of representation going to GSC1. Shining Star was really the only Shining Star coming out of Italy. But in this case now, Balotelli got day one, but he was still here in the GSC at the very least. And Swaller Tiger, I think the most dominant ladder player from Italy, is actually showing up and having good results in this tournament as well. Yeah, having talked to the Italian players, they're very proud of how much they're progressing as a region. And despite the mixed success that they've found, uh, they're really excited about the future. And they think they're going to start showing more prominence in these Golden Spatula Cups in the regional finals. And Solo Gasong, trade sector popping up, but he's going to go for a knife's edge. He's not letting me have my fun. I wanted to see another one of the Gadgetine rerolls. Uh, the Gadget Team pre-roll comps are too much fun. I'm so glad we finally got to see it earlier with the set and the Gadget Team spat. Who knows what other Gadget Team troubles we'll have presented to us today, but yeah. Completely different uh, ideas in his mind with the units he was holding after this stage one, but once he found that knife sedge, immediately bought out the GP and the kill, slammed the Runans, has half of a locket already built on this Renekton, and now I'm going to hope he finds a few more natural duelists in his next few shops. Hitting four duelists in stage two is Extremely important, as is hitting that six duelist power spike in stage three, if you're able to find the Vayne and the Nyla. Keep an eye on Solo's board as we go throughout the game, see if he's able to hit those breakpoints you highlighted. But I had a question about Sage's Augment pickup there. Metabolic Accelerator, very popular in early set seven, a little bit in set six, has kind of fallen off. What's the modern strategy around it? What kinds of compositions would you expect Sage to be going for from this position? Underground, I think, is the obvious answer. Ideally, underground. Oh, he does have underground heart. Okay, this is this is pretty well. It's actually Digas, actually the player that has underground heart online. So two players potentially going for underground, and this is kind of very important to note that the patch before this one, when the player damage change happened, so in stage three you took even less damage, and underground was incredibly strong. Metabolic was a great pickup in tournaments because you could greed so much and have an extremely high cap board after your stage four or stage five cash out in some cases. Yeah, with the changes to Underground, I I don't necessarily think the Loose Streak is always going to be our option here for the players, so it's quite nice that this Underground Heart is going to allow Dig Sparta to play, you know, a, a more sort of conventional board with less Underground units. They tend to be sort of more undertuned and don't perform as well, so there is a lot more scope rather than just the set Loose Streak that we would have seen earlier on in this set. What's fascinating to me from here is, of course, with uh, Tropical going for the Giga Lost Streak in order to hit Econ a single Lulu in, if Diga was looking for a play that involved the full Lost Streak with Underground, that's now no longer an option. You don't get that same five streak economy that you would expect from this Underground composition. If he's going for the Lost Streak, as it looks like he is, he's going to have to start over from scratch. Just one problem, players think that if they're playing underground, they're playing for Lost Street, they can just, you know, play their underground units on the board and then just AFK, go make a sandwich, come back at Krugs and, and try and not lose to Krugs. But in some cases, it's the most important amount of scouting happens when you are trying to lose streak because you have to make sure you are the weakest player in your player pool. And with both Sage and Diga Sparta here trying to go for an underground, trying to go for a Lost Street start, uh, it's actually quite tricky. Yeah, we've even got uh, Tropical down on 79 HP, so this open fort strategy seems to kind of be uh, kind of be the meta in this lobby. Yep, 
going forward in this lobby. I'm looking at the augments here. Uh, I am looking forward to seeing what Sweller Tiger is going to pull out, going for scoped weapons. To me, that pretty clearly signals a Jax composition, though I have seen it played with Belveth previously by some of our pros, so I want to keep an eye on that as that develops. So Logosang picks up the rod and slams the locket right away. The two most enticing options for Solo here were that vein with that uh, chain. Sorry for that rhyme there, was not intentional. And also just the locket. The vein did not have priority to end up picking that up, so ends up going for the second best option. Maybe the first, just from being able to slam the locket right away. Yeah, and we are going over to Sweller's board. We are going to see that Jax starting pickup. Was a little concerned when I saw the double rod for him, but that is going to turn into a gun blade and potentially a Ginsu's rage blade for that Jax at a later stage once he finds a bow. Yeah, Sweller Tiger here looking for the admin. I'm just I didn't catch the admin. Did any 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 of you? We'll wait Observer. for we'll wait for Charlie Danny. did. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, like, Danny, I, help! It, I always ask and then Danny swoops in immediately to save the day with the admin. It's actually terrible for us. We're just getting too comfortable not paying attention at all to Addison because we know our admin has our back. But there we see it. It's going to be... Actually, I missed it again. <laughs> it just said initialize cause and effect. That's not very helpful. <laughs> maybe he has not checked it yet, has not picked yet. But, or maybe just a visual uh, problem there with the spectator mode. But we will find out soon enough chat we will have the answer at some point this game hopefully sooner rather than later but solar tiger a player that is playing into this brawler line we've seen it have so much success scope weapons gonna be fantastic for this jacks pretty much every game we've seen brawler played i think on broadcast today has been a top four if i'm not yeah. mistaken we saw it game two was a third place last game was uh, also second place i believe so overall performing very very well and i think the buffs to eight brawler especially help this combo out yeah, yeah you would uh, think last game it was the Reign of Anger, of course, mm -hmm. but this game looking to be just scope weapons, traditional Jax carry. Yeah. I remember when I spoke with uh, Swirler Tiger uh, for Dreamhack Hanover, I asked him what his favorite comp of the set was, and he told me that it was Jax uh, because he likes winning. And apparently this is just muscle memory that he's whipping out today because that scoped weapon Jax with the Gunblade is going to get him far if today is anything to go by. I think he spoke to him on the past where Jax was broken at the start of the set, so that makes a lot more sense. But we've gone full circle. Jax is once again a very, very strong pickup for really any player trying to find success in this tournament. Oh, selling out here as Sweller going to be picking up two admin, potentially looking to find four if he can hit on that Soraka. Little curious to me, because scoped weapons would not do well with four admin. And the admin for Sword Tiger is on kill. The killer will gain 25% attack speed, and that does synergize well with what Jax wants to do, of course. Rage Blade, RFC, all items that give attack speed in the case of RFC, also giving that, that distance, the attack range mm -hmm. to keep Jax safe as well, which is equally important. A lot of people just think, oh, two bows, you're just trying to give Jax attack speed. Yes, but also the distance, the extra range is pivotal for this Jax to find success. Something we've seen in previous sets with a lot of melee carries as an alternative to that Quicksilver. But with Jack's variation specifically, it feels so much more important. Quicksilver, just not the right substitution. He needs to stay safe in that farther back lines. We're headed over now to Stinky Abuser. What a name. Um, and we are finding the makings of what could be a little sure shot threat composition. These have kind of been absent today. I'm surprised there has not been more sure shot players, but maybe this is the game where we get the spice. Has, of course, the buff for having a webcam POV here. Everyone knows now that the players that have the webcam online are going to find success. Not surprised to see Mr. 100 HP here trying to defend this win streak going into stage three. We saw many players got close to that 10 win streak today. Giosko in game two was up to nine and then lost that final one. We'll see if Stinky Abuser now at six can do four more and just reap the reward from all this extra econ. And the name of the day is Prismatic Second, and the second name is Woodland Charm, but surprisingly, we're going to see Radiant Relics, also another very popular Prismatic augment today. Post buffs in 13.5, we're going to see increased uh, Bect from these Radiant items. Pickup will be the Eternal Whisper in the end, fits perfectly onto this already Belveth carry. Uh, the An Eternal Whisper just sounds annoying to me. 
Sorry, continue, Mike. <laughs> no, no, I was just going to say, the Belfast has been really, really interested today because it's been one of those units that you can seem to slap any emblem on, a, a wide variety of items, and just use it as kind of like a filler slot in your comp. And uh, yeah, to see it early, it's beautiful. I think it's what you'd curse a librarian with, Eternal Whisper. <laughs> That's the worst of both of both worlds, I think, in that case. But Nunu already online. We do, of course, have level up, so it makes some sense for Sage. The player that we talked about was playing Underground. I'm not sure if he's cashed out yet. I imagine so for to some extent. And already has a level up and the Nunu online. Yeah, really good combo for him, allowing him to Lost Streak into the early stages and heal back up, as well as push those higher levels towards these later stages of the game. So allowing that economic advantage to slingshot him forward. But the risk of level up, of course, not a combat augment directly, so really needs to find those stronger board configurations to stay on parity with the other players in the lobby. This is tough for Solo, has not found six duelists, is loose streaking with duelist knife's edge, it's not where you want to be. This comp is at its maximum in stages two and three. It's where you essentially glide through that early and mid game, get your econ online, have a lot of HP to then start slowly losing that HP in stage four and bleed out to a top four. So we'll see what Solo can do. Has rolled down quite heavily as well, down to 15 gold. Yeah. Solo we've seen in game two uh, going with the, the, the Gadgetine. So this is a completely different direction almost. Um, Solo, Solo is definitely one of those ones that's interesting to watch. So even though it hasn't been the strongest start, like I fully believe that this is a player that can pick it back up. Yeah, this is also a composition that's been very strong in the meta recently. Um, Duelist hasn't seen a lot of play on broadcast. I believe day one was the only time we've seen it. It found success there, and it's seen success on the ladder, but has yet to translate at least to our on-stream games. Talking about six Duelists, there's a spat on the bench for Solo. He needs to find a bow on the carousel. He found the perfect item he wanted in the first carousel, that rod to build that locket, and now has a chance to find... Oh no, Dika Sparta is hearing the broadcast, and he's trying to grief poor Solo Gassan. He's just trying to get six Duelists online, trying to win streak stage three. Is that so much to ask for? Apparently so. <laughs> so, Solo Gasong really going to be hoping for the Wolves to bail him out, maybe continuing to take a couple of L's as he gets to PvE to build up his economy as best he can. Because like you said, all about finding that six Duelist. Yeah, we'll rem uh, the six Duelist will remain to be seen for now. We're heading over to Tropical. Uh, Tropical's admin, because I know Chad are going to ask. Um, at combat start, the team will gain 25 AP for the rest of combat. So, oh, and here we have admin four. Oh, did I miss it? Oh my goodness, I'm terrible at this. One very important thing to note animation for us. is the Jinx 2 in the front line here. This is, I think, the, the key sign of someone that plays AP regularly. They hold down to Jinxes on their rolldowns, not for damage, just for more frontline because of the prankster. I think I've seen a lot of players on stream, top players that don't do so because they just don't really see Jinx as a, a unit that fits in this comp with all the different slots you want for spell slingers and for that trait as well. But a very good pickup there from Tropical, gonna have a lot more frontline because of it. Yeah, pulling double duty in this composition as well. You can see how much her stuns are doing. Being in the front line also gets her mana very quickly. So just becomes an effective, great front line, not just because of Prankster, but because she's just going to stun up everyone else and slow down the amount of damage your team takes. So really good combo. You have sure a shot, board. Yeah. Sure <laughs> you are after this point. 26 HP, 7 loss streak. This is maybe showing the uh, you know the problem with underground now. If you're cashing a little bit too early, you won't find the right cash out. Not enough board power added on. We'll see if this early Aphelios and the Senate two can do enough to stabilize the Portuguese player from from here on out. That was a level four underground cash out, I believe. I believe so. Yeah, with the with the Orn item, I think it, it is level four, and with the loss he had, especially since since the very beginning with the underground heart. Yeah. Fascinated here actually to see um, Purple Aphelios here. We haven't seen the uh, stun for a while. Primarily, it's been about the Dusk Wave, it's been about the Onslaught to get either the AoE or single target damage. But with that Shojin, it just means a lot of CC going to be coming out from that Aphelios. Uh oh. It's a bad sign here for Sparta to continue 
losing at this point down to 19 HP. He did face the strongest player in the lobby right after where he was supposed to actually stabilize it and spike with a cash out. So we'll see what these next two fights have uh, in store for him after these Wolves. If he loses one more, he will be you know at a, at a place where he can lose one fight and be out of it. Yeah, ideally, after being in the underground for so long, you are going to want to start winning, but it looks like his eyes are still adjusting to the light after the darkness. If we don't start seeing wins now, then it could be pretty disastrous. Yeah, headed back to Sage's board, of course. Talked about him earlier on in the game. Metabolic Accelerator start, allowing him to save a ton of HP. We can see him second on the leaderboards four game win streak at the moment and has that level up in his pocket but doesn't seem to have found a full composition yet sitting on that four spell slinger at least for the time being it's a good place to be though leblanc too already found a new noble very early on as you mentioned before thanks to that level up and this is a comp that spikes very hard at level seven once you hit your two-star annie two-star leblanc you fully itemize leblanc and then has a period until really level nine if you're able to go for that, for that fast nine that it doesn't hit another power spike. But when you get there, you get the Nunu 2 online, you get Syndra 2, you can throw in legendaries. And this is a comp that can win lobbies if you get to that point and level up will surely help. Yeah, the level up here is great. The only thing is just that front lane is unfortunately still one star. Like, yes, we've got our two star carries in the back lane, but uh, just lacking that little bit of front lane to stop the absolute onslaught from the enemy board here. We see Sweller's board. We checked in on him at the beginning of the game, saw that scoped weapons, knew it was a Jax angle, and it seems to be going pretty well for him. He's gotten some items on the Jax, a fairly strong board, not able to beat Sages, but going to save him quite a bit of HP as he takes those losses. Sage might be looking for Contagious Laughter on the left there on the five cost slot, or maybe just, hey, I can't get anything related to the uh, LeBlanc, so it has to be, in this case, Soraka. But you don't really have the, the items or the, the current plan to build onto Soraka as a carry augment. You'd rather prefer more of the Infuse that we saw last game. Oh, you roll one more time. You don't find the Nunu, but you do find the Infuse. Is that going to be good enough here for Sage? Looks like it will. Yeah, the Soraka has, a, has been a unit that certainly in the last game was a bit of a kiss of death for three of our players. Everyone was trying to get that two-star, and unfortunately no one made it. Hopefully this game, Sage is able to find what he needs. I do want to point out for Sweller Tiger, he was running wise spending. So as he rolls, he will get that experience as well. So going to save him a little bit of trouble while hunting for that Jax. Meanwhile, on the other side, we're checking back in with Tropical, who's been going that Gadgetine set build we've seen so much about, about uh, and is going double AP admin, 25 AP on both of his choices. So very strong AP backline in that Zoe. There is one slight issue with the current game plan for Tropical we saw there. He had a Warmogs built onto Set. This is a big no-no. Anyone that you know is, is trying to play for Mecha learned this, I think, in the Mecha meta a, a few patches ago. You don't want to give more health to a mech because he's already getting so much health from the mech trait itself. Instead, you want to build resistances. Things like Declaw, things like Bramble, for example, to allow your set to live much longer. Sometimes you're forced to build Warmonk for tempo and then you pivot into Gadgetine Crest later on. So it's not that Tropic was a bad player. It's just it's going to be less than ideal coming into the, the late game, stage five especially. And I just say I'm really excited for what Swaler Tiger is putting out here. Uh, we said on day one multiple times, oh, we want to see that big Jax Brawler board. He's got the three-star ribbon. He's one off the three-star Jax. This, this has the potential to go really far if our other games today and yesterday are anything to go off of. Yeah, and just eyeballing his board, sure, it looks kind of bad. You see the five loss streak, though, plus the wise spending plus shiny is going to do a lot for his economy as he goes later into the game so even though he's stuck digging for gold he's going to dredge some up he's going to get experience at the same time so his spot is not as drastically bad as it may look at first glance fiddle belt still on the carousel anyone that wants to slot in another legendary that's a very good option especially if it gets you closer to finding a fiddle two star Huge upgrade. One star, it's great, of course, fantastic. But the two star, especially itemized, is when you really start angling towards almost guaranteed top four from the power it brings to the table. Yeah, Sage really excited to get his hands on the fiddle, but unfortunately, even with that metabolic accelerator, not fast enough 
to take it out of the clutches of Stinky Boozer. Rain gaps we haven't really taken a look at before, but we're going to see that Kaisa 3 picked up for this recon board. So looking to be a strong contender, even though he's at the bottom of the field for the time being, he's going to just get stronger from here. And of course, having the 544 hero augments offered at 42 is less than ideal for recon players. They don't really have anything that fits their initial comp. Forced to essentially just slot in the fiddlesticks in this case with support augment and just hope that this Kaisa can last at least for two more rounds so you have a chance at finding a bow off of the next PvE round and slamming the ship. Yeah. I will say though, the fiddlesticks support augment is kind of gross. Fiddlesticks gives you 30 AP but also shares those corrupted souls, so you're getting buckets of AP every single time an ally dies. So it's Admin Darkstar on absolute steroids. And you can see the effect as Kaisa's fourth auto to proc her passive was doing so much damage. That is, uh, that's a nice swaller with the three star jacks that I was kind of trying to manifest for him. Um, so I'm very excited now in the back lane, itemized beautifully. This is gonna be one shreddy boy. Anyone of our, you know, chatters just trying to blast away oh there's no rfc on the jacks there is scope weapons though which you know does a lot in terms of the attack range for jacks it kind of makes it a four item carry instead and it's gonna be a huge spike from swaller who has been losing a lot of fights in the last pretty much all of the stage four as we see up top there now gonna finally i think stabilize and try and win some fights and try and find his way to that top four yeah, look at this, Jax, just completely uncontested there in the back line, swinging away, able to take out Tropical's board fairly easily. And alongside that shiny Urgot, going to allow him to build his economy back up, either push for nine or look for an upgrade for his Urgot, for his Soraka, and give him a little bit more top end for his composition. Yeah, there, there's a. Uh, I'm not the most high ranked TFT player you've ever met in your life, which I think is fairly evident. But one thing that this broadcast has made me want to do is get back into game and play brawlers because they're so fearsome. That's how I feel after every tournament cast. That's where I want to play the most TFT. You learn so much watching the best yeah. players in EMEA go at it, and then you just want to try everything they've been doing and try and match their same success. Someone that is going to need some success is going to be Six Dot coming into stage five. The Greek player is sitting at 17 HP, contesting uh, this AP tree that we see so many other players on as well, including Sage, who's almost at the top of the HP standings. So many items to slam, decisions to make, roles to be had. You have to find a way to stabilize here. Yeah, like you're like you're getting at, this is not a very stable version of this composition. Yeah, you have the Gadgetine, but you don't really have anything behind it. Meanwhile, Solo Gasong's board checked in on him earlier and he was struggling, but now he's picked up that Zed too. He has the six duelist he so desperately needed, but we don't know if it's enough to turn around his fate. Now we've seen in our games this weekend so far that just hitting that two star Z with the six duelist is such a power spike and if you can hack him into the right place in the back lane he can really do some damage. Now unfortunately he's got stuck on this set and the rest of the team are nowhere to be found and oh goodness that team is gonna make light work of the Z. Oh good juke. The That's just deck. like faker level mechanics yeah. Um, oh <laughs> never mind cutsy. <laughs> Not trying enough. to hype up the Zed, next thing you know, the cutscene is playing and Soliga Sang eliminated, not really to our surprise, not because of course his quality as a player, but more how this game went for him playing into Duelist, not able to find that win streak in stage three and really put him in a spot where he just did not have the HP to work with uh, to bleed out into a top four. Instead, it becomes not just a bot four, but an eighth place, unfortunately. Yeah, I called it wrong. It was Ryu level mechanics, my bad. Yeah, that's really, really unfortunate. Like, I saw the Zed and I was like, yes, he's on the back line. He's chewing through the back. He's stuck on the set. No. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's that incredibly hard to tear through, especially with that gadget gene. It's why you run it so much. Even with the suboptimal itemization, as you pointed out, Panda, it, it just still is a nearly unbreakable wall. And more with the with the Soraka perfectly itemized, the Zoe there as well. So overall, I mean, the, the HP buffer and the game plan that, that we have here from Tropical from the very beginning, it was a very good one. So it goes to show that you don't always have to build ideal items. I think it happens a lot when, when you know, someone in chat joins in at the end of the game and sees that, oh, there's just less than ideal item built on a certain unit. Sometimes the tempo of lobbies force players to build what's less than ideal just to stay alive, just to stay up, up to par with the tempo of the lobby. 
Absolutely. We only have our first elimination here early on in stage number five. So let's take a look around the lobby. Stinky Abuser has been at the top of the leaderboard this entire game. Went deep into stage three, still had HP in the low 90s, high 80s, and has developed this into a threat-focused board looking perhaps for that Belveth 3 to carry him to a late game victory. Oh, a Belveth 3 would certainly be something very exciting to add to the docket of the weekend so far. I always love seeing her and it's so rare that you see it because this is a unit that's often contested and had multiple emblems slapped on across all boards. So I would really love to see that. The Jack's trying to do his thing at the very back there. Both the Riven 3 and the Jax 3 are online for Sweller. He's been fairly stable ever since that disastrous stage 4. Is now sitting above that 20 HP mark and looks like he's going to be winning this fight as well. Eliminating the Greek player's 6 thought in the process. Only 6 players now remain. And 2 Polish players are at the very top of the standing. Stinky Abuser and Sage still dominating the lobby. Sage out of gas has no gold on a three loss streak and that is not enough economy to get him through the later stages of the game with that level up you want to hit level nine you want to be able to roll for a stronger higher capped board and sage just did not get that opportunity Unfortunately, yeah, the HP on our players is starting to even out somewhat and not being able to pick up at this stage is kind of a death sentence We'll see now. Digga Sparta can continue his streak. He's the underground player we talked about having to make that, that huge pivot in stage four, had to stabilize, has done so. As you know, the, what we were asking for Amazia at the very beginning of this game, seeing more of Samir, seeing more of this capped out board that allows you to go level nine. And we're seeing it happen here with a, a level two or two star Felios, two star Samira, two star Sejuani, uh, just really just hoping to slot in some more legendaries um, as we go on through this game. And uniquely as well, look at his augments. With the underground heart, he's able to keep underground in for the entire game, giving him a secondary economic engine to let him push for this level 9. And with his win streak, he's going to be able to dig real deep for his board. Now this is the real test. Can this set stand up and put up a fight against these sure shots that are able to scale their AD all throughout this fight? Is Soraka going to do it? Is AP going to finally trump AD in this case, I think not, and it's it's really not a big surprise. It is a level nine board and a really high capped AD board for Duga Sparta here as well. Yeah, I think the choice to go onslaught there for the Aphelios was one of those difference makers. We see the oh, problem. Ergot. Oh, Ergot making the difference there for brain gap. Ergot gapped. Back two, not going to be enough, I don't think. Yeah, uh, Brain Gap is not a player that we have checked in in a little bit. And yeah, we've got the three-star Kaisa, we've got the three-star Cholgath. We have all the makings of the composition that we've seen do so well today. And yet something is just sort of missing here. I think it's the Shoujin on the Kaisa. We talked about BIS items. This is an, a, a unit that you are putting all your eggs in that basket. If the items are not BIS, that could become a problem coming into these stage five, almost stage six fights. Now we see Sage, that board we've talked about with the level up, with the metabolic, a fully itemized Nunu just ripping through the back line. David, you mentioned this earlier on today. Nunu is so good at disrupting this composition because of his natural backline access, but he seems to be going on a world tour and just kind of leaving that Kaisa alone. Gets punished for it, but the Kaisa will fall to the LeBlanc nonetheless, and that will spell brain gapped and Tropicals end of round number five. And a lot of that at the end of the day could be that Warmog that was built on the set, or could just be a lot of other moving pieces in that Gadgeting comp. But in the end, Tropical ends up bought for, despite the very strong early game he had, despite some prophesizing he might even win this game. In the end, not gonna be the case. It will be the two Polish players still at the top, first and second. Italy coming up strong with Slaughter Tiger and also Portugal in the mix. And here comes that cute little Argot trick you uh, <laughs> taught everyone in the audience about, where you can just slot them in, hope for a treasure chest or two on this round on those Zack Blobs. Uh, seems like no luck so far. Yeah, it's Maybe? a well, you can eat crab buffet for the, the Zack round if you've got lots of ergots. Yeah, unfortunately, no luck there.
but going to find another item for one of his carries. You can see how he's utilizing Windfall plus the Underground. He is just digging here, looking for a three-star Samira. And lots of to comment here on the roll down for the Portuguese player. Looking at 3-star Samira, but also holding Belveth despite not playing Belveth. This is because, of course, we saw earlier, Stinky Abuser is trying to go Belveth 3 as his win condition. When you are as strong as this player is, you have to scout and say, can anyone beat me? And if so, how do they do it? In this case, it is if Stinky Abuser finds Belveth 3, he can also contest that first place. This is the Battle of the Belvets. Um, there is... Did he um, take the two-star Belveth? Did anyone catch it? No, still two on the board here for Stinky Abuser. He's two off of that Belveth three in this case, and still has 32 HP to work with, so has a lot they can do here. But Slaughter Tiger's Jax is looking so, so strong. A yeah. massive hit here for Stinky Abuser from first to fourth place in just one fight. I think, I think the final lobby is going to come down to Dig and Sweller Tiger at this point. Both of them have a strong economy behind their boards, uh, both fueled by those massive win streaks. So I feel like Stinky and Sage are just fighting for third and fourth at this point. Sage could not go level 10. Well, level up that is, of course, one of the options, but in the end, opted to stay at 9 to fully stabilize his board. And maybe it'll just be a top 4 in the end. Polish was 1 and 2, now they're both 3rd and 4th because there are players that have hit so much more, that have hit higher cap boards as we saw with Swallow Tiger and with a Portuguese player, Diga Sparta. What the late game is all about. And now that Belveth board, the 3rd and place, 3rd and 4th place battle coming out. So we can see the LeBlanc in the back line for Sage is going to be the name of the game as that Nunu will be focused down by Belveth. No longer going to be a threat after a couple of seconds, but the LeBlanc caught in the middle as Belveth firing away. The stun from Fiddlesticks might be enough to stall. LeBlanc, one ult, looking for two, but cool? Belveth, it's the Omnivamp, oh! David. Almost enough. Syndra, that stun, doing enough to take down Stinky Abuser. This LeBlanc was sitting at one-sixth of her HP the entire fight, and both Belvests were just stuck on the Echo. There was an Echo on both sides. There was a, a, a Dragon Claw on one of them, stopping a lot of damage from both LeBlanc and Soraka. What a fight! Super interesting to see. Very, very close in the end. But the Polish Civil War goes in Sage's direction, unfortunately, for Stinky Abuser. It never ceases to amaze me to see people's creativity with Belveth and what they end up doing with her as a unit. That was, uh, that was closer than I thought it was going to be, and really good watch. Well played for Stinky there. Sage's board taking one victory, but David coming up against this Jax board from Sweller. I don't know if it'll be enough. Nunu up in the air. The first big fortress, the first big wall of HP is going to be that Riven 3 with Redemption. Still alive, still applying that Sunfire Jax. Now finally onto the fiddle and slowly moving towards that backline, towards those AP casters, but still stuck now on the Nunu. Trying to, again, break through the Mordekaiser. One last Skylands will come through. Won't kill the Jax. So much HP to work with. But LeBlanc, I think, might do the job. Especially with Ooh. Talia's health. AP caster versus AP caster. But Talia wins out in the end. Swether Tiger, the Italian player, ends up third. Uh, Not too proud to admit when I'm wrong. <laughs> the Jax was an unstoppable force for so long. and managed to get Sweller so far through this game. Um, but nothing a LeBlanc couldn't take on in the end, I guess. Yeah, the 2-1 committal, though, from Sweller Tiger, going to be able to secure him that third place. Remember, these top two, top three spots are what all of these players need to make their way to day three. Rolling, trying to find the Samir 3, trying to lock in the win, but Naz doesn't find it just yet. Having to sell off the last few units, now doesn't even have enough gold to do so unless he sells a second unit on his board to try and find it. Still has some HP to work with, though. Can maybe just lose still one fight? and still have a little bit more of a chance to, to win out or just win out entirely because he has a very cracked board, to be honest. It's going to come down to this fight here. If he's able to win it, there's time left to dig for that Samira 3. As Sage's LeBlanc, the last hope here for his army. Samira getting assaulted by the Nunu, but Nunu runs away quickly. And that's going to leave the Samira time to fire away with the Collector. Ooh. The Onslaught from Aphelios doing so much damage, but the backline of Sage completely uncontested the entire round. Nunu finally getting focused by that Aphelios, who will take down the Nunu, but LeBlanc uncontested, still alive. Dig will take that loss you were talking about, David, down to just 2 HP. 
Two H being a dream, you have a chance to roll. You have a chance to sell even more of your board if you think you're going to lose and just try and try and find this Amira three. But a four cost three star is not the same thing as a five cost three star. It's not an auto win uh, unit, so that's maybe a bit too risky of a play. We'll see if the positioning can change here. Samira was killed off in the middle of that fight off of those Talia ults. If somehow Sparta finds a way to get this Samira a little bit safer, it could turn the tide in this next fight. Yeah, you can see him doing the frantic last minute positioning. Will this be enough? Let's find out as we move into what could be our final round. Keep an eye on this Nunu. It's shown fight and fight again to be a crucial part of Sage's composition. It's not just the LeBlanc. As you can see, Aphelios taking huge damage. The Hand of Justice keeping him alive for now. And Nunu rolling and rolling a little bit, ignoring the back line as the Samira is going to be able to take him down. One more ult from Samira should clear out most of that back line. The onslaught comes out. LeBlanc taken down. Sage will not follow, but that gives Dig one more more round to hunt for that Samira and underground gold on the back of it. And he can, you know, double up on this PV round to find some interest gold as well. Maybe find some more gold off of these orbs, off of the Urgot, and try and find this last Samira. We talked about it. The positioning changed completely there. Samira was alive until the very end. Talia was not able to snipe off either Samira or Aphelios, and that allowed the fight win to go in favor of the Portuguese player. Yeah, just as I was ready to write off Digass there, he only went and kept that Samira safe right until the end. This this is proper down to the wire. This is why I love games five and six here at the Golden Spatula Cup. Yep. There is the chance for this to cap out the boards, the items. Each player has open item slots on one of their frontliners. So 30 gold to work with, holding all these four cost pairs, trying to find that last Samira. A few more rolls. Also a chance for Sage to hold Samir's if he finds them on his roll down to make it even less likely to find it. Echo 2 is a good upgrade, maybe not exactly what you were looking for, still gonna be good enough to include onto this board. But that means that no Samira has been found. It all comes down to positioning. Yeah, very yeah, I was really hoping for it. Very interesting to note that Sage has picked up the Zephyr and seems to have it in position for the anticipation of a Samira switch here, which has not happened. Yeah, won't actually grab anyone of importance. That Sivir going to get knocked up instead. Nunu onto the back lines this time, runs away before doing any significant damage and will start getting focused down by the Aphelios. Completely safe, uncontested in the back line with the Onslaught flying out. Samira needs one more ult, but shut down by that Nunu. It's all up to Aphelios oh. here for Dig. The long run of Underground is still alive for the moment. But the dream will die, and Sage takes first place in round number five. So close to finding Samira three, three or four rounds donkey rolling. There weren't any Samiras being held by Sage, so still pretty good odds to finding that last unit. Couldn't do it in time, ends up having to settle for a second. And Sage, from the very beginning with Metabolic Accelerator, would level up. I mentioned how strong this combo would be, how comfortable he looked to go nine and cap out his board with AP, with Syndra's, with Nunu's. And we saw exactly that occur. Sage, I think, gets a very deserved first place. Really happy to see him finding success. I think set six, when I saw Ultra Liga, I was so impressed by him. He was still a young player. And still now, two sets later, popping off in the NBA. Yeah, that game was an absolute joy to watch. It was so back and forth. Every time I was like, this is the final round. There's no way. There's no way. We did that three more times. <laughs> There's so much going on. Yeah, unfortunately not able to see that finally capped underground board. It's so rare we get to see underground go into the later stages of the game. We saw the effect of the economy, but just one Samira off for something like five or six rounds. Hopefully we finally get to see that juicy, juicy three star here on day number two. We've got one round left to go and one break, one interview in the intervening time. And that interview will be with Snooty Boo. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Okay, so my name is Balu Antares Moroni, I'm 28, and I was originally born in Germany, 
Uh, but I'm currently living in Spain since pretty much uh, since I was five, and I'm more known as Snooty Boy in the gaming community. Okay, so the the thing that I enjoyed the most about this uh, this set is that I actually think they got the grasp on the hero augments. They've been getting much better at that. And the first month I was pretty much playing nonstop, like 12, 14 hours. So I'm really enjoying it. Usually when we're uh, almost at the bit set, I'm kind of tired of it, but I'm still in the mood of gaming eight, 10 hours a day. So I'm really loving it. So TRC is definitely have to be important because like the reference we have in, in Europe is uh, France and their system revolves around their, their national competitions, their TRCs, right? And they've always been a step ahead and they've kicked their ass forever. So I think that Spain is actually catching up is really important. Myself, I've always been good at ladder but struggling with these tournaments. And now that I've been playing these much more often, I think it's getting better. Oh, so I've been competing in pretty much all the Rising Legends competitions ever since it existed and even before it was called Rising Legends. But I think uh, this, uh, this year has been my best performance so far a GSC one where I got 10th. I think I could have done a bit, bit better, but that was still pretty nice for me because I actually get a, a real shot to get to the European Championship, which is pretty much my dream ever since I competed. So that's pretty nice. Of course, everybody who supports me every day, thank you very much for the for the cheers every day. And everybody who's enjoying TFT, keep on doing that. Uh, this is an awesome game. We're going in the right direction. Have a nice uh, day and uh, thanks for watching. Welcome back everyone, we are on the brink of heading into our final game today where we will cut away half of our players and then the remaining half will move on to day three to battle for the title of Golden Spatula Cup number two champion. We are almost getting ready for that last game to start but before we do, we know, we know a big part of that last game was the undergrounds coming in from the very beginning. Tell us a little bit about how big of an impact they had in game five. We, we kind of saw how was players when I were able to go deep. We had the underground hard in combination with the windfall from Diga Spada here. He knew exactly that he had to go very deep on some massive roll downs and then just utilizing that extra goal to get those items put to work. I mean, we saw the underground heart really you know, having a huge impact on the game. As was noted in the cast, it let the underground stay in play for the whole lobby through. As we, as we do come into our final lobby, then, you know. One thing I want to take from you is, do you think we're going to be seeing more of, you know, if the players get opportunity at least, more players going deep into underground to try and get that one last big win? Yes, and I think another thing that's worth noting here, Sage had the metabolic combination that David talked a little bit about, and allowed him, he had a very early underground four, and he was able to navigate that. It looked a little dicey at one point where he had to drop below 10 HP, but he was just a little bit too strong at the end of the day for the board that Digaspotter managed to put together. He was on a 12 win streak or something ridiculous like that, got to the 19 HP breakpoint, and just kept on winning. But why spending, Peter? An augment that oh, you yeah. notice we hadn't seen a lot of today, but you see it in picture right here from Swallow Tiger's position. 
Yeah, and the Brawlers did pretty damn well. I mean, ultimately taking a third place. Again, like we saw with the Brawlers before, I think, you know, to notice that some of these compositions, they're very, very good, but they don't have the same ability to completely bust through to these obscene level power boards like we saw in this lobby. I think, you know, with the Underground being in play, there was always going to be a very, very high cap on what these final boards could look like. Yeah, and that's the thing when you have two players that just are able to go deep in the underground tree and not get punished for it. The entire power level up the lobby. When you combine that with the level up and other prismatic augments that are just going to help you further your game plan, then that is going to cost you at the end of the day. That's going to mean that the entire lobby will just be playing catch up when they spike. So, you know, again, we've got eyes so much on the final part of the day, and we're going to look at every single standing. Well, you know, my heart breaks because. This is the bottom of the table right now. The UK came into this today with so many hopes and dreams, and so many of those hopes and dreams are right at the bottom. Oh my gosh, what a world. They have been, quite frankly, shattered, I think it's safe to say, but again, it is a positive development for UK to have this many players, and Lalana still on the brinks here, a good result in that final game of top three. And he could find himself at least get, securing you some UK representation into the day three. Same thing goes for Dasic, also at that 22 point breakdown right now. So a lot of things to keep in mind when these final lobbies are going to be put into play, because everyone on this screen, bar Solo Gasan, can make it into the final day. Yes, as we move further forward, we'll see the players who are looking to try and keep that spot on the top. Of course, Parlapol, noted wet jungler, of course, noted so well, noted ranked player coming in and doing very well this tournament. A lot of jungle players again are being spread between, but we do even see Org managing to hold on as well as we move to the final one. And why these faces at the top look a little familiar. And this is actually very familiar, right? You think back to Golden Spatula Cup number one. Kevin, Kevin Parker, and Snooty Boo all made it to day three. And they are pretty much already locked in for that. So back-to-back -back day three appearances in a Golden Spatula Cup system is something that not a lot of players are able to manage. All right, we're just about to get our last game started. So gonna, if any of our players are listening, what words would you tell to them now coming into what will be one of the most important games of the tournament? Calm yourself down a little bit, think clear, look around the lobby, don't go no scout, no pivot, just figure out what you want to do, what you need to do to secure your placement, because everyone is going to go into this game with a different goal. For some people it'll be top two, for some people it'll be top three and top four, but if you not have to play for first, just play it safe. All right, we've got our casters ready to go, our final game of day two. We will find out by the end of all this who will be traveling to day three. Casters, please take us in to game six. Thank you, Counterfeit. We are here on the caster desk, ready to go for the final game of the day. As you said, the elimination round. My name's Iberia, and I am joined here once again. Couldn't be happier to be either, let me let you know. By Impetuous Panda and Maisie Marzipan. Guys, this is the final game of the day. We've seen some banger play so far, and we're going to be looking at lobby number five, which is all of the players that just need to get over that edge. We have the list of players. Players. David, I want you to start it off. Is there a player in here you're really looking forward to seeing turn up the heat a little in their final game of the day? I mean, it's a very, very easy answer. I think that player has to be Dasic, someone that we saw going to the World Championship in Dragonland, someone that is considered by pretty much every top, top player to be among the, the five historically best players in the MEA. And now he's in a position where he has to actually perform. He has to feel the pressure on this day two. He wants to make it to day three, accumulate those points, those GSC points, to try and make it to regionals and, and run it back and go once again to World Championships representing EMEA. Mm. Uh, Dysik, of course, um, is someone of huge note here for the reasons you spoke, but you know I'm going to say it. You know I have to say it. Don't jinx, Maisie, don't do it. You have a chance now to not cast or curse the player you're, you're thinking about right now. Think think closely what you want to uh, do here. Yes, do you want to say his name? <laughs> uh, of course, Brain Gapped. Brain there Gapped, someone that we have followed Woo. through three or potentially even four games today. This is someone we have got to follow very intensely. And as such, we should be invested in his story. Did I do good? You did good. The, Brit the British viewers rejoiced. They all jumped out of their chairs, uh, cheering for the caster curse not coming through. As we all know, it exists for sure in TFT. <laughs> Man, you're making me overthink this, David. I wanted to let it drop now. 
but I can't. I gotta, I gotta deliver the content to the viewers. We've been following Tropical all day. We've been following him yesterday, too. He's been doing a great job, doing his country proud. Greece, traditionally underrepresented. Here we see them popping off, and Tropical is the face we've been following for that evolution of that TFT play, of that group of players. One player to, I think, make note of here is uh, Tyrok, a Polish player that I think is one of the, the less spoken about Polish players that has made it to this day too. Among the eight players that have qualified, I think he's a player that I know less about and I've seen compete less at the very high end of ladder and in Ultra Liga as well. But if he's here, it's for a reason. I think he's ready to show us why that might be. He needs to find, again, a top four placement for pretty much all these players. For some of them, as we mentioned, sometimes even more than that, maybe a top two or maybe a first place required. Yeah, this is always so fascinating when we get these lobbies at the end of the day because we're not just looking at the top lobby to see who wins overall. These are people in the trenches. These are people fighting. Every single unit placed on their board is hopefully done with all of the thought and intention of someone fighting to survive. And for me, that is always very entertaining. Ooh. Let's go! Justice Punch, baby! I love this augment. It turns Galio into a carry. It turns him into either an incredibly strong frontliner in the later stages of the game, or even a damage source. I've seen Kurum play it full damage. I've played it myself pretty defensively with a Yumi composition. As you've brought up, Panda, it's always about the frontline with Yumi comps. But I've also talked to some of our pro players like Norum, who says you should play it with something like a Lulu carry, and I I am thrilled to see it played in the final game of the day. Could not be more excited. I don't want to deflate uh, the rest of what will happen in I'll this game. Oh, do it to me, David! But I have to say, no, no, not about Gally. I think that's a perfect pickup. It's more about the decision that was made here. I think this stage 2-1 hero augment pickup is by far and away the most important decision our players will make this game. This is simply how hero augments work. The direction you choose, especially if uncontested, can almost certainly decide if you have an angle towards top four or bot four with how strong certain angles are and how weak some angles are if you are contested on them. So very curious to see what the pickups are for all of our players. Well, I think that's why it's such a cool line to go. Nobody wants to play Galio. Literally nobody wants to play Galio. He's not going to be contested. He's going to be rolling you know, for one. Four justice punches. <laughs> <laughs> just Galio. Four justice just punches. Rolling we get, out. <laughs> yeah, we get we the support augment. I, I, oh. I doubt we're going to see Galios across the board. I was about to say one player that we have had flagged to us by Wita himself is Dysik, who looks to be committing to a Lux comp. Yeah. Illuminating Singularity is absolutely disgusting, has been for a couple of patches. One of the most successful one-cost carry augments. I want to say most successful, but I'm leaving room because of Reign of Anger's rise to prominence recently. Stat-wise, it is one of the best. That is true. But I've been prepping a little bit with Spanish players with Gunmay and Snooty. Gunmay told me he never chooses his augment because of... <laughs> How tilting it can be, despite the stats, sometimes Lux decides to ult in places she should not be ulting oh, and yeah. end up losing games because of it. So, basic putting a lot of eggs into the RNG basket potentially with the way Lux's ult works, despite the, the direction and the augment overall being very strong stat-wise. Especially if she casts while someone's moving, that's tilted me more than once. I love the Lux, Lux reroll comp, but every time that happens, I'm just like, if I had hair, it'd be gone. I do have some good news. Not a single player has doubled up on the augments, aside from Brain Gapped and Dan Styles both both picking up Annie's Burning Spirit, but it's not necessarily an Annie reroll comp, so that yeah. I think is completely fine. Yeah, this is a good spread of augments across all our players here. I, for one, would like to see a good clean game where we don't all cannibalize each other, but uh, that's not been the case today for sure. Backline's going to cause some problems here. Dan Styles coming out with an admin composition. Early burning spirit in the front line. LeBlanc already in the back. Should be looking at a win streak from this position, even though he's taken a loss already. For the viewers that don't know, we actually have a form that players fill out, and there's a section for fun facts. And actually, uh, one of these players has a fun fact that will be very fun for this game. Von Herker, the player that we just mentioned, is a player that's played so many games this set. His fun fact is every game is a Draven game. Can you guess, Niberia, what augment he has picked up for this extremely important game six in day two? 
Uh, could it be League of Draven? That is correct, Nibiria. You win uh, some brownie points. I'll, I'll bake those for you at some point in our lives. Oh, I'm so excited. I, I've seen your Twitter. I know you can cook. I love the camaraderie going on here. But speaking of winning, we do have a contest today. If you want to head over to our Twitter at TFT Esports EMEA, you could win 10 Little Legends eggs. If you get in by the end of the game and tell us who you think will win and why in a way you way. And that's a Draven too as well. The caster blessings come through. We just talked about it on Carousel. You check the admin. There are, I think, a few different ways you can play Draven Riedel, of course, with supers, with defenders, and also with kind of a mixed match, throwing in admins as well. Shame the Draven wasn't an admin. That uh, AD one would have come in quite handy. Uh, but you're not going to want to bet on a spat, and you probably don't want to waste that slot. We've seen some interesting builds for Draven so far this weekend. Uh, the Titans Resolve, i.e. Last Whisper, was the most successful. But we did see the other game, an Anima Visage Draven. So, looking forward to the possibilities here from Von Derker. Yeah, with Von Derker, he has, uh, you know... We've said that this is his playstyle to go for the Draven, although Draven today has been somewhat of a kiss of death. I would love to see Van Herker not fall into the trap that the rest of us have seen, whereby we get late game and we still don't have that Draven 3. Heads up play here by uh, our Draven player going for a win streak angle, but if possible in stage two, the Draven 2 upgrade is going to be massive for that because you want to farm this gold, you need kills to do so. And this board is looking really strong. The Econ not so great, but Belveth found very early on. Another great unit at getting kills pretty much at every stage of the game, including stage two. And that'll be so much gold generated for this player who, despite the low Econ now, can build this back up going into his potential 4-1 rolldown. We've got an update as well from our lovely Observer. This is going to be the 25 mana for the team on uh, round start. So that is going to be a fairly useful admin as we go deeper into the game. But for the time being, like you said, Belveth really covers a lot of edge cases at stage two. I think he's going to be safe with or without the admin. Talking about edge cases, Edge Lord picked up for Klemu, who is currently loose streaking has both talents on the bench to guarantee the loss in this final fight of stage two. So purposely playing down a hero augment and hero augments we know have pretty much the power of a prismatic augment with how Mort has explained, you know, the power that a one cost hero augment especially give to your comp overall. Moving into stage three, we'll see if Klamu can stabilize. 63 HP is not the best place to be going into Krugs. No one, we Wait. see the gold getting lower and lower as Klamu is rolling down there. But on a five loss streak, this could just be similar to strats that we've seen the rest of the weekend, whereby folk are quite happy to take that loss streak because they know they can bring it back. I also, I have to ask Maisie, have you ever had the joy of, oh, we just see the Luxalt trolling. This is what you're talking about, David. But have you had the joy of playing an Edgelord composition? It is like one of my favorite comps by far. It's so fun. I actually have not. It is really disgusting once you get your damage going. Gunblade is, I believe, the most important item in there because it can finally uh, keep your talent alive. Without it, he really struggles. But even into the mid-late game, he will still be one-shotting units in the back line. It is just a Viego composition without having to wait, and that's joyous for me. That's kind of gross. Oh, yeah. It's, it's nasty, it's disgusting, it's awful, but I love it. The rolls are coming through here. One very important thing to note is depending what hero armor you pick, if it's a one cost or a two cost reroll, sometimes staggering your rolls into a, a not so natural round for rolling might be better because more of those units will be pulled out from the pool, especially if you're not playing something contested like supers. If more of those two costs are, are pulled out of the pool, you might have a higher chance of hitting your two cost unit. Similar here with Lux reroll, for example, for ASIC. Yep, really good point there. And we're taking a look here at Lilana's board for the first time. We do see that frontline fencing on the recently buffed Fiora. Interested to see how well this does. We pointed out earlier on yesterday that this augment has been performing better, but we're not quite sure how it's going to shake out in these high-level lobbies. So now Lilana giving us the chance to find out. Oh, but it does seem that this dirty Talon you've told me about is just going to be causing some chaos and destruction. So, Lilana, not quite ready to stand up to that. Uh, we also got word from our lovely Observer Danny that Clemon's second admin is also that on combat start, his team will gain 25 mana. 
Thrill of the Hunt, fantastic for talent comps, reveal comps as well. Easy pick up there, almost instant pick up for Clemu. Dasik has a very important decision to make here. He's sitting at the very bottom of the HP standings. I don't believe he's too close to that Lux 3 yet. Has to find a way to stabilize with this Augment especially. He can't pick an Augment that greeds even, even more. He needs, I think, immediate power strength on the board right now. Sitting with only four copies of Lux, this is not oh. an ideal place to be. Yeah, absolutely brutal. You really need those Luxes coming in early. It's a stacking augment, so I really like uh, the makeshift armor here to stall a little bit more time for Lux. She really just needs multiple casts. I personally prefer the Shojin to the blue buff um, because even if you're not getting the kills, you can get those scaling casts until you are. So this is really betting on the later stages of the fight going well for Dasik. Tropical playing Unrelenting Force Vi. I think an augment that was slept on at the start of the set has become more sure. and more prevalent in higher metas and just high level competition in general. We saw it a lot in the NA tournament last weekend and we're seeing why only a single item, but her health is just literally not going down. It doesn't help that Lux is also just uh, not really hitting her with, with her ult until this very last moment, but prep and underground and potentially supers as well. It might be a really explosive comp if Tropical can assemble all of these three star units. Yeah, I love that you're telling me that Illuminating Singularity is this wonderful, like, top-tier augment. I think 2-1 hero augments are maybe where I'm at my weakest point in my knowledge because I'm just rubbish with all of them equally. Um, but for Dysik to put his hands, uh, his, yeah, his fate in the hands of Lady Luck with these Lux outs that go kind of anywhere they want, it's, it's kind of nail-biting to watch, really. Yeah, he's not too happy with the results so far. Hasn't naturaled many Luxes. Didn't, I believe, didn't roll down fully on that level four mark. So really hasn't found the chance to find any of the Luxes that he needs to get this composition off the ground. You cannot sit on a Lux two for this comp to work. He does actually have not just four Luxes, but six Luxes because he has a duplicator and uh, the orb, of course, still uncashed out. So closer than he looks, but still, yeah, at some point has to roll down and has to get fortunate. Usually with one cost rerolls, you want to roll down a little four right after Krugs when you're at eight out of ten before going to five. Uh, but sometimes if you don't feel you're in a good enough spot, if you don't have enough natural rolls, you just want to wait and assemble enough gold where it's almost guaranteed that when you do finally roll down, you will hit. Because if you roll down all your gold and you miss, it's pretty much game over. And in a game six of a day two, that's not where you want to be. Looking at the top of the board, Von Herker looking at a full 100 HP win streak coming into the next round, 3-5. If he can keep this up all the way past Wolves, he is in a near guaranteed position to get that top four placement. Yeah, um, for today, at least our longest reigning win streak from the start of the game took us all the way up until stage three, six. So Von Tarker very much in the position that that could be something that we see broken. And you're thinking, you know, he's wind streaking. That's great. His HP is great, but he must be using a lot of that gold to maintain his wind streaks and be kind of, kind of, kind of weak. He'll fall off eventually. But his hero augment gives him more gold and it benefits off of killing and off of dominating the lobby, which he's doing. So already from this spot, I will, I will put my, my pride on the line and say this is a guaranteed top four for Van Herker. I think he will probably make it to day three off of simply playing the comp he's comfortable on. He knows all the different variations. He knows what to play best. Mm -hmm. And also just having such a good high roll start for it with that early Draven too. Featherweights too, really just laying, laying on it. Uh, I'm curious here about Tyroke's use of the Justice Bunch composition. Admittedly, haven't done a ton of homework on it, just asked one or two people, but have never seen a Kale variant. I think you're just building what you can and just playing off of that, that tempo that Justice Bunch gives you. Uh, in this case, you usually do just re-roll four mascots and play the same way you would play Yumi, for example, back in the day, that initial Yumi comp with four mascots uh, with the Galio instead. But with the civilian, you can put in a, a Sivir as well, where you get that extra benefit from two and then potentially three civilian going to stage four. Um, I'm, I'm curious to see as well where he takes us exactly. I think he's definitely going for more of a tempo route instead of re-rolling uh, for level five, for example. And it, it might be successful, might not. I'm not super comfortable. Uh, I haven't played too much of this comp, actually. See, I had something really beautiful to follow that up with until you said the words mascot and Yumi and something inside my brain just stepped and I completely <laughs> forgot what I was going to say. My, my brain has been plinked. It's gone. 
It happens, happens to the, to best, the best, of best of us. <laughs> oh, Liberia, our synergy. This is, this oh is one gosh, year in the making. <laughs> Finally, we've jinxed each other on air. This is a, a pivotal moment in our relationship, Liberia. Oh, it's perfect. Can't wait for more. Basic, though, has hit that Lux 3 we were talking about. Absolutely crucial for his composition. And you're going to see just how strong Illuminating Singularity is. Get ready to take it into your solo queue games because she gets so much additional damage as she casts. In case anyone is unfamiliar, every second cast gives her a bonus percentage of damage that her ultimate does. So you can see with the blue buff, with the jeweled gauntlet, once she starts getting kills, she is not going to stop. This is a lot to be in, to be honest, has found now the Lux 3 has three, you know, either very good or, or BIS items onto this Lux as well. Oh, yeah, and his, econ his economy is not in shambles at all. Six, level six, 20 gold here, he can definitely start ranking up. Eventually reach level eight, potentially put in either more Spell Slingers or more Star Gardens to get those casts out more often. The one way to combat the RNG of Lux's ult is simply making her ult more often. That way, overall, the end result will be what you want it to do, and it'll be hitting the units you want that are clumped. 100%. And the sheer damage output that that Lux all does, like even if it's not quite in the right place, like it still spreads out quite far. This is really gross and it's exactly what Dysic needs to keep himself in this game. David, I'm really curious on your read of what Tropical is looking for here because to my eye, it looks like a good old fashioned Ezreal reroll with unrelenting force. But I'm not sure how viable that is if you're hitting supers this late into the game with a one-star Malphite and a one-star GP. You're not sure how viable it is? Okay, Niberia. Oh. I, see, I see you. I see you. Don't worry. I got you. Don't worry. Uh, I think it's actually two routes you can take. There, there was a, a tempo route with Vi just going for Vi 3-star and just playing sure shots in that meta. That's why I think Unrelenting Force really found uh, its place in the meta, where players were already playing a Brawler frontline. They slotted in the Aegis as well from Vi and just played into a tempo, level 8, level 9 board. Other cases, of course, re-rolling and playing the same way you would play Rising Spell Force with Ezreal carry, but instead focusing more on the Vi and still itemizing the carry, the, the Ezreal, as a backline carry. Looks like he will be going for the ladder. Uh, really going to be struggling there. Low on HP, 35. Plenty of money in the bank and a full loss streak going, so may save him for the time being, plus the underground to keep his econ in place. But he's going to take another painful loss here. At least was able to knock out all but three units. Yeah, this might be the time to go. At this point, he might have to be forced to roll down here at 25 HP. Yeah, this this one star super comp just ain't it right now. Although there is oh. plenty of gold. Oh, that's a Vi three. All right, still looking. Able to find the Ezreal as well. This composition actually shaping up way faster than we thought it would. That was it. The second I started saying, "Oh, it's it's just not happening," it starts happening. So that's it. I should just say the opposite, and everything everything works. There we I go. Like him see, get the vibe before rolling down more, just to get that one more two cost out of the pool. Obviously, a very, very minor thing, but still uh, something that also helps out. If you fill your entire bands and you can't pick up the orb, and it makes things very, very awkward. Thankfully, he was able to hit a few more upgrades and clear that out. And now, has to decide what items to slam. It could just be a gargoyle onto this Fi, or he could just wait and try and get a, even more BIS on this next carousel. BT, maybe even. Earlier on with this composition's lifespan, we saw BT as a pretty common item with Unrelenting Force because that Vi does so much damage. We'll have to see. Yeah, here is that uh, very potent talent that I've uh, that I've been wanting to keep an eye out for. And sure enough, even when these units are three star, Talon doesn't care. Talon's just having him for breakfast. There's a Power very important Lord. Part of this fight where Vi went to punch a Talon and the Talon just, I'm like, he's like, I'm out. And he just jumped to the other side of the board to dodge the Vi damage altogether. This is showing why Unrelenting Force is so strong, but in the end, potentially not slamming a third item here equals yet another loss for Tropical in this case. Could be part of the plan. Obviously, getting some more loose streak gold here, hoping to, once he finally hits everything and slams all his items, we'll have a stable win streak, but cutting it very, very close here on game six. Yeah. He can eat one more. He's not going to die if he loses here, uh, so he would eat one more loss, but he is going to slam the BT. I like this play. Obviously, the Vi was the only one left standing. There's a reason for that. Gives you a little bit of a defense against losing your primary carry. Gives you a secondary carry alongside a very strong tank, similar to something like a Gadgetine set. Yeah, 
I'm seeing the ash on the board. I'm seeing the gold available and it I think Tropical might be thinking if I can just get through this one fight, I'll level and put in two recon. Do you think that's enough to save him? Could just be a, a vein, yeah, for Duelist and Recon for the Ezreal. In this case, Von, Von Herger would have been very happy to get this win and maybe even eliminate Tropical because he is the player contesting all these super units, as is a Draven player in the end. We saw the Malphites and the Lee Sins on the bench. Uh, but what Von is Herger's this, still... Fiora? <laughs> this is the new buff, Niberia. Welcome to the world of Fiora. She does not plan to die anytime <laughs> soon. <laughs> What's going on? LeBlanc, you got us? Oh no, LeBlanc. Oh, oh, okay. oh. That would have been so embarrassing. I would have never picked up a LeBlanc from my shop ever again if he was not able to get that win. So close. That is a terrifying Fiora. Getting the Death's Dance as well, that is just the perfect item for that frontline fencing Fiora carry. Not even a three-star. I will point out, picking up that Fiora, I'm not sure if that's the very last one he needed or second to last, but it's definitely one of the two. That, that, that Fiora, was, she, was just, she was just going for it. Uh, I'm very interested to see some more of the Lana's board and what the story is that has led to such a ferocious fencing lady. I think mostly everyone has hit the comp they wanted to hit starting off at 2-1. Most players have hit their 3-star carries already. In case you're seeing Lalana play a 4 Ox versus 4 Duelist board, not a board you see very often, usually you lean one way or another into 6 Duelists or into just fully Ox Force with Diego and the Renegades instead. I do like this though. I'm going to make my case for why. The additional Ox Force gives you additional attack speed, a little bit more time, a little bit more attack speed to keep yourself alive with the inherent tankiness of the Titan's Resolve, Bloodthirster, and Death's Dance. It really lets your Fiora become a one-woman army. No. The Lana... <laughs> the Lana is someone that I have been on a team with in TFT. And I, I have to say it, but obviously I'm just going to be totally indifferent here. Um, but Lilana is the UK's last hope. There are no UK players that can get through here. So, putting all the coins in the Fiora basket, will that be enough to save Lilana and the UK from getting day two? I really like that delivery, not dramatic at all. The UK actually going to fail as a nation state if Lilana doesn't win. So, uh, all the eggs in the basket. <laughs> no pressure, Lilana. It's just yeah, the no pressure. Don't game worry about United it. Kingdom. The HP totals are really evening out at this point in the game, though. It's just Dan Styles, the Dutch player, who is sitting very comfortably at that first place with 70 HP. But from second place, our Draven reroll player, Von Herker, all the way down to eighth. There isn't really that big of a gap. It's really on to Tropical now to stabilize. And we know he's hit his Vi 3, his Ezreal 3. He's in a good spot to do so, which will make the lobby even closer coming into this stage five. I'm going to look at those HP totals as well, because 19 is where Tropical was when we left him, so he has not taken any losses in the intervening time. Tyro continuing to play the tempo version of Justice Punch, much to my chagrin. A little disappointed, but it's going well for him, so I guess I got to give him that credit. So we see the Leona just absolutely decimate Von Herker's uh, Draven. Still not a Draven 3. The so one-two punch was, was fantastic there. Leona ult starts off, the Justice Punch comes in from the Galio, doesn't allow the Draven to use that Celestial Blessing to get some healing and, and, and kill off a few more units there with that last ult. Um, and biggest thing is Von Herger has not found Draven 3 yet. We're going into stage 5, he's still sitting on Draven 2. He was on 7 copies, I yeah. believe, on his bench. Once he does, and once he hits that Jax 3 as well for the extra HP onto the Draven, things might look very different for his board. God, this Draven 3 has been an incredible bone of contention for today's players. We saw it in game 1, it was the Draven 2. Then we saw, I think it was game 2, there was a Draven 3, no augment. This time, we have the preferred augment. We have a player that knows what they're doing with Draven. We just need to get the Draven 3. Maybe this is the perfect package that we can make Draven shine a Golden Spatula Cup. I think he's playing this perfectly. Uh, you might think, oh, he does not Draven 3 yet, he's doomed, but he has a lot of HP to work with. Still, 37 HP is fairly healthy for where the lobby is. He's second place in the standings. He wants to make sure he can have infinite gold to roll here. We're seeing almost 60 gold to find two more copies of Draven to have a chance to hit sets potentially as well. In this case, it's almost impossible to not hit this Draven 3. There's no one contesting him on the Draven specifically. And was also maybe waiting out for Tropical to die to get these supers back in the pool. Hasn't happened and is now forced to roll and does hit. 
There we go, Draven 3 finally on the board, and we saw on Brain Gap's board for a second threat level maximum coming out as we see from the sidebar. Uh, Ramus 3 has been hit. Coming back to Dasic now has pushed to that level 8 marker. We're going to see exactly how strong League of Draven versus Illuminating Singularity will be. I feel like this exact matchup is one that could be studied from here on forward. We have been talking about this Draven all day, and unfortunately, Lux is the one that puts him down. But David, we can see exactly what you were talking about earlier. We just saw the Lux int like three ults in a row, almost letting the Draven wipe the entire board. But I also mentioned the fact that if you want to solve this problem of variance, you need to have Lux casting more often. And Axiom Arc picked up as the third augment for Dasic will do just that. As long as she gets one kill, she can start chaining these ults repeatedly and have almost this machine gun firing attempt at just winning rounds through sheer quality of ults and not or quantity of ults and not so much quality. <laughs> Which is good for Lux, because she's not doing too hot on that front today. I I'm scared of that looks. Like, I'm going to go to bed tonight. I'm going to close my eyes. And she's going to be like, Minate. And I'm going to, oh, no. <laughs> There's too much Lux. The Shroud here could be big as well. Going to slam it right away onto the Annie. Not going to wait to scout. In the end, Dace is going to be hitting Clemu here. Hitting that Talon. Lux is in the middle. Not going to be hitting by the first or the second ult from Talon. But Talon might not even survive to that point if Lux manages to snipe him before he gets his work done. There's oh. Talon into the Ox Force. Oh, killed mid-jump! Brutal! Oh no, Clemu, I'm so sorry, but that's an 8th place, and you live or you die by the Luxults. In this case, you die and you live for Dacic. Yeah, Tropical's choice working out for him. We saw him slam that Bloodthirster a couple of rounds ago, 19 HP. Five rounds ago, to be precise. Now, heading into a massive win streak at this level 8 position really important to note here that there's no one player that's stuck at the top loads of hp against the lobby this is incredibly close in terms of hp tools for our players tyroke is well one of our polish players trying his best to play for four first shot a tempo board kind of ignoring or avoiding everyone else's place on this lobby which is re-rolling for these very strong one or two cost re-roll we saw fiora we saw lux and draven Ezreal and Vi, in this case, just trying to play a normal game of TFT and hoping it's enough. For now, it does not look like it's going to be the case. Seventh place, seven HP. Completely abandoning his hero augment in favor of getting that four sure shot board online, seeing if he will be rewarded by it against Don Styles' his burning spirit Annie with the LeBlanc in the back. She'll fire away for the time being, but it looks like the four sure shot board was the play as Tyroak keeps himself alive once more. Oh, it's the crazy Fiora going absolutely mental on that Draven. It is enough to keep Lilana in for now. Lilana in the danger zone, as is much of our lobby, honestly. A loss yeah. for Daysick as well in this last fight. We'll see this carousel walking come through. Sure shot crest here can be huge for Tyroak if he wants to get rid of one of his weaker sure shots. It seems like he started a little bit late, took a left turn at the end there, managed to veer <laughs> and drift back into the church shot. Thankfully, no one else playing this comp in this lobby or he might have been in trouble. Basic watching his journey being like, you okay, buddy? You're going the wrong <laughs> way, good? man. Go to the left. <laughs> <laughs> left, left, turn, turn. It was a beautiful loop-de-loop. -loop. This has been a long day. I like to think that Dasic was just showing off his beautiful mouse skills. Yeah, there you go. Is working on his micro as we see Leona too picked up here by Tyroak at the same time as finding that sure shot emblem. Uh, sure shot Leona. Too. It's yeah. time. <laughs> AD Leona, finally we see the composition, the secret tech. The pros have been hiding from us for all of set eight. For Aegis as well, huge counter to the Lux player, to Dasic, also to Dan Styles. Quite a few players going into that AP tree, and this could be just surely purely from the trait, could be a huge counter. Yeah. Crucial as well into this board. Remember, Lux's strength as an AP carry is access to the back line with the four ages you were mentioning, David. That becomes much less scary of a proposition 
massive damage reduction coming out from Tyroke's board. As it tears through the front line, Dasik has built up, even with one star carries, it seems not to matter. Samira goes down, Aphelios unharmed, but Lux unharmed as well, as Leona tries to chew past that front line. One more ult will go wide, the Lux special, as Dasik takes the L. Killed units with the last ult, and I believe is still alive at one HP. In this case, that was literally by a millisecond that that last ult came through and killed that clump that was attacking the Leona at melee range. Yeah, unfortunately, we see day six face cam coming in at the top left of our screen just there, and he did not look too happy. He's got one HP though; it is not over just yet. Dasik has been an incredibly strong player all throughout the season. This is an experienced player. He only needs one HP. Am I right? He faces worth matchup though. Literally four ages we saw there. Normally the Lux is just one shotting everything. In this case, it took several ults to kill the Leona and to kill the Alistar as well. And we'll see if things will be different here for Daysick trying to face off against this Draven board. Where the Draven ends up ulting and where the axe angles occur is gonna be so so crucial. Similarly for this Lux as well. She can chain these ults off of the Axial Mark, it will be massive. And we're seeing this happen here. Two quick ults, the third one coming through. The Draven, I think, can do it. If one more ult comes through and it does. Draven is out, Von Herker is out in sixth place playing his favorite comp, and Dasik is alive at one HP. This might be a top, top four, four, and it is. Oh. Really close rounds coming out across the board. The Unrelenting Four still looking strong here from Tropical, gonna be able to keep himself alive, almost taking down Don Styles. I do want to point out something about that round that was perfect for Dasik. The weakness of specifically the mech board into Lux is she targets randomly. Mech removes two units from the board, two potential targets that could have eaten those ultimates. And the way the mech board happens to work for Draven is those frontliners go down pretty fast and it's just Draven left on the board for a lot of those fights, which we've seen throughout the weekend so far. It's exactly what Dasik needs to get those chain ults from Lux and get that top four finish. Yeah, Draven just consuming an all-you-could-eat Lux alt buffet and uh, yeah, you definitely got his fill there for sure. Topical Final sitting at 20 gold, stacks. level 8, 8 win streak, trying to go maybe level 9, knowing that he doesn't have that much to roll for at level 8. And he's sitting again with, with, the, with the guarantee, the feedback that he has won, been winning for 8 different rounds and has a chance to go 9 and not just get top 4, but maybe win out this entire lobby in this case. Remember, he was, he was 19 HP at the very start of stage 4, so two full yeah. stages basically not losing a single round. Really strong board. Ah, uh, me being me, we did miss the elimination of Lilana, who went out in seventh. I'm just going to have a little moment of silence for Lilana and indeed the entire UK team. Yeah, a little curious what board took him down in the end, but now we're going to see two of... Uh all, actually, all four matchups on the left, you can see Day6 board struggling to survive. On the right, you can see the power of Tropical as he continues to rely on this by frontline. You can see how tanky she is. On the left, Lux going a little bit wide for that Talia and will finally fall. So Daysick taking that top four, but a loss. We'll see who's going to find him in that third or fourth place position. And is top four enough for Daisy? That's the big question in my mind. I think it will probably depend on Tiebreaker getting a fourth place in the spot he was in, not being top 32 going into this game. So I'm hoping he's won at least one game today to have that first Tiebreaker in his favor, if he's even at that point where it is a Tiebreaker situation. But we're looking now at Tropical still in this game, still streaking, still sitting on 50 gold, somehow still playing an Ash 2 on the board. A little bit embarrassing considering uh, the, the state of the game we're in, uh, but maybe just trying to go 9 and then roll for replacement. At that point, a Vayne 2 would be better, giving both Recon and Duelist as well for GP. For sure. Meanwhile, on the side of Dunn Styles' board, going up against Brain Gap's full threat composition, has that Ramus 3 front line in the back line, the Belveth and Aurelian Soul freshly buffed as the duel carries. You can see the front line starting to fall, the Annie so low as the Ramus lies untouched in the front line for Brain Gapped. And Belveth firing away still with that extra range. Talia falls to a meteor and so will Don Styles. Top two is decided and it looks like Tropical won against his ghost. Yeah, these players making it to top two 
Dependent on tiebreakers pretty much all but guarantees them a place in day three. Of course though, these players aren't gonna wanna stop there. They are gonna wanna push for that win as we head into our final two. I have to say, huge props to Brain Gap for the comp he has assembled, starting off Burning Spirit thinking, hey, there's a lot of AP contestant happening on, there, there's also the Fiora line, it's also playing some Annies, uh, what do I end up doing? Goes for the level maximum, which is not necessarily a, a augment that you synergize exactly with Burning Spirit, but still finds a way to have a stable and strong board to make it to this top two position. All right, here we go. Potentially final round here. Tropical with his board has taken him so far to full stages, but Belveth full focusing his front line. Ezreal getting frozen by the Velkaz, potentially a crucial moment, but Ramis goes down. The backliners completely uncontested. Ezreal frozen once more. It's up to Belveth to take down the entire board, but she just can't cut it. Tropical takes the victory and makes it to day number. Number three. Dies of cutscene. The nerf to Urgot, I think, being very relevant. The Undertow coming out a little bit too late. If it came out while Belveth was still alive, hitting all four of those remaining units, some miraculous comeback could occur in that fight. But in the end, not enough mana for that Urgot to cast. And a huge win from Tropical, who he said was, was not even slamming items. I said it was a tactical, you know, losing one more round to get some more gold. Hit everything, and since then, just one streak all the way to the, one, to the win here. Maybe this is a hot take, but I love 2-1 Augment games, man. That was so good. So many cool compositions coming out. We got to see Justice Punch, Illuminating Singularity, Edgelord. Maybe I'm biased because I can't play late game comps to save my damn life. But so many cool comps coming out and winning with an Ezreal reroll in the patch of our Lord 13.5. Like, what is going on? I mean, that is just proof that your 2-1 hero augments aren't just always fodder to sell at the end of the game, as I have now learned that I'm wrongfully doing. Really fantastic game. Of course, we have our admins hard at work running the numbers, and we will let you know who has made the qualification to the final day of the Golden Spatula Cup to their chance to make it to the Rising Legends finals later this year. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. In the meantime, enjoy this interview with Aaliyah before the analyst desk breaks down the day. My name is Ilya. That's why uh, that's why I am named myself Ilya TFT because I'm not that creative. I'm from Germany, and my goal this year is just to get day free so I qualify for regionals. I really enjoy playing this set. It's so much better than the last set, like the hero. Hero augment mechanic is really fun, especially now that they, they introduce four rerolls, and you don't need to waste. Yeah, you don't need to save your normal augment reroll, so you don't get more dog that often and I didn't really like the dragons, so that's nice that they're gone. That's pretty hard to say, like, if, like a lot of good, really good players, like like the friend drones, like Dub Double, German Legend, Salvi. I played versus him in German League and he, he, he destroyed us really hard, so he's probably one of the only people I'm really scared of in Germany, but uh, that, that's that's a hard question because there are so much good competitors and it's it's always decided by like who got the best opener, who got a good day, like who is com and who is comfortable on the patch. And because the patch is really fresh, it's really hard to say right now who's who's gonna be the the most difficult player to play against. I want to shout out the German community, especially especially Memo and his Discord. Because they're the reason I even I made it this far. Without the support of Germ of the German community, I would wouldn't have been been I wouldn't have gotten that far in TFT. I would probably have stopped at like reaching challenger, resetting and quitting.
Welcome back everyone to the final part of day two of Golden Spatula Cup number two. We are waiting for our final results to really to come in so we can know exactly who is getting through to play in our top 32 tomorrow. But while we wait, let's talk a little bit about that previous game because oh boy, we had an absolute banger to end out our stream games. I mean, 2-1 Hero Augment games are always going to be a bit of a toss-up. Some people are going to go for the full-on reroll angles, and some people are going to try to play more vertical. But Unrelenting Force here was the star of the show, really shown through there, and just kind of highlighted that you can play the same composition in multiple ways. Because often you see this composition played with Rising Spell Force, but it also works very well with Unrelenting Force. Yeah, and of course, we were talking about, you know, underground at length before. I think in the cast, and honestly, from where we were seeing as well, it seemed like it was going to be fairly risky with how explosive that lobby seemed to be. But, you know, being able to keep the underground along, long, around longer time as well, works out incredibly well for Tropical. And that vibe by the end, just an absolute titanic force. Absolutely a, a big one for sure. And I think there were some unlucky moments here. Daisy especially uh, was in a position where he probably would have hoped for a lot more than what happened here. But due to, due to how this game panned out in the early game, pretty much everyone had like a Lux 2, which meant that his rolling on 4-1 came with, a uh, 3-1, sorry, even at level 4, came with some more challenges than you normally would expect. Yeah, I mean, that was the thing. We, we had so many good balls and so many good setups here. I think, you know, it, we, as was noticed on the cast, the HP total across the lobby was incredibly close. And of course, yeah, we can't let this pass without noting, Lana felt like he was on a really good course of that frontline fencing, to only to then to fall out in seventh. You can even see surrendered at the end there, obvious frustration at almost, almost managing to make it to day three. Yeah, the, the very fine margins, and, and that Fiora for a moment in time is on screen right here, did look unkillable. The combination of Titans plus Defiance plus Bloodthirster looked like it was an absolute menace, but couldn't get the full Duelist Vertical in there, even though he tried to do his utmost, couldn't find a set 2 to have a strong secondary source of damage. And when the rest of the lobby kind of caught up to his power spike, he ended up having to go out in sixth. We'll of course like to recognize, you know, Avand with the Draven composition there. With the League of Draven, we were certainly expecting some pretty big things. Going out in sixth place was pretty shocking based on, you know, how much gold we saw flowing in from pretty early on in that lobby. Yeah, not ideal items though to a certain extent. Uh, Ruin's Hurricane is not a horrible item for Draven, but you would have very much liked to see a Last Whisper in that slot, for example, a little bit of extra crit chance for that IE to, to get some more damage with the ability. But... Not necessarily the case here, no shredding out of it going on, so at the end of the day, lacking that little bit of top end that kind of ended up matched, like, to match the rest of the lobby. And it's interesting as well for, you know, uh, looking to brain gaps across from Hungary, you know, this was being noted on the cast again, you know, the, while most of our players did stick around with what they were given from the very beginning of the game, the great brain gap to realize it just wasn't going to be possible with the amount of, you know, with having other players picking up the... Uh, Bunny Spirit as well, deciding to abandon ship on that entirely and, and go eventually into the full threat level board was pretty impressive. We saw this in the previous game from Bring Up the Well as well, I believe he has at least showcased his ability to play these Velkas board. Well, well yeah, Velkas is also on this board, the Vel Belveth even, <laughs> these Belveth centric boards earlier on, right? And I think also a combination of the preparation being used quite well coming through from, from Tropical here also kind of played a massive part in his win. Yeah, and of course, we can't let it pass without mentioning, of course, Daisy, you mentioned you, you took a little while to get online. That composition, honestly, it's one of the ones that you see it on the ladder, you always, you know, give a sigh of resignation, knowing that if you just have a little bit of unluck when it comes to that Lux and her targeting, again, randomly targeting across the board, your entire round could be in the trash immediately. Yeah, there are obviously different levels of uh, variants that you kind of succumb to when you are playing TFT and that being one of them, right? And that kind of ended up costing Daisy here, but sometimes you just snipe the enemy backline carry, let's say a Samira that is much more, much more sta like, put down, bullet onto her place, right? Like she's, generally speaking, not going to move around from her spot. Whereas there are a lot more versatile and mo mobile uh, carries like the Beldef, for example, that tends to walk up when something gets out of range. So I think we've kind of covered quite a lot of what we can say about this final lobby. So we can start turning our eyes to more general things going forward. Then you know, looking back across the day, you're coming coming in today. You're know, leaving today. 
What are the kind of the big things you uh, went the way you expected, and what are the things you went most differently than what you would have expected coming into day two? I think that in terms of the players that we see at the top of the table, some the likes of Kevin Parker and whatever, we're going to get the full standings. I think that kind of went the way we expected it, right? These confident players that have done well. I think that you would probably say the, the British performance overall, right? Peter didn't go fully to plan. Um, mm -hmm. I think that I think that we also saw, just in general, the overall flexibility of the patch kind of shine through again. But again, with the over-reliance on AP. All right, we do have our final standings ready. Of course, as said, we kind of already know a lot of how this is going to look like because, as you can see, there's a lot of British flags flying very low. Did manage to pick up some results towards the end. We can see there's also a fair amount of the French players as well who are joining down in the lower half who weren't even able to get close to that cut-off point. As we move forward, though, we will, of course, increase in our levels of heartbreak, particularly for our players who just missed out on day three. Yeah, Scar had a very strong day one, was not able to transfer that over to day two, but again, big performance from Egypt having two players in day two of the Golden Spatula Cup number two. On the, on the more out of skirts oh. here, we're going to see Dasik missing out on tiebreaker, so, Dar so will Dargis and Enzo. So another couple of players that we really would like to see more of. Swella Tiger, another great player, but taking an eighth mm. in the final game, we're talking about this. Going 8th in the final game, you might sit going into the games you think, okay, cool, I just need to get a top 6, and then all of a sudden, something just ends up going wrong. Yeah, and that's a real heartbreak. Of course, you know, these are so many incredible players, particularly in that last lobby, the day six have missed out by a single point. For Darkest as well, players that are a lot of eyes on them. I mean, looking a little bit further down, Soligasang has been doing very well. I think it would not be his tournament this time around. And also, of course, you know, Travis, Shred, and Vaga, so many incredible names. But of course, the big news of the players who did manage to just get across that line. And it will be one of our ranked players we're looking for. Wet Jungler just gets in on 27 points. And he's the only player on 27 going through here, right? So the four five-way tie there really ended up paying off in spades for Wet Jungler, who has been performing quite well overall. Remember, the first tiebreaker is overall tournament points. So day one performance really coming through here for Wet Jungler. Oh my gosh, they're looking through some of the other ones. Of course, we've heard from Gunmei, the other saw before. Gluteus Maximus returning a regional champion from a little way back. Salvi as well, Golden Spatula champion as well. A lot of German players making in on that page and also on this page as well. But we've still got a good mix of players. You know, Mujiwari in particular coming back in and making day three. And I want to say something about Muji. Muji might be the best GSC player just looking at average placement. He might only have played two GSCs. That doesn't really... that We don't talk about sample size right now, okay? But second place in Golden Spatula Cup number three, did not play GSC one, comes back with a vengeance here in Golden Spatula Cup number two and makes day three. And Canvas, of course, up at the very top. Again, we're looking to see how far Canvas can separate himself from his cousin, Double61, and we'll get that chance in day number three, carrying forward the banner of Carmine Corp. We will, of course, in a few moments, be talking to Snooty Boo, who did come up very, very highly in the competition as well. So we're really set for a roaring day three. Yes, I think that we do believe, I do have, we have him ready right here on the line. So hello, Mr. Snooty. Boo, hey. your lovely hey, face how you doing? right now. How are you doing? Congratulations, first of all, making day three. But I think more importantly for you, already guaranteeing your spot in the EMEA finals based on points. Yeah, that's, that's an awesome feeling. I mean, I've been playing TFT ever since this came out, competing at every event, and I've pretty much done horribly ever since. So they're actually getting there for one time is going to be awesome. Obviously, trying to get to Worlds after that, but I mean, it's just living a dream at the moment. Well, you know, please, you lay it out for us. What do you think was different today? You know, what was the difference maker that let you get to this point? I mean, there's a, lo a lot of things that came to this point. Um, we've got a, a very cool, strong um, training group in Spain, like my friends Ganmei, Chuso, Delisom, and all of these guys. So we've been working together much more since the uh, last set. And that's been helping out because, like, uh, Lumarpin went out last uh, GSC. So that was very useful. And also, like, working on my, my person, uh, on my self overall, not just on the game, just, like, exercising a bit, feeling better psychologically, everything that's outside of the game. Because TFT, we already spend, like, 8, 10, 12 hours every day. We don't need to work on that anymore, right? <laughs> 
No, I think that's I think that having the the mental aspect outside of the game with you is very important. It's why you see so many more organizations, etc., invest into, into mental coaches and, and at, at like the top end of esports because it's just such an important thing. And also, I think that uh, our producer highlighted that you guys over in Spain have really taken a shine to to Lulu reroll. Is there a particular reason as to why? Okay, so this is actually a funny story. La the last times we were reviewing VODs, we all agreed that uh, Gadgeting pretty much sucked. But I was given like six Ludos at T1 every game, so I thought, okay, I'm going to reroll Ludo. I thought it was going to be bottom, like the bottom five or bottom six, but it was, was top one and two, so I don't know. I don't know why the other guys did it, but we kind of all agreed that Gadgeting sucked, and yet we all played it, so I guess whatever we comment on is not worth anything. <laughs> So going into day three, of course, you know, there's going to be an incredibly tight competition towards the end. As we've already established, you know, you've managed to get the position to be moving forward to the regional finals. Anyway, can you tell us, you know, what's, what's it going to look like between now and day three? What are you going to actually be doing in preparation? Oh, I'm just going to chill today. There's nothing. If I got here, I can, uh, day three is going to be pretty much the same. I'm just going to watch the VODs of the top players anyway, just to learn a bit. But it's much more chill for me. I'm just going to play my best tomorrow, but I'm not going to... Yeah, like um, suffer that much anymore from this point. I think that's 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 a good point to bring up here, right? The fact that now that you have this mental burden of more or less guaranteeing a spot in the EME finals, it's gonna it's, that's gonna allow you to to play much more free TFT going into tomorrow for sure. Is there any particular player that we should be keeping an eye out for tomorrow that you that we might might not be aware of? I mean, you're pretty much aware of all these guys for sure. I mean, Kevin Parker is my guy to watch out for. But he's been smurfing all of these GSTs, and not only this set, only uh, also last set. Every time I see him a ladder, he smurfs on me. Every time I see him a GST, he's just been going one, 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 one. I'm the exception uh, facing him in this last lobby, so that's a, an interesting fact. And also Mugiwara, we were actually mentioning Gunmei and me that he's been playing some very different style of TFT. He didn't do the the best result this last game, but overall he's got a a very nice play style. We'll definitely be keeping an eye out for Mujibara in day number three. So just before we let you go here, is there anything you'd like to say you know, to your fans, to the communities you know, who've helped you get to this point to achieve the, the, the dream of getting to the regional finals? I mean, it, it, we had a pretty awesome moment before, like a fifth K of our year was qualified. So these guys have been supporting me forever. I don't know if English speaking community as well, but my Spanish community is very awesome. Latam, Spain, all of them. I really love them a lot that they've um, come with me through all this journey. I even cried a little bit. It was so awesome. So, I mean, yeah, it's just great to be here. And thanks for everything. Well, thank you so much, Snoopy. We we'll look forward to seeing how you do tomorrow. Again, incredibly competitive field. We don't, we're almost at an end here today, though. So a few more bits of business to take care of, but oh boy, you know, the names we've got coming up here to mention Mujibara, uh, you know, and all the players we've been seeing, it's all going to narrow to a point here as we try and find out who will be our second Golden Spatula champion. Yeah, I think that we have an incredibly strong field and we have a lot of returning faces from the first GSC and the most important thing in a game of chance like TFT, it is a game of chance at the end of the day. It's about being consistent and continue to put yourself into those day frees because at the end of the day, that is how you are going to create results. Average placement is much more important than spiking out one or two events over the course of an entire tournament circuit. So just be being there in day three means you have a chance of winning. And I think that a lot of these players now uh, making it back to day three speaks to their skill level. Well, while the players will have had to have been consistent, there was a chance for our viewers to just go absolutely ham. And that was with our contest, which is out there, to try and provide the most entertaining answer as to who was going to be winning the Golden Spatula Cup number two. I do believe in a second we'll have it up on screen while our eventual winner ended up actually being. And I'll do my best to read out. And it, it, it is down right there in the lower third, right down there, Peter. Oh no, my apologies, yes. There we go, TFT marks a win because the power of the spatula is with him. And they've also even bothered to make a little Jedi Tengu as well. I mean, that is effort being put into in a contest. That is, uh, that, that's a great little piece of art right there, I must admit. And again, we are going to be looking at those types of fun answers as well tomorrow. So keep your eyes peeled for that over on our socials, which are going to be at TFT Esports E-M-E-A, as well as Play TFT on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Where can they find you, Peter? Well, yeah, so you can find me at Counterfeit Castle, which you can see below. We can also see yours 
Uh, well, I know it's cast, but for people who are not on the stream right now, Maisie Marspan, of course, doing an incredible job in their guest slot today, Petrus Panda and Niberia. They were all pretty easy to find. You just throw their name onto Twitter and you will find them. Of course, again, the important thing is we will be back at 1 p.m. CET tomorrow. Again, we're keeping it on with our change time slot from before. It's going to be an absolutely amazing day of play as we will crown our second Golden Spatula Cup champion of the Monsters Attack set and find another person guaranteed, along with Sinny Boo, to go forward to the regional EMEA finals. For now, though, it's been our pleasure to bring you day two, day three beckoning, just tomorrow. We'll see you there.